something that was uh, not what was the right behavior for the object. Uh, so basically the question is where our method does not work, right? Uh, yeah, so it's a good question. So uh, it's main, uh, so as I said, we do not explicit model physics from observation. So that means when the, uh, the dynamics of the object does not align with the, you know, the one in the simulation, it does not work. For example, you have those not so compliant objects that like, has some elastic like, property. So it will go back if you uh, grasp uh, like, uh, a little bit away and then it does not work. Because it's not the same as like the in the simulation, which where we train the, our model. That's a like major like limitation. Great. Uh, sorry, it's, can I speak a little bit louder? I cannot oh, hear. Okay. It. Um, anyway, great talk. Uh, Thank you. I just have uh, one question. So, if I understand right, you you project the object into the X Y Z planes. Uh huh. Uh, why is that beneficial compared to three reasoning directly in three D space? I see. So the question is like, why do we project the point cloud into X, Y, Z planes? Is that correct? That's okay. right. Cool. That's a good question. So uh, basically, we uh, we would refer to the convolutional optimistic network, which is a previous work using implicit neural representations. And the main reason we are doing this projection is because it greatly reduces the computation cost. If we directly do everything in the 3D space, then like the memory cost will be like huge, and basically GPU would explode. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Peace. Yeah, I just have a quick question regarding your geodesic distance. Uh, can uh -huh. you elaborate a little bit more on, um, like, um, what point are you calculating the geodesic distance with respect to? Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, can, can you just elaborate a bit more on, like, how you use uh, geodesic distance to establish the correspondences uh, across, like, two uh, targets? I see, I see, I yeah. see. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So the question is, uh, how do we use geodesic distance to establish correspondence? So we use geodesic distance as a contrastive loss. So basically, we use geodesic distance to define which pair of points are corresponded. So with the geodesic distance metric, we can use this contrastive loss to, you know, pull close the two points which are corresponded. Uh, the point features of a pair of points are corresponded and push away the point features of pair of points are not corresponded. So at, at the end of the day, we're just, you know, learn a a embedding field, and this embedding field is consistent across the deformation. Yeah, so it's like a, a geodesic instance serves more as a like loss or a metric to learn the feature embedding. Okay. Uh, so my question is regarding generalization. So have you tried it on objects that are unseen during the simulation training? Uh, for sure. Yeah. Basically, all the real objects are not seen during the simulation training. We, we can't find the you know, the same object in the simulation and the real world. Yeah. Uh, so, so in that case, the correspondence is kind of generalized to novel objects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so basically, there, even during the simulation training, we train on, like, uh, different objects and test on different objects. So the learned visual dynamics and the correspondence can generalize to, you know, different objects. The fantastic talk. Uh, uh, for this work, uh, you are focused on uh, volumetric deformable object, mm -hmm. uh, but it looks like, uh, given observation, you can only see the surface points. Uh, and also, uh, I'm not familiar with how geodesic distance is defined, let's say, inside the volumetric uh, 3D object. Uh, could you elaborate more on that? So are we only uh, estimating the uh, dynamics over the uh, visual appearance of other shell for the entire volumetric object? Okay, great. That's a, that's a good, good question. So the question is, like, since during, like, a volume, um, uh, when capturing the observation of the volumetric ob uh, deformable object, we only capture the surface. And uh, uh, how do we define the geodesic distance like, between like, a pair of points like, inside the object? So, uh, so basically, first, we have an occupancy field where we do 3D reconstruction. And uh, using that 3D reconstruction, we can find the surface point. And then we can like, compute geodesic distance on the surface point. So at the end of the day, we'll still like, compute the embeddings on the surface point, but the uh, complete surface points instead of like, partial observations directly captured. Thank you. No problem. I think that's great. So let's thank our speaker again. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. All right, uh, the second and final speaker of the session will be Graham Best. As he's setting up, I'll introduce his uh, 
title. It's Resilient Multi-Sensor Exploration of Multifarious Environments with a Team of Aerial Robots. Good. Okay, ready? Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, my name's Graham. I'm going to be presenting our work on aerial autonomy. Uh, so this work was done at Carnegie Mellon University, Oregon State University, and I've recently moved to University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, so, what we're pushing in this work is this idea of resilient autonomy in multifarious environments, where multifarious means many and varied environments. No? Is it this chord? Yeah, I'll try not to touch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't touch anything. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, so what we're pushing this work is resilient autonomy in multifarious environments, where multifarious means many and varied environments. And so this is where we have lots of different challenges in the environments that we don't know ahead of, uh, ahead of time. So this in can include things such as narrow passages, some of my videos not working. Here we go. Uh, so this can include narrow passages, such as in, in this cave here, uh, large, expansive open environments, uh, complex topology environments, such as weaving through uh, beams in the ceiling and narrow passages, uh, things like stairwells and vertical shafts, um, and areas with uh, challenging perception, such as through gas and smoke. And so what, what we're really pushing this work is trying to get autonomy that works across all these environments. So every picture that you see here is all running the exactly same code, as well as uh, the examples that I'll present later. Um, so our contributions are along four fronts. So firstly, we address this problem of multi-robot, multi-sensor exploration and coverage, which I'll define a bit more in a second. Uh, we want this uh, exploration to be resilient across a number of environments, uh, as discussed in the previous slide. We want full autonomy from takeoff to landing without a human in the loop. And we present uh, lots of experiments with physical robots moving at high speeds in environments over the scale of kilometers. Um, all our code has been released and open sourced. Uh, so this problem, what we're really pushing is this idea of uh, system level performance, which is quite hard to define formally. Uh, but our primary objective is, is this first point here, we're trying to maximize this exploration and coverage objective. And so what I mean by this is we have a secondary objective, which is a LIDAR, which discovers the geometry of the world. Then what we're actually interested in is observing all these surfaces uh, with cameras at close range. Um, there are lots of other system level objectives, such as land safely at the takeoff location. Uh, we want to respond appropriately to unforeseen challenges. Um, and we want multi robot coordination, uh, partic particularly decentralized um, in, in environments where the communication is unpredictable. Uh, so, what I'm presenting here is the system, as you see in this picture here. Um, and I'm just going to br very briefly talk about each one of these components in this talk. So, let's start with the behavior executive. So, it's responsible for the very high level decisions. Um, and switch between what behavior should be happening at any point in time. And so we represent this in the form of a behavior tree shown here. Uh, put simply, behavior tree is a logic structure. It takes in the, these various conditions, which are true or false. And at any point in time, it tells you which action should be taking place right now. Um, in this example here, the, the behavior trees are read from left to right. We have these diagnostics. Everything's currently OK. Uh, we successfully uh, take off. And then currently we're in this exploration phase where there's various uh, variants of this exploration uh, that can be selected between based on changes in, in the environment. Uh, and then later on in the mission, we have a landing sequence which will get us safely back to home. Uh, so next component is this map processor. So it's responsible for taking in uh, the SLAM output and then forming different mapping products that are used by the different planners. Uh, so there's three main types of mapping products. So the first is these exploration maps. 
Uh, for this, we use an open V2B structure, it's similar to an Octomap, which you might be more familiar with, but it has certain benefits. Um, and it's benef it's, uh, what we use this for is representing what has been observed by the cameras and LiDAR. Uh, and this is shared across the team of robots. In the middle, we have a navigation roadmap. This keeps track of where we've been, how to get back to places. Um, it, it counts for uh, repairs, if, if, for example, if a door shuts, it will fix that. Um, this is also shared across the team. And lastly, on the right, we have our local planner maps, uh, which is represented as a distance transform map. Uh, we include dust filtering, um, and the local plan is computed on the GPU. Uh, so next up, talk about the global planner, but particularly the expiration component of that. Uh, so we use a frontier-based expiration uh, where we use two different uh, types of frontiers for those two different objectives I talked about. Uh, viewpoint extraction, we then rank these viewpoints according to a series of heuristics. Uh, then we form an RT planner to get to these viewpoints. Uh, coordination is uh, achieved with, by sharing two types of information. Left-hand side, you see shared exploration maps. On the right-hand side, we see shared navigation roadmaps. And these two uh, communicated bits of information will influence uh, both the frontier selection and as well as long-term navigation in particular parts of the mission. Um, and so these two ideas are relatively simple, but together they, they, they came together to um, achieve very good coordination across uh, very large-scale environments. Uh, so local planner, uh, so it consists of three main components. So first is we perform an A-star search over the distance transform map, and it actually pushes things away from obstacles to, um, uh, to improve safety. Uh, that trajectory is matched to a dynamically feasible trajectory library in the middle. And then we perform speed and your control to get through narrow passages, such as doorways. And I'll show you a video of that in a minute. Uh, lastly, which I'll just briefly mention, the controller, uh, we have an onboard Bixhawk flight controller, which I won't talk about here. Uh, so we formed a huge amount of experiments across a wide range of uh, caves, mines, um, indoor structures, etc., as well as we performed in the DARPA Subterranean Challenge. Uh, these experiments were formed with our custom drones shown in the middle here, roughly 70 centimeter diameter, onboard sensing, computation, etc., um, roughly 10 to 15 minute uh, flight time. Okay, so I'll show you a video here of just a few different clips of examples of particular behaviors. Uh, so this particular shot is from uh, the final competition, the DARPA competition. Um, and you can see it, it gets, it's able to reach areas of the course that our ground robots couldn't reach. Um, so there are actually things hiding up there that we scored points for. So here's an example of going through a doorway. This is also in the, in the competition. So the exploration decided that it will be worth going through that doorway. Local planner then lines up the robot to uh, squeeze through uh, without uh, bumping into things. And then autonomy adapts, so then it might, you go, might, might go through that doorway into a wide open area, and in these wide open areas, then the, the speed increases up to about three meters per second. Um, so yeah, this is an example of a map that gets built up here. Um, this is Laurel Caverns. This is uh, an environment that we went to back, quite, back to quite a lot. Um, it was interesting because you see there's a very complex kind of geometry which makes the mapping took of the frontier generation quite complicated. Um, and this is another complex topology environment. So here we're weaving between different beams in the ceiling. Um, it's, the exploration's found this hole in the ceiling and the local planner figures out how to get through it. It squeezes through there. And once it's through there, then it opens up into this vast other room that it then goes and explores. Um, so this jumping forward in time a bit, you can see here it's weaving between uh, different beams in the ceiling, uh, drops down vertically. And then once it reaches this more open area, then the speed will pick up um, since it, there's much uh, wider safety tolerance. And so the last example here is um, stairwells. One particular challenge here is we're actually going down um, but below the blind spot of the velodyne. So you're actually going anywhere in an area that you can't see. And so it took a lot of tuning to try to get that right because um, it is actually quite hazardous you, since you're going through blind. Uh, so we had lots of other results. Um, some of these are summarized in the paper, but a few uh, quick um, uh, kind of takeaway messages. So in expansive environments, uh, we had environments that, where robots were exploring over one kilometer per robot, um, even at speeds up to three meters per second. This was contrast to very uh, kind of tight, narrow passages um, type environments where the speed slowed down and the autonomy adapted to that. Um, and then there was lots of complex environments where there's kind of a mix of these different things and the, the autonomy had to adapt. Lots of examples of resilient behavior, such as emergency landing if we run out of battery unexpectedly, uh, roadmap repair if, for example, a door shuts or something like that, then there's other ways to navigate. 
Uh, so we also competed in sub-T finals. Um, we had three error robots flying in the final competition. Um, our error robots uh, found eight artifacts in the course. Um, but also part of the sub-T competition, they were coordinating with ground robots, which I'm not going to talk about in this paper. Uh, so lots of lessons learned from, from this uh, set of experiments. Uh, I think one particular challenge was avoid overfit into one particular environment. So we're trying to generalize so that we can go to any new environment and make it work there. Uh, balancing solution com complexity is complicated. So some parts of our solution uh, are very theoretically interesting, whereas other parts are kind of quick hacks. And trying to balance those, those two was, was quite challenging. Uh, Multi-objective exploration, also challenging. How do you balance between these different things? Um, and resiliency, we found we achieved this through uh, redundancy. And we found that particularly the, the behavior tree structure was a good way of uh, representing that, that uh, redundancy. Um, so lots of various future work, um, ongoing projects. Um, I won't talk about all these, but I'd particularly like to point out um, our code release. I um, encourage you to go look at that. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening. We'd also like to thank uh, DARPA for sponsoring this work. Um, come and have a chat and post it too, and I think we have time for questions. Excellent, very cool talk, thank you. Um, while we're waiting for other questions to populate, I guess I'll start with one. Um, I saw that you did a marsupial configuration. How did you, I have just a few questions about that. How did you determine when to launch off? It seems like a classifier for that would be pretty challenging to create, but I'm curious how you did it. The second thing is that when the UGV is exploring into the environment, it's obviously collecting state data is that what you give to the UGV when it starts to launch off, or are you collecting information and processing state estimations and mapping as you, uh, with the robot on in the marsupial configuration? Curious about some mechanics there. Um, yeah, so a bit of context there. So in, a, in the sub-T challenge, we had ground robots and area robots. Um, and so the area robots, some of them took off from the start location. Others uh, were carried into the environment from the ground robots and took off somewhere else. Um, and the, the question there was about, so how do you know when and where to take off? Um, my short answer is in the competition, that was all done by the human operator. Um, so that was kind of very high level decision. That was kind of one-off thing that didn't take too much effort from the human operator. Uh, but we'll, we'll add to that, the, uh, it's kind of a research area that we have been looking to outside of this paper in this competition. Uh, we did actually write a paper on it last year, I think, at ICRA. Um, and we're looking at uh, how do you actually reason over what you might see if you were to take off at this location. Um, yeah, so it's not in this paper, but we can, you know, we can talk about that too. Uh, yeah, and then apart from, uh, so, so when, uh, when we take off from the ground robots, it does, sh uh, if I remember correctly, the error robot's actually turned off until it gets to the takeoff location. Um, then just before it takes off, that's when it shares maps. Um, and then, so then the, the area robot can then actually use those maps to explore things that the ground robot hasn't seen. Um, and there is some information, if assuming you're in communication range, there is information shared. Uh, in this paper, particularly we talk between the area robots, but also the ground robots um, have a role there too. Let's start with the uh, stage right, so mm -hmm. audience left. Hi, Graham. Uh, first, this is really, really great work. I'm really excited to see robots operating in complex cave environments and large spaces and uh, very narrow spaces as well. Uh, what I wanted to ask about was like from a systems perspective, and you mentioned like there's some hacks and you build these things incrementally based on time available and whoever you have on the team. Uh, so given that, what would you like to change, or are there things that you wish you'd done differently? Uh, and what comes next? Um, not, not sure if I quite got the question, but uh, what, what would do differently? Um, I think, it, so, so this project was going for about th three years or so, and so I think over those three years, the system naturally evolved over those three years. Um, and I think we particularly, our design process came really motivated by the experiments. Um, so we were going out testing almost every day and then would come home and look at the data and, and adapt each, each time. Um, yes, so I'm not sure if there's any clear changes I'd make to this exactly as is, because that was kind of as presented in the, in, in the competition. Um, I think looking forward though, uh, um, I think it kind of depends on the context. So 
uh, I'm trying to look more from the research side now. So from the systems perspective, I think we presented something that worked well for competition. For, uh, some uh, research challenges is trying to bring, for example, learning into some of the components. Um, uh, so maybe if I go back to that. Um, uh, I think this is the slide I was looking for. Yeah, so particularly trying to bring the learning kind of new, new algorithms into the components. For example, the, the, the selection heuristic for the frontiers, for example, I think that was something we're kind of constantly fiddling with. And if there was a more general solution to that, then that's something we'd be interested in. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but we can talk more in the post session. Uh, yes, please. But thanks a bunch. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the talk. I just have a quick question regarding, uh, I think, uh, your local map. I think you mentioned your local map is on the GPU. Uh, how large is the map, and do you transfer it to CPU for planning, or uh, if you do so, uh, how does that affect the latency of the system? Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so the GPU map, uh, I think it was roughly eight meter rectangle around the robot. Um, and I think it was a voxel type representation, I can't remember the exact resolution, might have been 10 centimeter voxels. Um, uh, I can't remember the exact latency, but yes, so it is computed on the GPU, then transferred to the CPU for planning. So the planning is not done on the GPU. Um, yeah, I don't have like specific numbers on that latency though, but uh, we found that that was not an issue, but I don't have specific numbers to quote for you. Okay, thank you, Best. Um, I'm really interested in your work. Uh, looking, coming from my own background, uh, from Africa, I'm just wondering, did, um, did you consider environments such as a farm environment or wildlife environment, and how well will it perform in this environment? Um, yeah, so we're particularly motivated by environments that were in the, the DARPA challenge. Um, and so that included uh, caves, um, urban structures, and, um, and tunnels, thank you. Um, but uh, more, more broadly, yes, all this stuff can work above ground as well. Um, uh, I think one, one particular challenge that we see underground is that uh, there's a lot of narrow areas that you might not have if you go out on a farm, for example. Um, the other big challenge is we don't have GPS underground compared to if you're above ground, that might simplify things in terms of localization. Um, so in the underground context, that means that SLAM also had to be running on this one computer that was on the robot, and so that took up basically half the computer and that really limited certain things. If we didn't have SLAM taking up most of the CPU or a, a reasonable percentage of the CPU, then I think there's probably more planning that we could do in, in other contexts. We'll take one last question. Uh, thank you, this is really interesting work. Um, I had a question about uh, if you have a team of multiple robots, how do you handle discrepancies between, uh, say, one robot seeing something and another robot seeing something conflicting? For example, things like mirrors or glass tend to cause problems for VIO or uh, LIDARs. How did you handle these discrepancies that um, a team of robots might see? Uh, yeah, so if the two maps end up being different and shared, right, um, uh, I'd say the first answer there is there, there are certain decisions that are only use uh, my own map, and so that means if a different robot sends um, information that has errors in it, then most of the decisions are not affected by that, since I'm just using my own map, and I'm assuming my own map is correct. Um, there are certain behaviors where, so particularly when the roadmaps are shared, um, so if one robot says, okay, go to somewhere very far away and we use a roadmap to, to get there, um, one, one thing that came up, for example, if there's some kind of slam drift, then that, that roadmap might um, not line up properly, for example. Um, the, there is kind of low level redundancy in terms of local planner and whatever to, uh, to kind of get around that, that issue, but um, I agree it's a, it's a challenging problem there. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's thank Graham again. All right, thank you for our two guinea pig speakers for all of our AV issues. Uh, for those of you who are not watching oh, in person and online, uh, apologies for all of our uh, virtual uh, streaming issues. So uh, it's doubly hard to run a hybrid conference, who knew? Um, all right, so uh, we have a, now a coffee break until 10.30. Uh, oh, by the way, I wanted to say one thing. Uh, for those of you who are presenting, 
Uh, it's actually helpful if you were to remove your mask during speaking for those of us who are he hearing impaired. Uh, seeing lips actually helps comprehension quite a bit. So uh, if you're not comfortable with removing your mask, that's fine. But if, uh, for those of you who, who are, please try to remove to, uh, your mask while speaking. Uh, all right, thank you, and I'll see you all in half an hour. Uh, coffee break.
Check, check. Check, check. Check, check. Check, check. Check, check. Well, I don't know if you want me to give you some more on this one or no. Check, check. Check, check. I'll do it from in here. Oh, so the audio? I think, I think so. Check, check. Check, check. Check, check. You could still hear me? Okay. Okay, check, check. Okay, I'll probably just give you a little bit slit. Less? Okay. Okay. All right, because they'll be like talking like this. Check, check. No, just on here. Check, check. Check, check. Just let me know if I, if I, if I want me to raise it. Check. This is just uh, the back of it. Yeah, this is number mix two. Check, check. So if they talk like this, you're going to barely hear it. I might have to bring it up a little bit more. Check, check. So I go like this. Check, check. I'll let you know.
Uh, okay, everyone, can you all take your seats? Uh, so our next session chair is David Held from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, just a reminder, please try to take your seats uh, quickly and quietly since the next session is starting now. Uh, the first paper that will be presented is uh, Equivariant Transporter Network, presented by Hauji. Hi everyone, I'm Hao Jie from Northeastern University. Today I will present our work Equivalent Transport Net. That is built on the top of the baseline transport network, but could achieve more sample efficiency. This work is collaborated with Gen Wang, Robin Waters, and Robert Plant. Here is the manipulation pick and place task. After picking the orange object, the bot needs to place it inside the green outline. If there is a rotation of the picked object, the place action defined as the relative pose between pick and place should change according. But could learn the pick and place knowledge from left configuration be generalized automatically to right configuration? And interestingly, we found the design of transport net could satisfy this equivalence. We refer it as same equivalence. But what if there is another rotation on the placement? The, could the learned pick and place knowledge be generalized as well? And our model is designed to satisfy this same time CN equivalence. Let's first go through the architecture of the transport net. Given the observation OT, typically a depth image, the peak module will first output a proper peak location, then a stack of different rotated image patches around the peak is sent to a side network. We do for the operation of rotating the image n times as a lift operator denoted by R sub n. The output of the side network is cross correlated with the dense feature maps from the observation to output the place features, where the place angle is discretized and defined on the channel axis. So if there is a rotation on the picked object, the output of the side network will undergo the permutation due to the lift operator. And after cross correlation, the best channel of the place features will also permute, which is reflected as the change of the best place angle. It indicates the learned place knowledge could be generalized to rotations on the peak object. But the transport net cannot generalize the learned knowledge to rotations on the placement. How could we add the second type of equivalence to our model, the operation is simple. We explicitly encode both the thin network and the side network as thin equivalent models. We also make our peak network equivalent that highlighted in gray. Specifically, rotations on the input are equivalent to rotations on the output. Due to the equivalence of both phi and psi, cross-correlation became an equivalent operator. It means rotations on the placement can be transformed to the no rotate image equivalently. By combining the two types of thin equivalence together, our model could achieve thin time thin equivalence it could generalize the learned peak and place knowledge to rotations on the peak object and the replacement. Together with the transitional equivalence of CN, it covers the most symmetries of 2D pose. We first evaluated the performance of our model on RAM's 10 benchmarks that covers various manipulation peak and place tasks with a suction gripper and a UR5 robot. Table one shows the performance of our model trained with a different number of demonstrations. So firstly, our model could outperform performance the baseline transport net on our tasks. And secondly, with less than 10 demonstrations, our model could achieve greater than 95 success rate on seven tasks. Thirdly, with either one or 10 demonstrations, 
The performance of our model is better than the baseline trained with the sound demonstrations on five tasks. So it indicates the sample efficiency of our model. Then we select five tasks from Raven 10 and replace the sucking gripper with Perugia gripper. This requires additional picking angle inference. Again, our model could outperform the baseline in terms of the sample efficiency. So based on the sample efficiency, we could collect 10 human demonstrations on a real robot and then train a model. So there is no symmetry real gap. Table 3 shows the results for 20 rounds after three tasks. Learn the policy is near optimal in terms of the success rate. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Um, thanks. So the next paper will be Robocraft, presented by Hao Chen. Hi, my name is Hao Chen Shi. I'm a first-year master's student at Stanford University. Today, I'm presenting our recent work, Robocraft, learning to see, simulate, and shape elastoplastic objects with graph neural network. This is a joint work by Hua Zhe and Jia Jun from Stanford, Zhi Ao from UC San Diego, and Wing Zhu from MIT. Our task for the robot is to use a parallel two-finger gripper to deform an elastoplastic object into a target shape, such as a letter X on the top right corner. Our result of shaping X is shown at the bottom right corner. It's very challenging to shape an elastoplastic object into a target shape uh, from perceptive RGBD data. There are many important questions to answer. For example, how to work with noisy and sometimes occluded RGBD images? How to predict the motion of the elastoplastic objects, which, which has very complex dynamics? And how to plan a good solution in a very large action space? To address these challenges, we propose RoboCraft, which has a complete pipeline of perception, dynamics, and planning. As an overview, perception constructs a particle-basing representation from raw RGBD data. Dynamics predict the motion of an elastoplastic object with a graph neural network. Planning figures out optimal control solutions with sampling and gradient-based trajectory optimization. We will walk through them one by one. In the perception module, we first extract the passing point cloud from the scene, then reconstruct a watertight mesh around the point cloud, and lastly, sample a sparse point cloud inside the mesh. Then we will have desirable inputs to our graph neural network. However, an important issue comes up. Since the particles at each time frame are generated from sampling, they are unordered, and there is no temporal particle-to-particle -particle uh, correspondence between them. So this makes L1 or L2 loss using previous works not applicable. So we use 3D distribution loss, such as uh, chamfer distance and earth movers distance as a training loss. Then we use a graph neural network to learn the dynamics and predict how the particles will move when applying an action. We demonstrate in our work that only 10 minutes of real-world interaction data is needed to learn the complex dynamics very well. With the trained dynamics model in hand, we use sampling and gradient-based trajectory optimization to find a robot trajectory that leads to the uh, most similar shape to our target shape. In the real world, we collect data by first resetting the passing with a mode and then randomly applying gripping actions to deform the plasticine. Because of the strong inductive bias introduced by the graph neural network, we only need 10 minutes of real world in interaction data to learn the complex dynamics sufficiently well. Here's the manipulation result of letter X in the real world. Uh, robot craft accurately predicts how the passing will move and leverage the gradient information to plan a trajectory with horizontal pinches and vertical pinches. Here's a more challenging task, manipulating a letter A in the real world. 
Although the shape of A doesn't seem very complicated, it's actually hard for me to quickly come up with a way to shape it. Uh, and RoboCraft figures out creative solution that differs from what I had in my mind, but nicely completes a task. Uh, Uh, to demonstrate the difficulties of the task we are solving, uh, we invite human subjects to complete the task with the same robot gripper. We show the results of the, uh, the, them shaping C and Z in a simulator, and also their results of shaping R and A in the real world. Empirical evidence suggests that the proposed tasks are hard for both manipulation algorithms and human subjects. But, but RoboCraft is able to achieve comparable or better performance than humans when humans attempt to solve the task with the same robot gripper. You can find more information on the project website. And also, feel free to contact me via email if you have any questions. Also, come and check out our poster session. Thanks, everyone, for the attention. Thank you. The next paper will be play by ear, presented by Max and Olivia. We present play by ear, learning skills amidst occlusion through audiovisual imitation learning. Now, many real-world tasks require a fusion uh, and reasoning across multiple modalities. For example, if you're extracting keys from a bag, you need vision to perceive the opening of the bag, but you also need audio or touch in order to find the keys in the bag. And we're wondering if our robots can learn to do a similar thing. Now, it is true that many prior works have looked at fusing tactile information with visual information, but it is also true that tactile sensors can be expensive and brittle. And we're wondering if audio can provide a cheap and robust alternative in certain cases. Concretely, we mount a cheap microphone to the gripper of a robot arm. Then we learn an end-to-end -end policy using vision and audio. And then we try to tackle heavily occluded tasks like extracting keys from a bag. Our model encodes a spectrogram of the last two seconds of audio with a 1D convolution. It also encodes frame-stacked visual observations with a ResNet and concatenates the embeddings together with proprioception for a single time-step observation. Additionally, because an observation like sound made when contacting the keys can influence actions many time steps in the future when audio is not present, we consider the last 10 time steps when we produce actions. We train our policy end-to-end -end with behavior cloning on pre-collected demonstrations, then we fine-tune with online interactive imitation learning using human-gated dagger. In our experiments, we consider four main questions. First, can our approach use sound to perform visually occluded tasks on a robot? Second, can our model generalize to unseen objects? Third, can our method use sounds to differentiate between objects? And finally, how does our approach compare to ablations and baselines in simulation? For our first experiment, we consider the task of removing a keychain from a paper bag in which the robot cannot see inside the paper bag, meaning that it is a fully occluded task. There are two versions of this particular task. There's an easy version in which the keys make a sound immediately upon the robot reaching in the bag. And there's also a harder version in which it requires a sort of searching motion before any sounds of the keys are heard which allow it to be localized and extracted. Our method completes the easy and hard versions of the task with 70% and 50% uh, accuracy respectively. Now, without audio, our method fails because it cannot localize the keys in the bag. Without memory, our method fails because it cannot use past sounds to inform current actions. And interestingly, without vision, our method performs 20% worse because it cannot see the bag being deformed by the robot arm and therefore can get confused by the sounds of the crinkling made by the paper bag. So as can be seen here, again, the audio is critical for the grasping process. With the easier mode, we see that it makes sound upon reaching in, which allows for a quick and efficient extraction. Now, with the harder mode, we see that it does require this sort of searching action before any sound is heard before it can be extracted. Now, in our next experiment, we wanted to see if that particular model can generalize to unseen objects. And we see that it actually indeed does for objects that make sounds upon contact, for example, a bag of chips. But it does not work for things that are softer and do not, does not make sound like a cloth. And this goes to show, yet again, that sound is critical in the grasping process. But it raises a larger question, which is, can we differentiate between the noises of different objects? We test exactly that in our next experiment. 
The robot must grasp the bag, but only if it contains screws and not packing peanuts. To do so, the robot probes the noise of the bag by dropping it on the table and decides whether or not to go down and regrasp it. Our model lifts the bag and then drops it. If it hears the sound of the screws, then it will go back down again. It is successful 70% of the time. Finally, we compare the ablations and baselines in simulation on occluded grasp and pick and place tasks. In Majogo, we approximate sound using external contact forces on the object. First, from the solid magenta line, we see that fine tuning with interactive imitation boosts success rate over offline behavior cloning by around 20%. Second, from the dotted lines, we see that by removing audio, vision, or memory, the performance suffers like on the real robot. And finally, from the solid blue line, we see that fine tuning via reinforcement learning instead of interactive imitation is much less effective. The key takeaways from our project are as follows. First, audio signals can be a cheap and robust alternative to tactile sensing in certain applications. Second, our method can accomplish manipulation tasks with heavy occlusion using audio, vision, and memory. And finally, our method can use sound to distinguish objects and change its actions accordingly. For more information, please see our project website and also our open source code. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, the next paper will be the surprising effectiveness of representation learning for visual Im imitation presented by Joe. Hi, I'm Joe, and this is our work on visual imitation done with Mahi, Sridhar, and advisor, advisor Laurel. Our task is how do we take a few visual demonstrations of a human doing a task, in our case, opening doors and cabinets, and have a robot like the one shown on the right be able to solve the same task. So here you can see our robot, which is the Hello Stretch, successfully opening the cabinet, which I collected demonstrations on in the previous slide. So typically to do imitation or visual imitation, one would use behavior cloning. And behavior cloning, what you do normally is learn an end-to-end -end model where the model takes in the observation, which is the robot's camera input, and an action, which in our case is a translation vector. However, because we want to use a few demonstrations, behavior cloning models are not ideal because they do well when you have a large amount of data. And in addition to large amounts of data, they can also require complicated priors or even complicated architectures to do well. So in our work, we wanted to simplify things down and propose a new model. So our model can be broken up into two key components. First is a representation model, which is just an encoder that maps images to representations. And this is trained through self-supervision. Then with this encoder, we freeze it and do simple nearest neighbor matching. And this is how we calculate our action. So to talk in more de detail about our model, the training phase is solely learning this encoder on our data set. So specifically, we use BYOL to learn our encoder. Now, once we have our encoder, we freeze it. And on test time, the robot sees an image. We pass it through the encoder. Then we do nearest neighbor matches on the representations and then aggregate those corresponding actions and weight them by the nearest neighbor distance. This is also known as locally weighted regression to computer action. So to talk more about the demonstrations, we collect in total 71 demonstrations opening various cabinets across various kitchens we use the Reacher Grabber assistive tool with the GoPro mounted on the top. And on the right, you can see how the GoPro looks at the scene. Uh, the end effect is similar to that of the robots to minimize the visual uh, mismatch. And we use structure for motion to extract actions from the sequence of images. So let's run through one full iteration of our algorithm. First, the robot takes an image through its camera and notice that the end effector does look similar to that of the previous slide. Then we pass it through our encoder. Then we find the nearest neighbors in our demonstration set, take their corresponding actions, sum them, but weight them by the nearest neighbors, the representation's distance, apply that action on the robot, so the robot takes a step, and we have a closed loop model, so the whole process starts all over again, and the robot takes another image. 
So here on the bottom right insect box, inset box, you can see what the robot sees in real time, as, as well as the red arrows, the action it's applying. So, so far you've seen the robot only open this specific cabinet. However, we do test on a variety of cabinets in our lab's kitchen. So here you can see our robot successfully opening another cabinet. And it's important to note that all these cabinets are present in our demonstration set. So on the variety of cabinets that we test on that are present in the demonstration set, our model does pretty well and achieves a high success rate. However, this naturally leads to the question, what happens when the model sees something that is not present exactly in the demonstration set? So to test this, what we do is add visual distracting features or occlusions to the cabinets, such as taping the key features like signs, covering the handle with tape, or even putting paper over like a prominent hole. And despite these moderate levels of occlusion, our model is rather robust and is able to open the door. However, when we push it too hard and cover too many key features, we do see our model is failing. And this is probably because there's no key features to do good nearest neighbor matching. But again, on reasonable amounts of modification, our model does perform reasonably well. In addition, we also test our model on two offline tasks, namely stacking and pushing. So for the query column, you can see the nearest neighbors are matching across different objects and environments. And we also want to see, is it the representation or the nearest neighbor that contributes most to our model success? And we find that both are equally important to achieve our results. Uh, if you want to look at the code, data, or even read the paper, please check out our website. Thank you for listening. Thank you. The final paper of this session will be Mesh-Based Dynamics and Occlusion Reasoning for Cloth Manipulation, presented by Zishuan. Good morning, everyone. My name is Zishuan from Carnegie Mellon University. Today, I'm going to present Mesh-Based Dynamics with Occlusion Reasoning for Cloth Manipulation, which is done in collaboration with Xin Yuling and David Held. Suppose the robot wants to unfold this shirt. One of the greatest challenges is the occlusion. Due to the partial observability, we can only directly obtain the state of invisible cloth while the occluded regions remain unknown. Understanding and inferring the structure of the occluded regions is important for tasks like cloth unfolding. However, it remains unclear how to estimate the occluded regions effectively for arbitrary cloth configurations. One possible way for inferring the occluded regions is explicit reconstruction by using a neural network. However, this is extremely challenging even for the best neural network due to the deformability and high dimensionality of the cloth, as well as the ambiguity caused by occlusion. Prior works tried to simplify this challenging issue by using robot action. In this work, they use the robot to lift up the cloth before the reconstruction which can significantly reduce the amount of occlusion and the set of possible poses. However, one of the drawbacks of the system is that the class manipulation process is open loop and cannot receive visual feedback. This is because the state estimation system can only be used when the class is being lifted in the air. So in this work, we propose to reconstruct the crumple class from arbitrary configurations without lifting up the class. To do so, we marry a neural network with a self-supervised test and fine-tuning procedure. The neural network is trained with offline data to provide an initial estimate of the cloth. And then we used self-supervised test and fine-tuning to refine this estimate in an online fashion. So given a neural network which produces an initial estimate of the reconstructed mesh, we, propo we propose to refine the mesh with two self-supervised losses. The first one is the unidirectional chamfer distance between the mesh and the partial point cloud. We use the unidirectional chamfer distance instead of the more commonly used bidirectional one because we only have the partial point cloud from the visible surface. This loss will help align the prediction with the observation. And the second loss that we deploy is called mapping consistency loss. Our deep reconstruction model is built of garment nets, which reconstruct the clouds by three steps. For each point on the 3D observation, 
we first map it from observation space to canonical space. Then we complete the shape in the canonical space and map it back to the observation space. By tracking each point throughout this procedure, we designed to, to enforce a consistency between these two-way mapping. Both losses are optimized by gradient descent. We evaluate our method on two class manipulation tasks in simulation. The first one is cloth fattening, whose goal is to maximize the coverage of a crumpled cloth. Although this objective works well for cloths with simple structure such as towel, it creates undesirable results for cloths with more complex structure such as shirts with opening. Therefore, we propose a new task called cloth canonicalization, whose goal is to transform a crumpled cloth to predefined canonical pose. To conduct cloth simulation, we put our perception model into a model-based framework that plan on the predicted mesh with a learned graph dynamics model, which can generalize to multiple tasks and different types of closing. We compare our methods with prior works that doesn't explicitly reason about occlusion, such as VSF and VCD, as well as baselines that don't do test and fine tuning. Our approach achieves the best results among all. All the methods are evaluated on both tags and average across five categories of closings. Here is an example of how does the self-supervised test and fine tuning incrementally improve the quality of the mesh. And we also deploy our model for physical experiments and we show that it works well for cloth flattening. So in summary, our method estimates the full cloth structures from arbitrary crumple configuration by using a combination of neural network and the test and fine tuning procedure. When integrated with a learned dynamics model for planning, it achieves the state of the art results for cloth manipulation. Please feel free to come to our poster if you have any questions. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will now have a short Q&A. Please uh, come up to the microphones to ask your questions, and we invite all of the speakers up to uh, the stage as well. Um, while people are thinking about questions, I'll ask the first one. For equivariant transport networks, I was curious whether constraining the network to be equivariant reduces its expressivity in any way. Sorry. Question? Yes, my question was whether uh, constraining the network to be equivariant con uh, reduces its expressive expressivity at all. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think one uh, constraint here is that you might limit the type of task that we could be solving. For example, uh, if you want to um, always place one object to the bottom of the table, you know, then it, the task itself doesn't really have the equivalent property that we are encoding. So, yeah, I think that's one kind of, you know, limitation in the expressiveness. So I think um, in order to make it work, um, all of the tasks that we are looking at must have the, um, the defined equivalent property that we have in our network. That's a great question, by the way. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, it looks like there's a question um, on the left mic. Yes, thank you. I have a question for the play it by ear paper. Um, so I'm curious to what degree you think the um, audio part of the system is picking up on spectral features like frequency or just amplitude features, uh, like just detecting whether a sound is present versus the quality of that sound. I'm just curious on your opinion there. Yeah, sure. That's, that's, a, uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, so we haven't done any official metrics, but I can give you an anecdote. So for the uh, pa packing peanut versus screw task, the, from the spectrogram, it's, uh, they both have the sort of noise spike, but for the screws, we see little tiny harmonic little nodes on there, and so that's what it's picking up. Similar with the keys, the way it's jangling, uh, it's, more distinct, it's very distinct with the spectrogram information, so it is doing some sort of uh, differentiation based on the spectral information. Um, hopefully that answers part of the question. Yes, very cool, thank you. Um, I also have a question about play it by ear. Uh, I'm just, uh, I think it's a very interesting topic inspired by human intuition. And I've, uh, I'm curious, like, uh, if the robot has to explore, if the key is not right uh, in the bottom of the robot hand, what kind of information 
actually re uh, resulted the action. So, for example, uh, I'm curious what kind of exploration strategy uh, you, the robot used to find the key if the, there's no any sound information because there's no key in the bottom of the robot hand. For our version of the experiment, at least, I believe you're referring to the hard version. Um, when the keys are, when there, there's no sound made directly on contact with the keys, we defaulted to a leftward searching motion first. And then if it made a sound, then it would proceed with the grasp. Um, if no sound was made yet, we would also move to the right. Um, so it's a left and then right searching motion. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, I have a question for the RoboCraft paper. Uh, since you removed the temporal uh, correspondence, then that makes the dynamics model fairly unconstrained. Do you find that if you look at the motion of the particles in simulation, do they still actually move in the correct way on the individual particle level? Or is it more just that the global movement of all of the particles ends up being roughly correct? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we find like, although there's no temporal correspondence, uh, we using uh, transfer distance and earth mover distance can still achieve very accurate movement, uh, both in the particle-wise and also the global-wise. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, question for uh, the surprising effectiveness paper. Um, how might you extend this method to be goal-conditioned? Um, that's a good question. So I think if you want to condition the policy on the goal as well, that has to be somehow part of like the nearest neighbor matching, right? So in addition to matching on the goal itself, you'd have to match your current state. So I think you have to go like two, you had to be doing nearest neighbor matching on two inputs. Um, yeah. Great, great answer. Um, sorry, do you have a question? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry, I have a follow up on the surprising effectiveness paper. Does the nearest neighbors matching phase of the system allow you to do some sort of out of distribution detect detection so if the occlusions become large enough, could you detect that in the feature map? Uh, is that an area of future work? I mean, so I, I think that's an interesting question because we did see our model failed when we did like extensive uh, visual modifications. And that's because like the nearest neighbor matchings were not good. So I think naturally the distances between like the distribution of the demonstrations we collect in representation space and those re representations of those heavy modifications would be like out of distribution. So consequently, I think they would have like a high distance and not be able to be within the distribution to match well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll ask, uh, one last question. Oh, is there a question? Yeah. Uh, I have a question for the plate by ear paper. Um, so in the uh, bag identification task, did the proprioception include uh, force torque sensing at the end effector? And if so, did you control for the weight of the bags to, to, to be able to tell whether it was using audio or not? Could you repeat the question, sorry? Yes, uh, in the bag identification task, um, did the proprioception of the robot include force torque sensing at the end effector? And if so, how did you control for the, for the different weights of the bag? Uh, we only had X, Y, Z positions of the gripper for proprioception, and the weight of the bag wasn't that variable because it was just the same set of keys in the bag. Um, unfortunately, I think we don't have uh, more time for questions, but feel free to ask uh, more questions at the poster. Let's uh, thank all the speakers again. Great. Uh, the next talk, uh, so uh, we have another block of uh, four papers, uh, the, the first of which is a learning-based iterative control framework for controlling robot arm with pneumatic artificial muscles uh, presented by Dieter. Hello everyone, I'm Dieter Büchler and I'm presenting the work a learning-based iterative control framework for a robot arm with pneumatic artificial muscles on behalf of Hauma, Bernard Schukow and Michael Mühlebach. The problem we want to tackle here is we want to play table tennis with this robot arm on the left. And this is difficult because we have to estimate the states of fast moving objects and track fast desired trajectories. So the robot that we consider here has four degrees of freedom, each of which uh, is driven by uh, two pneumatic artificial muscles. 
which enables safe exploration of fast motions. The problems with these muscles is that they are highly nonlinear, and we have a lot of friction in the, in the tendon drive. To get a better understanding of the system, we first um, identify a linear model in a frequency space um, and um, revert it for the feed forward control and use a PID control to have a first good controller. On the right, you see that the tracking performance is really bad. Um, but on the left, you can also see what we learned from this experiment is that the nonlinearities non um, that are um, visualized in the red curve on the left uh, graph uh, are, ver are significantly higher than the measurement noise uh, depicted in yellow in the amplitude spectrum. So this means that the linear model is simply not enough to control the system well. To capture these, non, uh, these uh, remaining nonlinearities, we uh, use a nonlinear convolutional neural network. And in addition, we want to generalize to arbitrary desired trajectories. For that, we need um, pairs of desired trajectories and the corresponding feed forward controls. And we, we get them using iterative learning control. Uh, a quick reminder on iterative learning control. We first apply the feed forward commands, observe the real outputs, estimate the disturbance uh, using a comma filter, and optimize the squared optimal control problem um, to get the uh, feed forward commands of the next iteration. We also assume uh, our linear model that we ident identified before with terms that capture the repeatable and non repeatable disturbances. And by uh, assuming this model, um, we also significantly reduce the number of iterations of each ILC execution. So um, here on the left you see ILC in action, um, and on the right you see uh, the desired trajectories that we chose. Um, uh, and uh, you see the average av uh, tracking error um, achieved by ILC. And we also distinguish between training data and uh, the validation data, where obviously uh, the validation data set uh, is not seen during the training of the convolutional neural network. So now we plug in our convolutional neural network. Um, and uh, we, chose a, we chose a convolutional network because we wanted to capture the coherence uh, in time, but also across the, the uh, degrees of freedom. Um, the input to this convolutional neural network is uh, a window in time along the desired trajectory uh, before and after uh, the current time step, and the output is uh, the feed forward command of the current time step. So on the right, uh, you see our approach with various amount of feedback. And on the left, um, in red, is depicted the performance that we achieve on each of these um, desired trajectories, where you see that um, on the validation data set, which is unseen, we achieve tracking performance in the range that also achieves ILC. Um, yeah, and we assume ILC is the gold standard on, on this particular trajectories. So now we plug in um, our method and uh, intercept real table tennis balls and we almost um, intercept 100%. So to conclude, uh, we learn a feed-forward part instead of feedback uh, to avoid uh, instabilities. We, com we combine the uh, well-known iterative learning control framework with deep learning to generalize to new trajectories and achieve excellent performance on a very challenging um, real-world and nonlinear task. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, the next paper is ISDF, uh, and that will be presented by Joe. Hi, I'm Joe from Imperial College London, and I'll be presenting our work, ISDF, Real-Time Neural Sign Distance Fields of Robot Perception. In this work, we're tackling the problem of reconstructing sign distance fields in real time. We show the inputs here on the left, the depth and pose of a camera moving live in an environment. And on the right, we show the output, the reconstruction of the sign distance field.
This reconstruction is produced by training a neural network in a continual learning manner. First, we're going to show some slices of the ground truth sign distance field for the environment. The sign distance field maps x, y, z coordinates to the distance to the closest surface to that point. Here we show positive values of the sign distance outside of objects in green and blue, and we show negative sign distances inside objects in purple and pink. Here we're visualizing level sets of the sign distance field. Note that the zero level set encodes the surface geometry of the environment. Sign distance fields are commonly used in robotics for, uh, for navigation and manipulation for motion planning. The reason for this is that it's very easy to transform a sign distance field into a collision cost field simply by applying something like the hinge cost as shown there. Although truncated sign distance fields are commonly used in SLAM systems such as Connect Fusion, it's very challenging to reconstruct full non-truncated sign distance fields because simply applying depth fusion results in large errors away from surfaces. Other related work, such as DeepSTF, tackles reconstructing objects using sign distance fields. However, these kind of works aren't real time. In ISDF, we tackle the problem of reconstructing full sign distance fields for large scenes in real time. The most notable related prior work is VoxBlox, which is a method based on voxel grids that reconstructs the sign distance field in a two-stage approach, first reconstructing the surface and then doing an expensive wavefront propagation algorithm to, to compute the sign distances in all cells. In contrast, ISDF is quite different and, work and operates by training a neural network in real time. This gives ISDF a number of, a number of positive properties compared to VoxBlox. We'll show these by looking at the reconstructed surface uh, for both of the methods side by side. The first key property is that ISDF is predictive. By this, we mean it can sensibly fill in partially observed regions, for example, completing the backside of this beanbag. Also, ISDF can denoise many noisy measurements, producing a smooth reconstruction of this wall. A second key property is that it's efficient. It can adaptively model different parts of the scene with different levels of detail, allowing it to reconstruct small objects such as this lamp accurately. It's also important to note that ISDF is only using two megabytes of memory here in the network weights, whereas VoxBlox uses tens of megabytes to store the voxel grid. Here I'll briefly explain the supervision method we use to train ISTF. First of all, we select a bunch of keyframes from our keyframe set using active sampling. And then we back project rays using random pixels in the keyframes. The network is then queried at points sampled along these rays, and we compute a loss using a bound on the sign, dis sign distance. The simplest bound we could use is, is the distance along the ray to the surface. However, this is a weak bound, and we instead choose to use the closest surface point in the batch to provide a bound. This is a much tighter bound and results in much stronger supervision for the network. We're now going to focus in on a single ray and look at how this bound is computed. Here we show the vectors going from each of the points along the ray to the closest surface point in the batch. These vectors can also be used to supervise the spatial gradient of the predicted sign distance. Lastly, we're going to show some qualitative reconstruction results for, some scan, for one scanlet sequence and one replica CAD sequence. On the top on the left, we show the ground truth mesh, and below that, the reconstructed surface. On the right, we have two slices, the a slice of the ground truth sign distance field, and below, a slice of the predicted sign distance field. We can see that the final reconstruction of the mesh is watertight and accurate geometrically. While the second reconstruction is playing, I want to highlight some other quantitative results that we uh, found. We compared ISDF to both VoxBlox and another method that is, runs on a GPU and is similar to Connect Fusion, and found that ISDF produces more accurate sign distance fields and also spatial gradient of the sign distance field, which is, of course, crucial for uh, trajectory optimization. Lastly, we're also going to have a live demo running at the poster session later on, so if you're interested, I'd really encourage you to come by and check it out. Also, our code is open sourced, so if you do want to run this on your robot in your lab, uh, I'd really encourage you to do so. Yeah, that's all for me, and looking forward to meeting people at the poster session later. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next paper will be POCD, uh, presented by Joe and Veronica. Hi, we're Veronica and Joe, graduate students at the University of Toronto, and we'd like to present our work on probabilistic object-level change detection and volumetric mapping in semi-static scenes. 
Nowadays, we're seeing a lot more robots being deployed in human-centric environments, like this warehouse robot moving equipment from one side of the facility to the other. However, long-term autonomous operation is still a big challenge, and a key issue are semi-static objects that appear, disappear, and gradually move over time. Failing to properly update the map when the scene changes can lead to failed localization and lost robots. We aim to develop a system to track semi-static changes in the scene and output an up-to-date map with the current scene configuration. In this presentation, we'll talk about our probabilistic object-level mapping method to tackle exactly this challenge, and we evaluate our method on a real-world data set of a warehouse environment that we collected and released with this work. Let's start by taking a look at overview of our proposed system. Uh, our system takes in RGBD frames, semantic labels, and camera poses as inputs. At each frame, our system extracts point clusters from the input data, and these clusters are associated with the mapped objects. Uh, while new objects are spawned, we also construct a TSDF volumetric model for each cluster. Then we compute the geometric error for each associated object uh, observation pair by comparing their volumetric models. With the geometric error and the semantic label, we propagate an object level state distribution to estimate the stationarity for each mapped object. And finally, we can construct an updated map uh, just using the reliable objects from the, uh, the map. So the core of our system is this object level joint distribution. Imagine our robot encounters a pallet in a warehouse. Uh, the current model estimates a accumulated geometric change of three centimeters with a estimated stationarity of 90%. Uh, however, the current depth measurement indicates a geometric error of two centimeters with a predicted stationarity label of likely static. So now our system needs to uh, estimate if the object has changed or not. So uh, we can, to answer this question, we can apply base rule to iteratively update the object state uh, based on new measurements and previous measurements. So uh, inspired by previous work on stereo depth estimation, we parameterize the object state with a Gaussian beta distribution. Uh, the intuition is that we expect objects to stay around the original location in a semi-static thing, and the stationarity is just the uh, probability between zero and one. So uh, on the other hand, the measurement likelihood is decoupled as a uh, product between semantic and geometric uh, terms. The geometric air term is modeled as a Gaussian uniform mixture weighted by the stationarity, as we expect the geometric air to be a uh, zero mean Gaussian if the object did not move. If the object is changed, then it could be anywhere. Uh, the semantic heuristic is modeled as a Bernoulli distribution, as we expect uh, likely static objects, such as shells, will have a high chance of staying around. So putting everything together and apply uh, moment matching, we can derive an approximate uh, solution for the posterior. So on the left, we can see that under consistent measurements, both the object state uh, confidence and stationarity increase. And under inconsistent measurements, on the scene on the right, we see a huge drop in stationarity. So uh, we evaluate our system on a robot in a warehouse. As seen in the top row, our system constructs a volumetric object-aware map from scratch when first deployed. And after scene changes in the bottom row, our system uh, discards the changed objects when sufficient observations are made. To see our Bayesian model in action, we look at the evolution of the state distribution of just one box in the scene. Now before the scene changes, the measurements align very well with the stored model of the object, so the stationarity score goes to one after just visiting the box twice. After the scene changes, however, the robot detects a significant mismatch, the stationarity score drops below a threshold, and the box is wiped and reconstructed at its new location. We compare our work against two recent semi-static mapping methods, FAIRS, which does voxel level updates, and Panoptic Multi-TSDFs, which uses a heuristic to estimate stationarity. Our method outperforms the two in precision on our warehouse data set, and the figures here show the final map produced on a sample trajectory. Now, our object-aware probabilistic method produces the least amount of false positives after a scene change as highlighted in red, while maintaining a very high level uh, of scene coverage show as shown in green. And in summary, we derived a Bayesian update rule to propagate object stationarity and pose change assessment using both geometric and semantic information. We introduced a novel online object-aware map maintenance framework leveraging this derived Bayesian update rule. And finally, we collect and release a real-world change detection data set captured in a warehouse setting on a robot platform. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you at our poster session. Thank you. The final paper of the session is DICP presented by Hitash.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Hitesh, and I'm here to present our work on Doppler iterative closest point algorithm. This is joint work done along with my co-authors, Bruno and E. at Ava. Existing variants of ICP that solely rely on geometric features usually tend to fail in featureless and uh, environments with repetitive structures, such as tunnels and highways, as seen on the video on the left here. Furthermore, the presence of any dynamic points tends to uh, degrade the pose estimates from ICP. Here we see ICP uh, registers the point set to the motion of the dynamic vehicles in front of us rather than the static hole. We first describe the uh, basic principles of uh, Doppler velocity measurement using FMCW LIDARs. We then present a new Doppler velocity error term for robust point cloud registration, a simple method to reject outlier points, and finally present some real world results. So given the distance measurements from the FMCW LIDAR, we can compute the unit direction vectors to these points. Note that the sensor is moving with certain velocity, and assuming all these points are stationary, uh, we would observe an equal and opposite relative velocity on these points. The Doppler velocity is basically the projection of these relative velocities along the radial direction of observation. Next, a quick primer on ICP. Given a source and a target point cloud, the iterative closest point algorithm seeks to first uh, match correspondences between the two point sets and iteratively minimizes a geometric error, such as point to point or point to plane, to optimize the pose. The pose vector consists of a rotational and a translation component. We approximate the sensor velocities using these pose components as shown here, where delta t is the sampling interval between the two scans. Using the estimated sensor velocity, we now uh, estimate the relative velocities for all the static points. And again, we have the range measurements from the sensor. And using the direction vectors to these points, we can now predict what the Doppler velocity would be for all these points. And we do this in each step of the ICP algorithm. We now formulate a new objective function that minimizes the error between the actual measured Doppler velocities and the predicted Doppler velocities. Uh, we do this to optimize the sensor pose again. So in Doppler ICP, we basically jointly optimize the sensor pose using a geometric objective and a Doppler velocity objective. And these objective functions are weighed by a parameter lambda. Next, we present a simple method to reject dynamic outlier points. Uh, points that have a high level of disagreement between the predicted and the expected velocities are rejected based on a predetermined threshold delta v. We now present some uh, results on real world sequences. The plot below represents the relative translation error between the two scans. Notice how the error for the point to plane method shoots up as the ego vehicle enters the tunnel whereas our method, Doppler ICP, is able to constrain this registration problem well and estimates the poses with low translation errors. We present another sequence with a couple of dynamic vehicles on a highway scene. Uh, again, on the left, we see that the point-to-plane method aligns the point sets to the motion of the vehicles in front of us, whereas Doppler ICP registers the point set uh, correctly to the static world. The data for these sequences were collected using AWAS ARIES-1 FMCW LIDAR. In summary, we present a new uh, Doppler velocity error term that is independent of the geometric structure of the environment. The combined Doppler ICP objective not only achieves significantly lower registration errors, but we also uh, observe that the, it helps the ICP algorithm converge faster in all other scenarios. We also presented a simple method to reject dynamic outlier points based on the expected Doppler velocity measurements. Do join us at the poster session later to know more. We implement uh, Doppler ICP as part of the Open3D library, and the source code is available on our GitHub. Thank you.
Uh, great. We will now have a, a short Q&A. Please come up to the microphones and we invite all the speakers to come up uh, to answer the questions. Uh, I'll start with a quick question for uh, the first paper. I'm curious how does, uh, uh, which is a learning-based iterative control framework, I'm curious how does the method handle large disturbances? Um, yeah, so it's, it is true that um, the disturbance need to be kind of limited. Um, but uh, the balls that we, for, for this particular task, were already quite different. So they were um, around 20 to 30 centimeters apart. So this kind of disturbances we can definitely handle. But there's no f um, real um, principled way of actually answering this question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. This question is for the ISDF paper. Uh, do you know how we might model uh, other attributes? Uh, you know, currently you do depth reconstruction, but if you needed texture, color, or other stuff, uh, is there a way of doing this straightforward manner? Yeah, it would be very straightforward to make the uh, network multimodal. So, yeah, currently it's just predicting a sign distance value, but you could easily add color. In fact, we did experiment with this, but kind of found it simpler to just stick with depth in this case. Um, and yeah, you could trivially add color. Um, then you need to have some kind of render loss and training. Or you could add other scene properties into the network by just adding multiple heads to the network um, to output these different properties. Cool. Thanks. It's also for ISDF paper. Um, do you need a very accurate camera poses? If yes, how do you get the accurate camera poses? Yeah, so uh, in our experiments, we do assume that we know the poses. Um, so we did some experiments on a synthetic data set when we had poses available, and we also used a scanner data set for the other ones, which also provides poses. Um, yeah, it would be quite simple to add some pose optimization into the system and kind of have some bun adjustment going on instead of just the mapping. Uh, there's some choices about what loss you would use to, to refine the pose. Uh, we did experiment with just using the same loss that we're using to train the sign distance field to optimize the pose, but that didn't work super well. And so I think that some kind of loss based on a render of the depth would be a sensible way to do it. Uh, and we have looked into that, and that's something we're continuing to work on. Okay, thank you. Uh, qu sorry, a uh, question for ISDF. Uh, do you think uh, that method can be used for uh, recognizing uh, terrains and uneven surfaces? Sorry, recognizing what? Terrains, uh, different uneven surfaces like uh, rocks and stones and... Uh, I'm thinking of legged, legged robots locomotion, basically. Yeah, sure. I guess ISDF is reconstructing a, yeah, a 3D map and so... Uh, yeah, you can easily do things like extract the normals in the surface or um, kind of convert that into a mesh, and then you could do some kind of recognition based on the mesh. Um, or you could do some kind of semantic labeling. As I was saying, you could, have a, you could easily add heads to this network to have a multimodal um, predictions, and so you could add like a semantic head to this network. And in fact, that's, that's been done in lots of related work before. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually another question for ISDF. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I was wondering, the network, is it pre-trained at all? And if it isn't, uh, how do you think it's completing the backsides of objects? What biases is it able to learn uh, to do that? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's, it's trained completely from scratch. We ran and as a network at the start of um, each run. Uh, obviously, this isn't the optimal thing to do because we have no prior information about the scene. But yeah, so the way it can complete the backside of objects is that, um, yeah, so when it's reconstructing the parts of the scene that it can see, it's learning some kind of feature set that is kind of used to reconstruct, and then it's kind of repeating these features uh, in the unobserved regions to, um, to sensibly fill in in like a self-supervised way. Thank you. For now, but uh, feel free to ask more questions at the poster session. Let's thank the speakers one more time. Okay, big uh, thanks to all of our speakers.
Uh, it is my distinct pleasure now to introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, this is Raquel Ortison. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Wabi, an AI company building the next generation of self-driving technology. She is also a full professor at the University of Computer, uh, sorry, University of Toronto Department of Computer Science. Um, she's also a co-founder of the Vector, Vector Institute for AI and the recipient of several high-profile rewards, uh, awards, including the Longay Higgins Prize, an Ever Everingham Prize, an NSERC ER EWR Stacey Award, two NVIDIA Pioneers of AI Awards, three Google Faculty Research Awards, an Amazon Faculty Award, uh, and many more. Um, she has also been uh, recognized as a 100 Women of Impact in uh, of Entrepreneur Magazine, 100 People Transforming Business by Business Insider, and Toronto's Most in, uh, Influential Torontoans, according to Toronto Life Magazine. Uh, without further ado, I'll let her get set up, and uh, let's all please welcome Raquel Erdison. Hear me? Yes, no. Yeah, I was saying thank you for the kind introduction. Um, sorry, we have a slightly complex setting here. Um, so give us two seconds. Amazing. I have to say that these guys are amazing. So thank you for uh, all the support for uh, getting the. I guess AV, which is always uh, not autonomous vehicles, but uh, you know, in terms of presentations, which uh, are always um, you know difficult to get right. Um, anyways, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you for the organizers to inviting me. Um, it's always great to you know to come to robotics conferences, which uh, I don't have the pleasure to go very often. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about uh, you know what I think is you know the uh, next way to go over uh, trying to solve self-driving at the scale, which is with an AI-first approach, which I think that uh, you know, most of the audience will agree with me, uh, that it's time for a modern approach to self-driving vehicles. Um, so I think the, you know, it's important to know that the promise of self-driving you know, has been made for many years, uh, but remains you know, extremely exciting because once they are there at the scale, they are really going to transform the world as we, as we know it today. Um, it's going to be you know, much greener in terms of the cities that we're going to have. We are not going to have supply chain issues, and there is going to be enhanced safety uh, to our roads. And I really look forward to uh, you know, see them everywhere. Now it's going to take a little bit more time to, to get us there. And today I will, I will be talking a bit about the technology that I believe will, uh, will get us there. All right, so um, just to uh, maybe a, a little summary of you know, what we are doing at Wabi and what Wabi is. Um, so a year and a half ago, uh, almost a year and a half ago, I founded a company called Wabi, uh, which the, you know, uh, the idea is to really bring the next generation of self-driving technology to the market. And it's a company that is not focused on showing flashy demo. It's a company that is really focused into bringing this technology to everyone out there. Um, we are based in Toronto as well as San Francisco. We have a whole bunch of remote people as well. And uh, in order to bring this uh, vision to life, um, you know, I fundraise, uh, I guess, a whole bunch of money, uh, you know, $83 million, uh, you know, on the first day of uh, opening the company, which was, you know, I think the largest uh, Series A uh, in Canada. Um, we have a highly differentiated approach. Today I'm gonna be talking a bit uh, about what that means and what it is. And there is a lot of like really, really exciting uh, stuff happening in the company where, as I said, we are laser focused now in logistics, bringing self-driving transportation to our highways, really transporting goods, right? Uh, these days it's really hard to get anything out there because of the supply chain issues. And it's getting worse and worse because there are not enough drivers. So automation is the only way to get there. And that's what we're trying to really solve with Wabi. All right, so enough about the company. Now let's get into the technical stuff. Um, so for all, uh, all of you, just to get on the same, you know, on the same page, uh, let's talk a little bit about you know, my 30 seconds introduction to self-driving, okay? So bear with me. This is probably obvious for everybody here. Um, so in terms of you know, how 
you know, every self-driving vehicle typically works out there is that you capture information from the sensors. I'm showing this with the later point cloud seen from the top. Uh, typically, uh, almost all we use uh, high-definition maps, which are these beautiful maps that give you a lot of information about the environment before you even see it. Uh, so the first task is really to localize the vehicle so that you can employ these high-definition maps as a prior for your autonomy stack. Uh, once you localize, then the idea is that the perception system is going to be looking around and seeing you know, all the different objects that appear in the scene. And then you know, need to predict how these objects are going to be moving and what they're going to be doing in the next few seconds. And this is key because in order to plan a safe maneuver, you need to understand the intention, what's going to happen in the future. Otherwise, you will have very aggressive uh, planner, very reactive that will be unsafe. Okay, so prediction uh, is a very, very important key component of self-driving, and it's a pretty hard task. Then, given the information about the past, the present, and the future, you need to uh, reason about what you should do as a self-driving vehicle, and basically uh, every fraction of a second uh, plan, what your maneuver should be, right? And typically, you repeat this process every 100 milliseconds or so. Okay, this is on a nutshell how almost every self-driving vehicle works. Now, if we look a little bit out there, right, so the industry has, has made, you know, I would say significant progress, but the promise of self-driving vehicles everywhere is really far from being fulfilled, right? If you live in San Francisco, you can see quite a few. If you live in any other city, you see none, right? So, so there is, you know, a couple of reasons why this is the case. Uh, one of it is that, you know, the industry has been pretty bad at basically stating the obvious, which is that this is a very, very hard problem to solve. Right? We need, you know, the collective minds of people like you in order to really bring this technology, right? In order to really develop and invent this technology, right? So why is it hard to do, uh, to do, you know, driving or self-driving is that the decision process is actually pretty nuanced. Small changes in the environment fully change your reaction, what your maneuver should be. Also, the number of possibilities is extremely large. There is exponentially many things that you're going to be exposed to. And most of them are actually really rare. So typically, you know, you're going to need to drive millions, billions, trillions of miles in order to see one of these events. So that makes it a very, very hard development process. But it's not just about the problem being hard. It's also that the technology is far from being, you know, perfect or the right technology to solve this. Right? There has been a lot of consolidation since the DARPA challenge. Uh, typically what you see in the industry is that every software stack is almost a copycat of, you know, the stack that you see somewhere else. And this comes because it is a cross-pollination of people and ideas in the industry. And you know, this is good if you have solved the problem. This is actually really dangerous if you haven't solved the problem, because you have the collective power of the world thinking the same. And this is not the way that you come up with you know, what is the best solution out there, right? As researchers, what do we know is that we need to look at many different ways to solve the problem in order to advance science, in order to advance this difficult problem. All right, and in terms of, you know, why do I say that the technology is far from, per from perfect is because they use a very hand engineer approach where, you know, all over the process uh, requires humans. And that's actually really costly. That's something that is very difficult to generalize. And if you look at the software stacks, they still look very similar to what you observed during the DARPA challenge, which is almost 20 years ago now, right? 20 years is a lot of time. Let me give you a little bit more details about, you know, what is it that, uh, you know, uh, we don't like about the traditional kind of an engineer um, approach to uh, solve self driving. Um, so typically, you know, as I mentioned before, is this modular approach where you have, you know, a set of blocks here, perception, prediction, planning, etc. Right, but uh, when you go, you know, deep in the weeds into how these technologies develop, there is no holistic thinking. Instead, you typically have, you know, thousands of people right, working on this problem, and, you know, the pie gets split into sub-problems, that get split into smaller sub-problems, and then, you know, an engineer or a researcher working on self-driving will end up working on these very small parts of the problem. For example, I want to track pedestrians that are crossing the street uh, jaywalking, right? So, so that's, it's very hard to actually build the right thing if you're thinking of this very, very small problem. And then somehow you need to piece together all this stuff to make the right decision making, right? So that's, it's going to be hard to solve it that way. Also, this is a software stack typically that is built by humans for humans, right? What do I mean by this is that the uh, interfaces between the different models are very, very 
small. Typically, you will see things like the state of the different actors, maybe some notion of uncertainty, but if you made a mistake, it's impossible to correct. So you end up with this cascading of mistakes along the stack. Furthermore, the other thing that you will see in the industry is that you know, typically you go on, this, uh, on the road and then you drive and drive and drive, and then you typically see, you categorize the type of mistakes that your system does. Let's say that your system gets fooled by, you know, leaves on the ground, then you end up, you know, spinning up an effort to actually try to solve that problem. And yet you add one more module to this complicated software stacks. So you end up with this spaghetti code that is really, really hard to make it to work. And finally, there is no automation. Every time that you make a change, you have to retune the entire system. And this is, you know, hundreds of modules, right? So it turns out that in industry, if you make a change, it takes you one quarter, two quarter to land that change, right? And this is why it's very, very hard to make progress. So we need something different, right? We need to go from this very human-centric approach to something that is better for machines. Um, so, you know, I'm going to be talking about an AI first approach, and I'm sure that the first thing that everybody is thinking is something that looks like this, right? So Raquel is advocating for this black box neural net that is going to solve everything. Well, not really, right? So the, if you just go and think that a single neural net is going to solve your entire problem, uh, you know, it's going to be hard for you to get there because there is no interpretability. Uh, if the system makes a mistake and, uh, you know, you need to explain to the regulators why you made a mistake, you're going to be in trouble, right? So this is not something that you can really put on a product out on the road. And if you think about, you know, a neural network like this that has to generalize to all the possibilities of the environment, you need to expose it to so many examples, right? Including all the safety critical cases, including all the accidents so that at least, you know, it slows down or does the right thing in order to minimize impact. And there is no way that you can do that. That's not ethical, right? So we need something else. Um, so what, uh, you know, what we are building and what they've been advocating for the past, I don't know how many years now, is to do something that is the best of both worlds. Uh, and the idea is that you're going to have still the modularity, you have the interpretability of the interpretable representations, uh, but at the same time, you use automation. You have the ability to train the system end-to-end. End-to-end okay? -end doesn't mean black box neural net. And this is a misconception that has been out you know, for many, many years. You can still have a modular approach, an interpretable approach, and have the ability to train the entire system. Okay? And this is a very, very powerful concept. All right, so the kind of technology that we are building is AI first in the sense that it's end-to-end -end trainable, so you get the automation. You have these more complex um, interfaces so that uh, you, don't, you can propagate uncertainty much better. You, uh, you know, all the way to motion planning and control, you can get access to the raw sensor data so that uh, you, know, you, don't, you don't have this cascade of mistakes. And it's very scalable, very affordable. You can develop this with much, uh, you know, many, much less people, whatever the word is in English, um, as well as um, it generalizes really well. And in particular, we use uh, you know, a new generation of uh, AI algorithms that use probabilistic inference, complex optimization, and deep learning. Okay? Yes, utilizing AI as, as we know it today is not going to solve the problem either. Okay? So you need to innovate. There is a need for research. All right, and the last bit that we need is um, also we need a high, um, you know, real world, high fidelity closed loop simulator. That's the other key uh, component that in order to solve this task. Okay, this is something that uh, has been underestimated in the industry and that with what we will really bring it to the front page into this is a tool that you need for development, for validation, for verification, for the safety case. And I'm going to show you today uh, what we will, which is, you know, our answer to, uh, you know, simulation. All right, so, so the agenda of today is um, I'm going to first be uh, talking about autonomy. And I have some bad news, which is I'm not going to show you all the new stuff we are doing at Wabi in the autonomy front. Okay, we haven't yet made public, so you will need to wait a couple more months, but I promise you that we are going to showcase it at some point. Um, so I'm going to be just building you a story and some of the work that we have done over the past, you know, five years or so. Okay. And then I'm going to be talking about Wabi's uh, high fidelity closed loop simulator. Okay. And then I will go on details on that piece. All right. All right, so let's look at autonomy. And here, I'm not going to be going over details of a specific methods. I'm going to be more talking about what are the things that you need, how do you should be thinking about the problem, what are the things that you need to solve. Okay, just giving you a taste of some of the problems that are actually really important. All right, 
So I mentioned before that we want to have an end-to-end -end trainable uh, full autonomy system, okay? And there is two ways that you can go around doing this. One is to be super ambitious and from day one say that I'm going to train the entire system, or you can go, you know, piece by piece trying to go broader and broader and broader on your scope, okay? So this is advice for all the junior graduate students out here in the, uh, you know, in the, in the floor is that don't go for the large thing. It's going to be really difficult to make progress. Try to compartmentalize your problem into something that is brother. Learn about it and expand and expand and expand. And at the end, you will actually capture the entire system. Okay, that's kind of the philosophy that we have done in the you know in the group over the past I would say 10 years or so working in self-driving. All right. So what we're going to first do is we're going to join perception and prediction. Right. So two-thirds of the software stack into a single system. Okay. And so the easiest way to do this is actually the, you know, the first model that, uh, that we develop and then put it to production actually during the Uber days. Um, so, so this turns out to be very simple, but work extremely well, much better than the handcraft kind of perception prediction system. And the idea is very simple right now that uh, you know, all of you are excited about AI, is that you, know, you can take the raw sensor data and then have a, have a neural network that basically performs detection and for every one of your detections, also predicts the trajectories into the future. So if you can do this, right, you can actually, yes, by using multitask learning, you can do joint perception and prediction. Trivial, right, super simple network. Very simple idea. It turns out that this actually worked remarkably well. All right, so let me show you a, a video of, uh, this was actually 2017, so, you know, quite a while ago. And as you can see here, uh, you know, was able to really detect really well all the objects of interest, track them over time that you got for free, as well as predict the trajectory into the future. Okay, our first attempts of trajectory prediction were actually pretty short in terms of the length. Here is only one second. Obviously, you need much longer than this for a real system. Okay. All right. So, so, you know, if you think about it, right, this was a very, very simple system, right, that is just a very streamlined neural net with classification for detection as well as, uh, you know, regression for prediction, right? Um, so the other thing that, you know, is important when you develop self-driving is that, uh, you know, we were pretty later-centric in our papers, but obviously the system uh, always used more than one modality, and this is important for, in terms of uh, reliability, in terms of safety, okay? And, you know, one of the open questions in the community was that, how did you fuse information between the different sensors? You know, at the time, there was a lot of people, you know, that advocate for late fusion, some people for early fusion. Um, you know, our advocate was always to let the network learn because it's going to know much better what is the right architecture than you as a human. Okay? And that's actually something that works really well where you let the network fuse information across all the different layers, but you use the geometric properties that relate the two sensors, the images as well as the LIDAR, in order to help this fusion operation. Okay? So you don't forget about geometry, you use it, but you use it within learn representations. All right, so uh, this actually worked really well as well. Um, so, you know, very fast, you can do inference, you know, in a few milliseconds across, you know, all these different sensors. And nicely, you only need annotations in the 3D later space, which is also something that you take, you know, to take into account when you when you build real systems. And as you see here, the, the sensors get uh, you know, foggy, the LiDAR can get dirty. Uh, you know, there is many of these, uh, you know, maybe the LiDAR can fail, et cetera. So you need to train your system so that they are robust to any sensor failure, okay? I'm of the opinion that it should be a single path instead of multiple paths and then somehow decide, you know, which subset of the system you execute at test time, which is, you know, pretty dangerous, I would say. It gives you a false notion of our safety in many ways. All right, so, so we can use now information across multiple sensors. We can do very simple predictions into the future in terms of, you know, what is the most likely trajectory. But one of the things that uh, is difficult about prediction is the fact that they can be many realizations of the future. So let's take an intersection here uh, where we have two vehicles uh, at the intersection. I'm not sure what happened to the second one uh, on the left, but so there was a vehicle there before. Um, anyways, so since we don't necessarily know where these vehicles are going, there is many things that they can do, right? They can, you know, this vehicle on the bottom can turn right, can actually take, uh, you know, turn, uh, take a left, and the same for the vehicle on the top, right? Um, this is why it's an inherently multimodal problem. 
right? Not only also there is all these different behaviors, but also is the fact that there is different speed profiles, there is different spatial realizations, right? So um, it's important that we really handle the multimodality inherent to this uh, future prediction, right? And so one of the things also that is important with prediction is that we take into account the interaction between these different agents, right? Because you don't drive independent of everybody else, right? We try to drive so that it's safe for everybody and we you know, all advance towards our goal. And lately, uh, lastly, what is very important is that you know, we need to build systems that actually work in real time. They're very, very fast. So when you're developing your methods, you should take this into account as well. All right, so in terms of modeling interactions, there has been you know, quite a bit of work uh, in the literature about you know, what is the right representation also for multimodal predictions, right? Whether it is a mixture of Gaussians, right? This is something that Waymo likes. We like non-parametric representations. Uh, we like uh, also retrieval-based methods that are actually quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you look at the literature uh, up to uh, you know, one of our papers and subsequent follow-ups, um, the interaction, uh, so techniques were using an interaction model, for example, through graph neural networks, but uh, after the, the interaction is propagated here, hopefully you see my mouse, um, basically what these systems predict is a marginal distribution for every actor. Right, and uh, all those papers are great, they show metrics, and they stop there. They never talk about how is this gonna be used you know, during planning? Right? And this is why this holistic view is very important because if, you know, no matter how much interaction you predict, if you don't reason about this uh, consistency between the different actors at planning time, you know, you are back to square one, meaning that there is no interactions whatsoever, okay? So if you think about, you know, predicting the marginal distributions for, uh, for these actors, and let's say that you have N actors, and k modes per actor, you end up to k to the n possible futures that the motion planner needs to handle. Right? That's going to be really complicated. Right? That's going to be computationally expensive. That's going to be something that the planner is going to be very, very uh, cautious if he needs to handle all these different things. Okay? So, so we need to do something that is more at the scene level, which is something that is really missing in the literature. Uh, so let me put you this with pictures. Um, so here is, uh, we have the self-driving vehicle on the left, and then we have two actors uh, that are part of the environment, right? And there is, let's say, two possibilities per actor, right? So there is a total of four possibilities of the entire scene, right? So is either this might happen, right? Which is, you know, pretty likely, or maybe this, which is also pretty likely. Maybe both are trying to go at the same time, right? So this doesn't seem to be like, uh, you know, a good idea. They might end up in collision, right? So this is less likely, right? Or they can really cross paths and you will, you know, never see this or almost never see this, right? So, but it's impossible to, by looking at the marginals, to have this to have low probability because independently these two modes have high probability, therefore the combination uh, will also have high probability, right? This is the reason why we need something more sophisticated. Okay, so one way that you can do something more sophisticated at the scene level is by representing what's happening with a latent variable model. You know, probabilistic graphical models are amazing. If you work with deep probabilistic graphical models, in my opinion, winner, winner, okay? So look at that if, if you haven't yet. Um, but you can use this, you know, uh, distributed latent representations to basically represent everything that is going or happening in the scene. And what I'm showing you here is that I'm taking two uh, values of this latent representation and then interpolating in between. And you see that with this one latent representation, you can actually model the interactions, how everybody is uh, behaving in the scene. Okay, so now we have this ability to really couple the probability distribution of all the different actors. All right, so maybe a little bit more details of how to do this. So you do your detection, right? You have, uh, in this case, a two-stage detector, so you have your representations for every actor. We are gonna have our favorite, you know, graph neural networks, which is something that, you know, uh, we love in the lab to do um, in order to capture the probability distribution of the, um, of the latent variable Z given the input. And then basically the way that you perform inference is that you sample from the latent variable and then you decode with another graph neural network and every decoding is actually the entire scene, okay? Um, and that's the way that you have these samples that directly give you what everybody is doing at once instead of going over the cross product of all these marginal distributions. 
All right, so it turns out that this actually performs extremely, extremely well. Otherwise, I will not be showing you this, right? Um, and on the left-hand side are prediction metrics in terms of are your predictions going to collide into the future, which is not something realistic, um, as well as you know how well you predict with respect to what happened in reality, right, for some real data. And on the right-hand side is collision rate safety metrics for planning. Okay, it's very, very important for everybody working in self-driving that you try to always do system-level metrics. Okay, don't get stuck in perception or prediction, try to make sure that your metrics are at the end of the system. And it will be mind-blowing what matters versus not. All right, and just to show you, you know, some video. So here you can see, you know, how, uh, you know, we are predicting, uh, you know, the different actors. And you see that typically multimodality only happens when it's necessary. For example, uh, when you can, you know, change lanes or when you can, you know, take uh, a turn, right, or continue straight, etc. So it's a model that is very, very flexible uh, compared to, you know, mixture of Gaussians, for example. All right, so, so now we can build these complex prediction systems that uh, model multimodality at the level of the entire scene. However, if you look at how good, you know, our system is, is as good as the sensor data, right? Because the vehicle can only do you know, react to things that it sees, right? That makes sense, right? Otherwise, uh, you know, we would be able to hallucinate the world. Um, so one thing that is, you know, that is quite restricted in that sense is that, you know, if you look at the scene, you know, things that are far away are gonna be difficult to predict because there is very little observations, right? Uh, whether it's camera, whether it's laser, right? It's gonna be a very tiny thing. And when you work in self-driving trucks, like we do at Wabi, uh, you need to see extremely, extremely far in case there is a hazard so that you can actually uh, stop this massive uh, truck on, on time, okay? Um, so this is a, a, true, a true problem. Now, some, some of the vehicles nearby, right, you're gonna have a lot of observations, but there is also a lot of occlusions, right? And this is the canonical example of you're driving, say, in New York City, and there is the key that comes out of occlusion, you know, because the ball just ran on the, on the street, right? So that actually happens relatively often, and there is, you know, very little that you can do because you don't really see. So what's the, the alternative or the thing that you can do in order to uh, deal with this is that if you were to have you know, multiple eyes seeing the scene from different locations, you will be able to actually see through occlusions, right? And um, uh, you can do this through vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication if you have multiple self-driving vehicles at the scene, or V2X if you have some cameras, say, at intersections or things like this. And this is an extremely exciting, uh, I would say, area for research. All right, so now we're gonna be able to see much better, okay? Um, so what you can see here is uh, we use simulation in order to, uh, this is one of our, I guess, past simulators, where you can see, uh, you know, in different colors are different self-driving vehicles, that are, uh, their observations are on the right uh, with the different colors, meaning which vehicle is seeing that observation, okay? And the idea now is that you have a distributed system across all these different vehicles, and then you want every one of these vehicles to leverage the information of vehicles nearby in order to be much safer and react better, okay? So one of the questions that you need to ask yourself is, how do I do this? Right? So what is the information that I should be transmitting in order to be able to, you know, utilize the information by everybody, right? So probably the thing that everybody is thinking is like, I don't want to lose information. So what I would like to have is the sensor data from everybody else, right? And you work in robotics, right? You know how difficult it is to get real time decision making when you have your own sensors. Imagine now if you multiply that by 10 vehicles or whatever number uh, that are seen all over the place, right? The, you know, the millions of points are gonna be tens of millions of points and all the cameras, there is no way that you can process all that information in real time. Furthermore, you're gonna need to do, you're gonna need to have 5G and more in order to transmit all that information, right? So this is, you know, not necessarily the best approach. On the other extreme, you can say that, well, maybe what I should do is just pass the end result of my inference process to everybody else so that they know what I'm thinking. And then based off, you know, collectively, this small abstract representation of maybe bounding boxes, their trajectories, maybe we can combine this information to see better, right? The problem with this is that if you're wrong and you're very confident, you're gonna corrupt everybody else, right? And if you're an adversary, that's pretty dangerous what you can do, right? So this is also not the best idea. However, in terms of transmission, you don't need a lot of information, right? So that, from that perspective, is good. 
So what we use is something different, which is that we are going to leverage the uh, neural networks in order to learn intermediate representations that maintain all the information, but at the same time can be highly compressed. Right? And this is something that you can actually learn just by adding an additional task loss. Right? And basically, that's the representation we're going to send. So we need a small bandwidth. We don't need 5G. And at the same time, we, we haven't lost the information. And you can think of this as everybody is doing processing their sensors. So it's a distributed system. And then comes the information gathering and propagation. That's actually a you know, pretty uh, interesting idea from a systems perspective, right? All right, so, so here is you know, my, my, I guess, uh, set of self-driving vehicles. Uh, we are gonna, each one is processing their information, is arriving to that intermediate representation. It's, that co information is gonna be compressed. It's gonna be sent to the air, right? We're gonna receive that information from everybody else. Uh, we're gonna decompress it. And then uh, we're gonna combine all that information with a graph neural network where every node is a self-driving vehicle in the scene. Okay, and this uh, graph neural network is going to combine uh, also using geometry, using time delay, right? Because you might receive later from some uh, some actors and others, right? It's going to combine all this information in a very robust manner in order to do better perception and prediction. Okay, so pretty simple idea that works remarkably well, and then you decode into your perception and prediction system. Okay, cool. All right, so it turns out that uh, you know, not only this works really well and you, you need very little bandwidth, but it grows you know, really nicely with the size of the fleet that you have in the environment. This is what you want to see, right? That the more vehicles, you know, once they are there, right, the more safe things become, right? And it turns out that you know, it's you know, pretty much linear uh, how you can uh, you know, become safer and safer uh, with utilizing vehicle-to-vehicle -to -vehicle communication. All right, so now we have a pretty sophisticated perception and prediction system, right? We can combine multiple sensors, we can utilize map information, we can uh, uh, do things like vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication to see beyond what our eyes are showing us, right? The next thing that we're gonna do is combine it with planning in an end-to-end -end system, okay? And I'm gonna show you quickly two and a half uh, ways to do this, okay? Bear, bear with me with the half. You will, explain, you know, I will explain why. All right. So, so we, you know, as always, the first thing that you know, once you go into expanding even more, don't go to the most complicated thing. Try to think about what is the simplest way to actually get this task done. And again, we're going to go for a multitask approach. Okay. So you're going to have the radar. You're going to have the maps. Uh, we are going to combine the information to do detection, prediction. And we are going to also output from our neural networks some information that we will use for planning. Okay? And uh, you know, I love sample-based planners. I think they are fantastic. They are uh, so intuitive. You can learn all sorts of things. And that's the kind of planner that you're going to see today. Okay? Um, and so basically, what we, the neural network is going to spit out is not directly the trajectory of the ego vehicle. Okay, we do this instead in a structured manner. I think it's a much more safe, robust way to do this. Um, and basically, uh, what it's going to spit out is a cost volume, which is non-parametric, of what is the cost for the driving vehicle for every location in a space in every play, every uh, time into the future. Okay, so that the way that we can do planning is that we are going to have a trajectory sampler. This is where we are only going to sample trajectories that are physically realizable. This is where your nice prior knowledge comes, um, such that we can index for every trajectory in the cost volume. We can sum those costs. This is something that is just a pool operation plus a sum in the GPU. So you can do it very, very efficiently. And then we do the arc mean of this. Okay? So you can do the sample based planner with all this neural and marmo thing in a few milliseconds as well. Okay, very, very uh, simple idea, but actually re works remarkably well. And all this you can train end to end with your favorite, for example, uh, March mar max margin loss, so that uh, you don't need to be differentiable with some things, as well as uh, for interpretability, we still use detection and prediction loss. Okay? Uh, so let me show you a video of this. Uh, you're going to see here uh, the uh, map. Uh, uh, with the leader point clouds, this is the output of perception and prediction, and this is my best attempt to showcase the cost volume. 
Uh, color means different time into the future, and I'm only showing you the areas of very, very low cost. This is non-parametric, so every point in time and space has a value, but here is only the ones where, you know, potentially we're going to do a maneuver. Okay? Um, and you see that, you know, it's multimodal by definition, right? It's, uh, you know, looking at things like maybe I should take, you know, a, a right, maybe I should queue behind, maybe I should be looking into slowing down or changing lanes because there's somebody, you know, stepping into our lane, okay? Um, and this is, a, again, a very, very uh, useful representation for multimodal uh, without specifying the number of modes, which is how do you know a priori, right? Okay, so, so this is great, right? And this is the kind of planners or the kind of representations typically that most of you use for robotics, right? Like typically you will do detection, prediction, motion planning, and then comes control. But there is an underlying problem with detection, which uh, oftentimes people don't talk about. Right, so let's assume that we have a scene like this. Um, and in this case, we can, you know, if the detection, uh, so we are the still driving vehicle on the bottom. If detection works well, then we're gonna detect everybody and we're gonna do the right maneuver, right? If for whatever reason, some of these vehicles is under the threshold for detection, and we only pass detection to the next stage, we don't see it. Although there is evidence there is something there. Right, and as a consequence, collision happens. Right? This is mind-blowing, right? But this is what happens if you actually have a detection-based uh, perception system in your self-driving vehicle. So we can't have something like this. We need to do something more. Okay, so one way to, to have a better representation than just banding boxes, right? The problem there is the, the threshold that you are doing, right? This, uh, um, this representation that is either there or it's not there in the first place, right? So that's actually a dangerous maneuver. Right. Um, instead, what we're going to do is predict spatiotemporal occupancy maps that are semantic. And this semantic can be quite sophisticated. Can be the category of the different actors, can be the intention and category of the different actors. For example, this is opposing traffic uh, versus uh, uh, you know, traffic that is not important for us, etc. Um, and we're going to have these intermediate representations. We're going to skip detection altogether, and then we're, we're going to pipe this to motion planning. Okay? And we will use a similar planner than before, which is sample place planner. I told you before that I really like this type of planner, right? But now instead of having this non-parametric all learn, uh, we're actually going to have something that uh, maybe is going to please some of the folks of the audience, which is more um, handcrafted, something that we incorporate more of the prior knowledge of what makes a good plan. Okay? Um, all right, so in, te in terms of sampling of trajectories, we will do things where uh, we use a, a sampler that is map aware. This is the way that you can actually uh, reduce the number of samples you need. And then in terms of, so we will sample trajectories, we will evaluate them all, we will cost them in the GPU very fast, and then uh, we select the one with the minimum cost, and then the costs now are things like you should drive you know, in the lane center, right on the driving paths, uh, you should follow the route, you should drive comfortably, and then you should avoid occupy stuff that comes from the neural network in these spatiotemporal occupancy maps. Okay? Um, and they come with velocities, so you can do headway costs and things like this that those of you that work on, on planning uh, you know, are familiar with. Cool, so the good thing about this is that you can train it end to end, right? You haven't given up that, uh, you know, the interpretability and the fact that you can you know, have automation. And again, it's very important that you have also a loss function in terms of the intermediate representation so that you do not remove the interpretability of your costs. Okay, and it turns out that this actually works much, much better than uh, if you, uh, particular in terms of safety, uh, than other types of approaches that use detection first. Okay, based on the intuition of what I told you before, that if you know it's too low in the confidence, then you're not going to see, and therefore you collide. Um, so let me show you one of these representations where different colors means uh, different semantics, um, and you see here that you can, and this is just the prediction into the future. Okay, and I'm, sh I'm showing you what happened, but without updating the predictions. Okay. So that you see, you know, whether we were predicting, you know, in terms of probability mass, the right thing versus not. Okay, so it's pretty sophisticated, you know, multimodal with semantics about the type of action, behavior of the different actors, and can handle also like small objects like pedestrians here and how uh, the interactions are between the different actors. For example, this red blob is this car is, is uh, stopping for the pedestrians to pass. Okay, 
Um, so that's something that, you know, you're not giving up uh, stuff, but at the same time, you get a much more robust representation. All right, and the half plan that I want to talk is I'm just going to give you a flavor into what else is important in planning. Um, so if you think about, uh, you know, planning and the type of planners that I was showing you before is that, you know, they work a little bit in terms of like worst case. They are like overly cautious meaning that uh, you typically are going to select a full trajectory such that nothing happened into the future. And once you have multimodal distributions, you might have quite a bit of mass in terms of all the different modes. And then you're going to be you know, over cautious, slowing down to make sure that in the future you never hit anything. Right? And then you will get people honking you as a driving vehicle because you, know, you don't drive like a human that is a little bit more aggressive. Right? So why is this the case? Right? It's in the underlying way of you do the planning, that you actually cause the entire trajectory. Uh, and in reality, uh, what is important to think about is that you are only going to execute the beginning of the trajectory, right? Because we are doing MPC, we are planning every 100 milliseconds. But you're costing the entire thing, you know, and, you know, if you do tracks, you are going to, you know, be predicting for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, really super long, right? So, so that's a tough problem to do. Um, so, you know, the next kind of generation of planning that you need to do is actually something called contingency planning, which is a beautiful idea, which is that um, the most intuitive way to think about this is that I don't need to commit to the entire trajectory now, right? Because I'm not going to drive 10 seconds blind, right, and, and then open my eyes again, right? I'm going to replan every, every 100 milliseconds. But what I should do is that I should plan a small trajectory such that no matter what happens afterwards, I can react appropriately. Right? And that's the concept of contingency planning that is you know, a beautiful concept. All right, so uh, in this case, a very easy way to actually get contingency planning with the type of planners that I was showing you before is to uh, now partition kind of the, the planning problem into we are going to have uh, short-term trajectories that are the ones that we are really going to execute, that we commit to, and then there is the what might happen afterwards where in this case, this is worst case, right, in the short trajectory, but this is not the worst case. This is there exists a way to plan such that I'm safe. Okay, and that results in much safer planner planning, uh, while at the same time not being, uh, you know, the overly cautious self driving vehicle that everybody's honking. Okay, um, so this is a very, you know, a very important concept that actually works uh, remarkably well. I'm actually in the interest of time. I'm going to just uh, go to the last bit, uh, which I think I have maybe 10 minutes, uh, and I will conclude with this. Um, cool. So, you know, I talk a lot about autonomy, and I was trying to give you a flavor of what are the things that to think about and how you expand and expand and expand your horizon. And, you know, we went more and more and more towards the task of driving, which is what matters. And this is very important because. You know, you can improve your perception system, but that doesn't mean that you're going to improve your system level metrics, right? So this is the disconnect that makes uh, progress in the, uh, you know, very slow in the industry, okay? So now we're going to shift gears into, now we have, you know, whatever is our beautiful autonomy system, okay? And hopefully I convince you that it's end-to-end mumble-jumble is really the way to go. And now we're going to talk about testing, verification, validation, safety case, okay? And the use of simulation for this. All right, so let's get into it. Um, so, you know, despite the, you know, how important simulation is, there has been, I would say, little emphasis in the community, in particularly the industry, into building the simulators that we need in order to truly uh, validate, verify our systems offline, okay? And, you know, lately there has been a bit more talk about, you know, the simulation systems by all the different players. But when you look at, you know, the details of the simulators, they are actually really a tool on a chain of tools uh, that gives you some information but cannot replace driving in the real world. Okay, and that's why it's problematic. Um, um, so if you, um, and typically, you know, every player will have multiple simulation systems. Then it's not like the simulator that can actually, they, they utilize. Um, and there is, maybe you can categorize the simulators into three different types. 
Uh, the first one is, I don't know why it's called simulation in industry, but uh, here it is, uh, which is what we typically call log replay, which is basically you collect your logs offline, right? You're driving, whatever, then that becomes part of your data set. And then when you make changes to your software stack, you're gonna replay the logs. Obviously, this is not reactive, right? Because if you actually execute, the new software stack will be different. Your sensor data will be different, but you don't have the ability to change it. You're just replaying what the other system did, right? So as a consequence, there is a mismatch, right? So this, uh, you know, helps you catch big regressions, uh, but it doesn't really tell you how well the system is performing, right? It's like the robot is just watching TV and then hoping that this way you're gonna learn to play tennis, right? That, that's not gonna happen. Um, the second type of uh, simulation systems that we see, right, is where you build a virtual simulation, and this typically is banding boxes of vehicles or actors, right, and their trajectories, and then you test the motion planner, okay? So this is reactive in this case, right, it's typically as part of a video game, uh, but the problem is that you're only testing one system of this complex software stack, right? So you're not gonna know whether the entire system performs well versus not. And the thing that we are seeing, uh, you know, these days quite a bit in academia, and this is uh, not really used in industry, uh, but maybe people are, you know, are starting to invest a little bit into this, is using game engines to create data for training perception systems. Okay, that's, uh, you know, something that typically I say that it's not really used because there is a big domain gap in, t in terms of, uh, you know, what the simulators do. Okay, so very scattered, Testing a little bit here, a little bit there, not reactive, maybe reactive and not the whole thing, right? So that's why, what is the consequence of this? You have to drive millions and millions of miles in the real world to see what your issues are. This is not safe, it's extremely expensive, it's not reliable, um, and definitely is not the way that, you know, things are gonna get worse and worse because the better the system gets, the more you need to drive to find the mistake. And you don't wanna find the mistake on the road, that's dangerous, right? So you wanna do it offline. Um, so what we're gonna do with a simulator I'm gonna show you is that we're gonna invert this pyramid where we're gonna use mostly simulate, simulation uh, to validate, verify our systems, and then we need only a little bit of on-road. And the reason why is uh, because we have this next generation simulation. Okay, and uh, hopefully the sound works, uh, yep. Ever think about what it really takes to drive? Probably not. We learn it, and we just do it. We'll stop. Think about it. Driving is hard. We process things quickly. React instantly. Our brains do this so well, it's mind-blowing. At Wabi, we're teaching the brain of a self-driving vehicle to do the same, but even better. This brain is virtual. Picture lines of code, like the Matrix. We call it the Wabi Driver. But it still needs access to experiences to learn like us. That can't happen entirely out on the road. It would take thousands of self-driving vehicles, driving millions of miles for thousands of years, to experience everything necessary to drive safely. After all, there are many things that happen very rarely. We need another way. That's why we made Wabi World, our high fidelity driving simulator, or simply put, the ultimate school for self-driving vehicles. Let's take a look inside. First, Wabi World reconstructs from real life sensor data. We can automatically reconstruct objects, such as cars, SUVs, trucks, and more. It can digitally recreate reality as seen, or even modify it, to create an endless number of diverse virtual worlds. And we can do this across different sensor configurations, as though the driver were in a car, or even a truck. All automatically and at scale. We drop the Wabi driver into these simulated virtual worlds and it can see and behave exactly as it would in the real world. Wabi World can then create traffic scenarios to test the Wabi driver. 
and generate all kinds of variations. We can create scenarios that mimic a calm afternoon or morning rush hour. Two lane interstates or five lane freeways, all while reacting in real time to the Wabi driver's behavior to create interesting interactions. It's kind of like playing a video game where every action has a reaction. The Wabi driver makes a choice, traffic reacts. But unlike a video game, Wabi World can multiply and evolve scenarios infinitely. We can also evaluate how the Wabi driver performs in simulation and use AI to automatically generate challenging and realistic scenarios. Wabi World doesn't just test the driver to its limits, but also helps it learn new skills. Initially, the novice driver has difficulty in a scenario. But over time, Wabi World can be an instructor and help the driver get better. So ultimately, the Wabi driver will learn on its own to drive safely in any vehicle, in any scenario, anywhere in the world. Never think about what it really takes to drive. At Wabi, we have. And Wabi World is our answer. Cool. So hopefully you could uh, you could hear uh, uh, I guess the video. Um, so quickly go over you know how do we do this? Um, so the idea is that in order to really uh, uh, you know remove the reliance on driving in the real world is that you need to provide a simulator that is like the real world, right? That's the only way that you can replace it. Um, so that means that it has to be immersive, meaning that the input to the software stack has to be of the same type as in the real world. So you need to do sensor simulation to uh, simulate how the radar, how the cameras, how the radar will have seen the, the scene. It has to be reactive, right? You need to understand the consequences of your actions and how your actions are gonna influence everybody else. It has to have the diversity of the real world and it has to be at scale uh, of all the possibilities that might happen in the real world, okay? So there is nothing like this out there, and what we, what we world is the first insta instantiation of this, okay? Um, so, so I guess a little bit quickly uh, here, since we're running out of time. Um, so it's built on four core capabilities. Uh, in order to mimic the world, we actually reconstruct the world automatically. And that's the thing that you see here in the, in the middle, where we can reconstruct in 3D with all the material properties, et cetera, all the different actors and everything, and we only need to see the ones, right? Every time you see an actor, it becomes part of the simulator, part of the catalog of the things that you might use in order to create new things that you have never seen before. Um, then we have you know, sensor simulation in terms of cameras as well as later that is super, super realistic, right? Uh, where the domain gap is extremely, extremely uh, small. For example, for later it's 0.5 when uh, IP, where for Carla is 30%, 30 points, right? So that's the difference between, you know, why we can actually do this versus with other simulators you can't. Um, then you need to generate at the scale uh, the scenarios. And then lastly, we, you know, for this end-to-end -end autonomy, we can actually train the system in simulation as well which is, you know, kind of the next thing. All right, so, so just to show you a couple of videos, right? Um, so given raw sensor data from cameras and LADAR, we, whatever platform, it doesn't need to be our cell driving vehicle, we can reconstruct in 3D and we can do this at the scale. Um, so, you know, all the different scenarios that you see. Uh, then we can, you know, simulate in real time or near real time all the sensors. And the reason that we can do this super realistically and super fast is because we don't use game engines. We don't use physics-based simulation like that, you know, super complicated as, you know, typically the industry is trying to do. We use a combination of physics and AI in order to do this. Um, okay, and what you see here is that we can actually, for example, I'm taking a log and I'm inserting fake objects in this log. Okay, that's a way that we can create safety critical situations from just situations that happen in reality. Um, the other thing that we can do is what I'm going to show you here is what does the virtual world look like? Uh, so the, here is a log that, you know, we just collected by driving around a car. And then uh, this is the virtual world. So automatically reconstructed so that we can simulate in real, this is real time. Um, so you see that, you know, we can change the viewpoint, uh, we can move around, we can change the frame rate, we can change the camera characteristics so that you use every single log that you have collected, which everybody else is in the industry needs to throw it out 
because when you change the, the, you know, the platform. And then we can also create, for example, different viewpoints as, you know, we do trucks. We don't need to collect data with trucks. We can actually just change the viewpoint, right? And this is one pass of the log, and then you have camera simulation with this level of realism, where I have removed all the dynamic objects just to show you kind of the virtual world around the static piece. Okay. Then we can create scenarios, and it's, uh, the way that we create these scenarios is uh, with four different ways. Uh, we do it programmatically um, so that, uh, you know, safety engineers can actually super efficiently create test cases for specific capabilities. We also uh, have, uh, I guess, uh, we can automatically import from logs scenarios that happen in reality, and then we can modify them so that they are reactive. Um, we can generate, you know, uh, you know, traffic situations by using deep generative models that use multi-agent simulation. And then we can have adversarial way of generating these scenarios so that it's very easy to find the mistakes without requiring to you know, create millions of simulations. Okay? This is very comprehensive set. And you saw before, uh, sorry for that, uh, that we can actually also learn in simulation. Right? So we have an evaluator that gives you metrics for all the, the different components in real time automatically, and you can use that for your reinforcement learning or other types of algorithms we are developing uh, that you will see one day soon uh, in order to do this much more efficient in terms of data. Okay, so it's a very, very comprehensive simulation uh, that really enabled us to remove the need to drive millions of miles in simulation. Okay, so just to, you know, to conclude is that, you know, the uh, cell driving is going to happen. It's just a matter of, you know, building the right technology so that we can solve it at the scale. And you know, it's something that, in particular, I will not stop until it's definitely out there uh, in the world. Um, so I hope that you're all you know, as excited as I am in terms of solving this task. Uh, we have plenty of opportunities. If you're interested in internships, full-time, et cetera, uh, yes, let me know. OK, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Raquel, for the inspiring and ambitious talk. Uh, let's uh, take some speakers from the left over here. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, this is a great talk. I'm just wondering, is Wabi World able to simulate like adverse uh, environmental conditions like rain or snow or anything? And is that something that is on the roadmap? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we can, we have some level of uh, right now of uh, being able to simulate some of these uh, environmental conditions. Uh, we are building next generation that is controllable. Uh, but since all the assets have uh, you know, material properties automatically created, et cetera, we can actually simulate some of these behaviors nicely. Uh, but we are, yes, I said, evolving into even better models for weather and sensor failures, et cetera. Yeah. And one thing to note, I think, is that you know, when people see what we want, it's like, oh, this is a cool research project. This is our production simulation. This is what bet betos every PR uh, core, uh, you know, every PR that, uh, you know, the team, the engineers actually land in production, okay? This is not just cool videos. This is actually the real thing. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, let's take the speaker on the right. Uh, so this is kind of a future-looking question, but what information, if any, do you think needs to be communicated from the autonomous vehicle to, like, the end user inside, like, about the level of autonomy or anything like that? Yeah, so that depends on the application domain. Uh, you know, for us, we are very focused on logistics, so driving trucks, class A, the big trucks. So we don't really communicate to the load anything since, uh, you know, uh, even if it's cows, uh, they're not going to understand. If you do passenger uh, robot taxis, which is something I work, you know, four years at Uber, uh, then you need to make sure that you, you communicate things so that the, um, you know, the person that is, uh, or the people that are on the, on the vehicle feel safe. Um, uh, also that uh, they can communicate with you, uh, cell driving vehicle as well, in case, you know, something goes wrong, et cetera. So there is, you know, this is not necessarily uh, on my, you know, on my expertise, but there is a whole bunch of, you know, user studies into the kind of things that, you know, make sense to do and that uh, increase the adoption of cell driving technology. Thank you. All right. Question on the left. Uh, Hi, yeah, really inspiring talk. I was curious about V2V net. It seems that if the network is continuing to change, then you would have to update the network from the entire fleet of vehicles simultaneously so that they're sh sharing sort of 
like information with each other. How, how might you handle that? Yeah, so the, the design of B2Bnet is such that if you don't receive any messages, it's the same as the standard perception prediction system. So that's important as well that you need safety even when you don't receive anything. The other thing is that you know, every vehicle is just sending information to the medium. So you can decide what to do with that information, how much information you, you receive. And every vehicle has does local updates. It's not really, uh, uh, you know, it's a synchronously, a synchronously updating so that you don't have a centralized uh, failure point, which is also very important for safety. Uh, so those were part of the design so that no matter what happens, uh, you are safe. Yeah, great question. We have someone in the dark and the uh, auditorium up there. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, I have a yes. question on the, the, so you mentioned in the talk that you have end-to-end -end trainability and interpretability at the same time. And I was wondering how that translates into the development process, i.e. like if we find a failure um, in, during development that like say perception is bad for cars under trees or the lane change trajectories are jerky, how would you go about solving this problem, would it be to retrain the whole system? And if it was retraining the whole system, does that lead to other possible regressions in other parts of the system? Yeah, great question. So um, the, I think one thing that is important in terms of the end-to-end -end trainability is that you are optimizing for the uh, system level metrics, meaning that uh, by construction, uh, you are not necessarily going to have, uh, or your likelihood of having regressions is going to be much smaller. Um, depending on the type of failure, uh, you, you know, if this is not characterized well, for example, the simulator, you might need to, you know, create, uh, you know, more scenarios, more things there. Uh, but what we do that is very different from others is that for every type of failure, we don't spin off a approach to solve that failure, but we make uh, significant changes on the stack such that uh, you can actually handle those failures in a more principled way. So I think I, um, and the reason why we can do these big uh, step changes uh, is because if you are in the complex of our stack and you don't have the luxury like for everything that you want to try to retune the entire system, right, because that's you know, it will take you, uh, you know, many, many months uh, in order to do, you know, one, one thing at a time. Uh, so you end up having very, very incremental updates so that you don't have regressions, precisely for what you're saying, so that uh, uh, you can land your change. And that's why you are really stuck in terms of progress. So for us, uh, thanks to the end-to-end -end trainability, uh, you can do much bigger changes. Of course, uh, you know, there is a very, very rigorous uh, safety testing in terms of, you know, progression and regression tests, et cetera. There's a whole BMV that I, I didn't talk about here. Yeah. Okay, let's take one final question here on the right. Yeah, th thanks, Raquel. So I have uh, two questions. So the first one is, how do you simulate the reactive behavior of other uh, traffic participants? And the second, will you release uh, this simulator? <laughs> uh, uh, great question. I'm laughing uh, about the second piece. Um, so in terms of the traffic participants, uh, we have um, something that is important is, you know, typically you will see in simulators that they use one type of traffic participant. And oftentimes is the same as the prediction or the motion planning system. That is very dangerous. For us, we have a zoo of traffic participants that you can choose just in a configuration in order to run your simulations, okay? And they are learned from data. They are validated from data. And then they are controllable in terms of, you know, how sophisticated they are, are they distracted versus not, et cetera. And that's very, very important as mm -hmm. you need to test, you know, how will you behave in all these different uh, conditions. Um, so that's with respect to the traffic participants and the, the reactivity. Uh, and maybe uh, one more thing that is important is for the structure testing, uh, the other thing that we have is automation so that even if you make changes in the software stack, the test maintains the same. And this is through uh, optimization, okay? Mm -hmm. So that, uh, and this is a very, very important, uh, you know, piece of automation in the system. In terms of releasing the simulator, um, that's a great question. Um, as uh, probably most of you know, I love to release things to the community, like we are now in the 10 year anniversary of Kitty, uh, which was a big effort we did in the past. Um, um, maybe, uh, the one thing, you know, I would like this, uh, you know, what we want to be is, a tool for regulators to test everybody into whether their systems are safe. And as part of that effort, maybe we release it to the community, but uh, 
uh, yeah, maybe a streamlined version of what we will might be release. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your interest. Okay, let's uh, thank Rahul one more time. So we do have a couple of minutes of short announcements. Uh, Matei, do you want to come up? I could also do this if you'd like. Uh, okay, I, I will go ahead and do this. Um, okay, so uh, regarding regarding the uh, the banquet, uh, so the uh, process uh, that I I described at the very beginning was actually incorrect. Matei uh, corrected me afterwards, but just to put it into words. Um, the thing that we'll have to do is register on Feedloop again, uh, but for a free lab tour ticket. And you can also do the same thing for registering for a plus one for a banquet. So basically, you go back on Feedloop, you enter your name and registration information again, uh, click the uh, banquet ticket or Columbia lab tour so that we can track who is uh, who, who's coming. Um, can we go to the let's see, next slide? Is Okay. Um, for lunch, uh, lunch is not provided, uh, but we have plenty of great options. This is New York. There's fantastic restaurants everywhere. Uh, the closest restaurants for uh, you guys are just south of campus, uh, between 106th and 116th Street. Um, Broadway and Amsterdam, uh, the two north-south streets, are your best bets. So uh, we will re uh, reconvene here at 2 p.m. and uh, hope you have great lunch.
addition dynamic manipulation of deformable objects. Please go ahead. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks, Dimitri, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Cheng. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student from right here in Columbia. And today I'll present uh, Iterative Residual Policy, a joint work with Toyota Research Institute. We are interested in the task of goal condition dynamic manipulation of deformable objects. For example, hitting a target accurately with an unknown rope, replacing a tablecloth to a precise location. To the best of our knowledge, no existing robotic systems can solve this task. Why is it so hard? Well, under dynamic actions, we can no longer ignore the object's physics during planning. Yet, the physics of deformable objects are notoriously difficult to model. And even if we have a perfect model, we all know how hard it is to tune the simulation parameters for even just one object. And to make things worse, our tasks require high precision to achieve the goal with a tolerance of a few centimeters. And to be honest, the whipping task in particular was quite hard even for me. Given an unknown rope, it's close to impossible for me to hit the goal in my first attempt. But the good thing is that after each attempt, I can get closer and closer and eventually hit the goal. So what did I learn during this process? Was I able to learn the mapping from action to a full trajectory? I don't think I can. Was I decoding some key rope parameters, like the length or density? I don't think I can either. Did I bump into the goal via some random acceleration? Unlikely, given the size of action space and the tight tolerance required. However, these are the popular methods that we use today to solve similar problems. So if that's not what we learned, then what is it? I think I have this intuition about how adjusting the action will affect the trajectory. For example, swinging harder will make the rope reach higher, and extending my arm will make the tip go further. It's hard to know how exactly the trajectory will change based on my action, but my guess for which direction to change my action is almost always correct. And therefore, my hypothesis is the knowledge about this change or adjustment is much easier to learn and generalizable to different objects. And therefore, in this work, we formalize this intuition into an algorithm called iterative residual policy. And here's how it works. At its core, the algorithm learns a delta dynamics model that takes in the observed trajectory and a delta action as input and predicts the updated trajectory with a delta action applied. Here, we parameterize the action with two target joint angles and a maximum joint speed. The trajectory is represented as an occupancy grid. By sampling different delta actions and predict the corresponding trajectory, our algorithm is able to iteratively select a better action and get closer and closer to the goal. Note that this delta dynamics model is trained entirely in simulation. And what does a simulation look like? On the left is a tip trajectory of a simulation system we set up with measured parameters. And on the right is what it's trying to match uh, on real world. And as you can see here, we have a huge sim to real gap. Our hope is that learned delta dynamics model can lead us toward the correct general direction, and the simulation don't have to be very accurate. And here is the system in action. We track the tip of the rope with a camera and use the trajectory as input. The error is defined by the shortest distance along the trajectory to the goal. And then the algorithm will sample a set of delta actions from a Gaussian distribution, and the width of this Gaussian distribution is scaled proportionally with the error. And then we, uh, we predict the trajectory for each, uh, each delta action, and the delta action associated with the smallest error is selected for next, next step execution. This process will repeat until convergence, and it usually takes in less than 10 steps for this task. All right, that's for one rope. And in the following experiments, we want to systematically test our algorithm's generalization capability against different ropes with significantly different physical parameters. And in all following experiments, we use exactly the same model trained in simulation only. And here, I want to show you how big is the difference between different real world ropes. And what you see here are the tip trajectory of different ropes executed using exactly the same robot action. And as you can see, they're very different. The second one on the left is not even a rope. It's a long piece of cloth that has much higher air resistance compared to a rope. The third one is a bull whip, which is quite stiff and has non-uniform linear density. The effect of these properties are not captured at all in our training data, 
which is captured in a collected in simulation. And therefore, it really requires a system to adjust using visual feedback to accommodate these different novel rope dynamics. And here is the resulting trajectory of the policy after policy converges on each goal. And as you can see, the policy will choose different actions to reach the same goal to accommodate different rope dynamics. The accuracy here is very close to the limit of our uh, trajectory representation resolution. And we also want to highlight our sample efficiency here, since all of these results converges in less than 10 steps in real. Next, we want to show a less common form of generalization, which is against different robot hardware embodiments. We vary the length of the robot's last link, which changes the mapping between action parameters and their effects. And again, exactly the same model training in simulation is used. And as we can expect, robot systems with different robot hardware embodiment comparing to the training setup started out with a much higher error. But regardless, it's able to adjust using visual feedback and get good performance. And here's the numbers we get in real. The left column stands for optimal action in simulation, which is a very strong baseline. We basically manually measure the parameters of each rope, manually model them in Mujoko simulation, and then brute force optimize the action for each individual rope in the simulation. And therefore, it represents an upper bound for analytical model-based controls performance in our simulator for this task. However, as you can see, it still results in more than 10 centimeters of error in real. In comparison, our method achieved no, an error that's an order of magnitude lower. Uh, and then we want to further stress test our system's uh, robustness against unexpected changes. We first let the system converge on a given rope and goal. And then I come in and tie several knots on the rope, which changes a linear, length, uh, linear density and length. And as, you can, as we can ex expect, it re immediately results in much higher error. But regardless, the system can adjust using visual feedback and quickly regain good performance. This actually happens to us multiple times uh, in, uh, during organically during our experiment, because sometimes the rope just ties knots on itself. But regardless, the system still works, and then we only see a spike in loss. Finally, we want to demonstrate the generality of IRP framework by applying it on a slightly different task, which is clause placement. The task is to place tablecloths for precise location given a target pose, where the pose is defined by nine key point locations on the cloth. Note that some of these uh, target poses are outside robot's physical reach range. Therefore, dyna dynamic actions is required to solve this problem. And here are two typical strategies learned by our algorithm. In the first case, the clause landed a bit too close compared to the goal. And in the second case, the clause folded by itself due to high density. Based on this observation, the algorithm will increase stroke to swing further in the first case and decrease speed to prevent folding in the second case. Our algorithm will continue to adjust the action, action until convergence, which usually takes three steps for this task. And OK, here's our takeaways. Even though we've only tested on two tasks, we believe the formulation of each residual policy is quite general and is applicable to many tasks with complex dynamics. As long as, number one, your state is resettable after a failed attempt, and number two, your observations are trackable. For example, in our case, the goal and the tip chief location can be tracked as key point throughout the, uh, throughout the execution. What we learned from this project is that for some cases, instead of learning the full dynamics model, which maps from action to their effect, learning changes in action to changes in their uh, trajectory is much easier to learn and generalizable to different objects. Because the direction of this change is invariant against many physical parameters that we have tested. We also want to say that IRP is a new way to distill relevant knowledges from existing simulators, uh, especially when they're inaccurate. If we think about uh, our existing simulators, a lot of them started out with gaming application in mind, and therefore they trade accuracy for speed. But still, uh, our human can transfer our, our, our real world skill to these games just fine, which means that the simulator must be done, doing something right. And our goal should be, we should figure out the right way to use these simulators to unleash their full potential in robotics. Thank you. Uh, that's it for my talk. And you can check out our code uh, and data in this URL. And I'm happy to take questions. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Cheng. Uh, let's open it up for questions. 
Do we have any questions from in the hall? <clears throat> Oh. Yeah, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, very cool work. Thanks a lot for the presentation. I'm wondering in the uh, in the rope task, have you tried to use uh, multiple key points on the rope instead of just one key point at the end of the rope? And if so, does that improve the performance? Uh, so in our case, we don't think that's necessary, so I haven't tried. Uh, but if your goal is to hit, for example, multiple points in particular as a goal, I think that's definitely something that will be necessary. Yeah, I'm asking this because I think, you know, maybe having multiple key points on the rope will help the model to better understand mm. how the change of action will affect its trajectory. Um, okay. Yeah, but anyway. I thanks. think that's possible, but uh, in our case, basically, we're abstracting away the complex dynamics throughout the entire rope, and we're only summarizing them as a trajectory of the endpoint, and which also contains a lot of information on its own. Uh, at least for our task, we believe that's quite necessary. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so you guys tested on both like 1D and 2D deformable objects. Uh, do you guys have any future plans on like perhaps um, like a 3D deformable objects? Um, I think it will be challenging because one, of uh, one limitation in our case is that uh, the key states need to be observable. I think it's possible given a complex shape, we only track, if you only care about things on the, uh, on the surface, but if you, some complex uh, deformation is ha happening inside the 3D object, then it will be kind of challenging to apply this method directly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really good work, thanks. Uh, so as far as the motivation goes, uh, um, I mean, if you think at how humans do it, we also don't track accurately the tip of the rope. Uh, so do you think this work uh, can be modified to have, to use just a binary feedback, success, failure, uh, and modify the actions from that? Yeah, I have to think about this. I think given a tr like only binary feedback is possible, but given a scalar feedback, I think it's a potentially possible. Like let's, let me know that like direction, well, like the distance to the goal. And uh, we can potentially infer like kind of like a Jacobian to which we're, where to adjust. Uh, I had a question about the delta dynamics. So it seems like there's a forward dynamics where a change in action maps to a change in trajectory. But when you're updating in your iterations, you would need the inverse. Sorry, can you repeat your last sentence? But when you go from iteration to iteration, you need some sort of an inverse, right? Where there's a desired change in trajectory. How do you uh, compute a desired delta action? Uh, no. So as actually, we t the model takes in delta action as input. So what we did is that the model given the current observer trajectory from the last iteration, and then I apply a delta action on it, and it, it, and it outputs what it's gonna be like after delta action has been applied. So what it is, is kinda like a random optimization. So uh, we basically sample a bunch of Gaussian, uh, delta actions from a Gaussian distribution, and then we feed all of them through the network and p find which trajectory is closest to the goal. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, yeah, very great work. Uh, so I noticed that uh, all your actions is kind of open loop. Uh, do you have any intuition like how this idea can be applied to like closed loop actions where ne you need to like adjust the action at every time state? Uh, first, we believe our method is closed loop, okay. although it's, it's closed loop between trajectories. Yeah, uh, yeah. However, if you want to do like, to me, because imagine like even if you send like a wave through the, through the rope, it still takes some time for it to propagate to the, to the tip. Given the speed of, of our action, I think it's quite difficult to uh, affect the tip uh, well, like, precisely. Uh, during, during the execution. Because the wave like, propagation might not even reach a tip yet in that case. I say thanks. Great question, thank you. Okay, I had a quick question just to wrap it up. Um, have you explored different kinds of action representations that um, might be <clears throat> more descriptive of the tasks you wanna do or are these actions represented at a very low level, you know, like joint torque commands, things like that. Yeah, so uh, in theory, the framework of each retreat zero policy should be uh, in agnostic to these uh, specific uh, details about uh, action presentation. But uh, so we, we settled on this case, actually in the beginning, we tried like trajectory optimization style representation where like we like basically repeated the action as a variable throughout time. But we realized that that's like too much degree of freedom. And then we, we, like, we were inspired by a work from uh, Northeastern University uh, uh, and where they basically study biological uh, stuff on how they manipulate. And they use a minimum jerk uh, uh, action primitive 
uh, which they found is the hu what the human uses for this task. And we basically slightly modify it to use like trapezoidal speed profile, which is easy easiest to map to a, a robot action space. Uh, but I do think mm, in, if we want to scale up to much higher dimensionality for action primitives, some like the, I probably we probably need to replace the random uh, optimization part with some kind of like for example. Uh, Laundromat dynamics or something like that to, to uh, do a gradient descent to solve the dimensionality problem. Great. Okay. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So next up, we have uh, Benjamin Eisner presenting Flowbot 3D, learning 3D articulation flow to manipulate articulated objects. Okay, great. Hey everybody, my name is Ben, uh, and I'm presenting some work on manipulating articulated objects conducted by me, Harry Jang, and David Held at Carnegie Mellon. Articulated objects are everywhere. We interact with them all the time. We open doors, drawers, laptops, staplers, refrigerators, all these things without even thinking about it. We can estimate how objects can move just by looking at them as well. Uh, even though you may not have seen these specific objects before, you've likely seen similar objects, uh, and therefore you can imagine how they might move and how you might use them. And in fact, you definitely can. Uh, we want robots to have the same estimation ability. So how might we construct a robot learning system to uh, successfully manipulate articulated objects uh, just from raw visual uh, observations? Well, one common paradigm uh, in robot learning is to learn a big end-to-end -end neural network model, uh, which maps directly from raw observations to low-level robot actions. This style of approach can be quite powerful because it can directly optimize for uh, the manipulation task at hand. However, uh, it's often quite hard for these end-to-end -end models to generalize well outside of their training domain. Now, at the, end of the other end of the spectrum, you can design a modular, visual, scene-understanding pipeline which is tailored to the task of articulating objects. This might consist of, say, a segmentation model which segments discrete objects in the scene and then further segments, segments out each part of each object. Then you might want to uh, determine which of those parts are connected to each other and build some kind of kinematic tree connecting all the parts that you found in each object. And then for each of the articulations you find, you might want to estimate the exact screw parameters which govern the articulation. And then once you've parsed this whole representation, you can pass this to a motion planner, which can grab the part you want to move and use the estimated structure of the object uh, to devise a good path to articulate the part. So when this is designed correctly, uh, such modular approaches can generalize quite well, um, better than end-to-end -end approaches, particularly when it's difficult to collect many real-world trials. Now, there are points of failure in the system. There are many of them. Each of these estimated sub estimation submodules is kind of an open area of research in itself, and an error in any one module can derail the execution of the system. So this can be quite brittle. We like an approach that gets the best of both worlds, allowing us to impose some domain knowledge into the system while having fewer points of failure. So one way we could do this is with estimating visual affordances and motion planning directly on top of these affordances. This style has fewer points of failure and optimizes an objective closer to the end task while providing better generalization properties than a full end-to-end -end method. However, this means we have to choose the right kind of affordance to estimate for the system to work. So, okay, let's think about this from a physics first principles perspective. The two most common types of articulations are sliding prismatic joints and hinged revolute joints. Okay, we'll look at prismatic joints first. Let's say each drawer in a chest, each one of these drawers is a prismatic joint. Each of these drawers has one degree of freedom along the, 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 the axis V in the diagram. And the most efficient policy uh, to actuate this articulation is to apply force directly to the surface of the object parallel to the axis V. Now for revolute joints, such as the doors on this cabinet, the most efficient direction to apply force is perpendicular to both the axis of rotation and the radius connecting the contact point to the axis of rotation. Now you get the most leverage by choosing a contact point that is far away from the axis of rotation, so that means you need to apply less force to generate the same torque. So to articulate both prismatic and revolute objects, we'd like an affordance that tells us which direction we should apply at every point, 
which we apply force at every point, and at which points in the object give us the most leverage to articulate that part. With these goals in mind, we present our chosen representation for affordances, which is 3D articulation flow. We assign a 3D vector to every point on the object. The direction of this vector describes how that point can move under instantaneous articulation, and therefore, which direction of optimal force is at that point. The magnitude of the vector describes the relative leverage at that point. So, uh, all that you need to do um, is to look at this diagram here. Uh, you see these th red vectors, which are the 3D articulation flow. Uh, the longer vectors occur further from the door hinge, and they all point in the direction that the door will move as it swings out. So given this representation, all the robot needs to do is uh, grasp a high leverage point on the object and articulate the object in the direction that that flow points. Okay, so how do we go about predicting 3D articulation flow? Well, we take a point call observation, we run it through a standard point net plus plus backbone and output our estimate of 3D articulation flow. Specifically for each point in the input, we predict a flow vector delta x, y, and z uh, which indicates the amount that that point would move if a small articulation were to be applied at the opening direction. Now we can compare this predicted articulation flow directly to some ground truth articulation flow, which is computed from the known kinematic structure of the training objects that we have in our data set. And we can supervise this articulation flow with the mean squared error loss between the predictions and the ground truth. Now we'll describe how we can use this 3D articulation flow in a real robot system, which we call Flowbot 3D. First, we use a depth camera or LiDAR to get a partial point cloud observation of the object, and then we use our 3D articulation flow estimation module to densely predict the 3D articulation flow at every point in the input. Then we execute a two-phase policy. First, we select a contact point on the object, which amounts to choosing the point with the highest leverage subject to the constraint that the point is graspable. So for a suction gripper, we only choose points with low estimated surface curvature. And this is a simple heuristic that works pretty well. We can then use a motion planner to send the robot uh, to that grasp location and execute the grasp. Once the, uh, the robot has been grasped, sorry, once the robot has grasped the object, uh, we can directly take the 3D articulation flow we just predicted at that contact point and set that as the desired direction to move the gripper. Then we can use motion planning to move the gripper the direction a small amount, and finally, we can close the loop by taking another point cloud, getting the articulation flow, executing a small motion, and repeating. We repeat until the object has been fully articulated. So the only learned part of this system is that articulation flow estimation module. To train this, we select objects from the PartNet Mobility dataset and train a single model across uh, examples from 11 different training categories. We use a simulator to get the ground truth articulation from, from these flow from these categories. We can then test on 10 unseen categories of objects, as well as a real-world collection of articulated objects that we've found in the real world. Uh, for our real-world physical setup, we can use a robot arm with a suction gripper and the object in a workplace, oops, excuse me, uh, our, our object in the workplace with a fixed depth camera pointed at the scene. Now we'll talk a little bit about how the system performs on both real and simulated tasks. You can see some example success cases here. Let's take a look at some quantitative results, where we're seeing how often a policy will open an object. First, we compare against an end-to-end -end method, which directly outputs low-level robot actions. We see that even for the training objects, when viewed in an unseen poses, the end-to-end -end method performs very poorly on this task. The y-axis here is the success rate, meaning how often the policy successfully opened the object more than 90% through its range of motion. Next, we compare directly against regressing, uh, regressing articulation parameters, as well as a sampling-based direction scoring module sim uh, similar to the network proposed in UMPNet. Our method significantly outperforms these pr prior approaches, succeeding three quarters of the time. This relative success holds for un entirely unseen test categories of objects in simulation and even on real-world objects. So in essence, our system generalizes to both unseen uh, objects and to real-world objects. To give you a sense of what predicted articulation flow looks like, here are some examples. In both cases, the network learns to predict very consistent flow, and it predicts flow only on the parts of the object which can move. On the test object, when the points are moving, uh, on the moving part become a little occluded, uh, the prediction quality degrades a little bit, but the majority of frames and views give a reasonably accurate estimate. So, why does this system transfer well, transfer well to the real world with a minimal drop in performance? We, 
we think that this is because of two reasons. First, the input data is a point cloud, which looks relatively similar between simulation and the real world. And second, we're, we're really learning a dense object-centric representation, uh, which is a function of the kinematic properties of the object instead of learning dynamics or any, or any other kind of property which is difficult and notoriously difficult to transfer from uh, sim to real. All right, let's take a look at some real-world results. We compare our method with an end-to-end -end policy in the real world. As we can see, uh, Flowbot3D is able to repeatedly choose a good direction in which to open each object, while the end-to-end -end method is not consistently able to do so. Now, these jars aren't technically articulated, but we treat jar lids as if they were prismatic joints. This follows the convention from the Sapien dataset. Now, when the objects are very heavy or fixed to the table, Flowbot3D still succeeds with a small amount of compliance in the gripper and controller, making their policy robust to small prediction errors. And here's my favorite example, which is lifting a toilet seat. All right, to recap, Flowbot3D estimates 3D articulation flow and uses motion planning to articulate novel objects. It significantly outperforms end-to-end -end policies while, av while avoiding uh, the brittleness of modular approaches. And best of all, we generalize to unseen objects and transfer to the real world without retraining. Thanks, and I'll take questions now. Thank you. All right, yeah. questions? Okay, I'll go first. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. I really like this work. A couple questions. So one, you motivate it in the context of par objects with multiple parts. But it looked like this method only applies to objects with one degree of freedom. Is that correct? Um, and if so, how would you extend it? And then two, I guess maybe pertinent to the sim to real, it looked like the objects were segmented from clutter and everything else around them. Is that the case or am I misunderstanding? Yeah, so for the, for the first question, it's about multiple articulations. So um, the nice thing about the dense representation is that uh, if the object has multiple single degree of freedom articulations, uh, like a set of, of shelves, all of them will get the same flow, or not this exact same flow, but they'll all be treated independently because it's a dense prediction. However, if the, uh, the links are kind of connected in a kinematic chain, um, we didn't really test on those kinds of examples. Um, you can imagine the flow still does work, like there is a, uh, an instantaneous displacement that does happen, uh, but it might be a little more difficult to generalize and predict without um, a more robust arm a representation of that chain itself. Um, and the other one was, sorry, was the second part of the question? I think it was, so in, pertinent to the sim to real, it looked like the object was, you know, the point clouds are nice for transferring from sim to real, but the, you know, the objects looked like they were clearly segmented from any clutter or background. Yeah, so in that case, that we, we did segment it from the, the background. Um, really, in the real world, it was just plain subtraction. We didn't really worry about uh, training robust to, you know, a bunch of visual noise. Cool, thanks a lot, I like the work, thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I had a very similar question. So you also subtracted the robot in the real world from the point cloud? Yeah. So just by using, you know, you know the, you have a URDF plus mesh of the robot and you can just subtract that directly from the input. Okay. Uh, so it looks like sometimes the, uh, the prediction of direction for execution is not perfectly accurate, but it looks like the compliance of the robot tip is playing some role to make sure it's not uh, like, not make, doing crazy stops. Uh, do you think uh, variable impedance control can play a role uh, in the future work of this, uh, this direction? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's kind of how we might be able individually as humans to respond to these doors. Like, you know, a door is, you think a door is moving in a certain way, you feel it pulling against you, you could use, you know, some sort of impedance control on a robot to have the same kind of behavior. But um, implicitly, like, if you just pull slightly off the axis, when you're opening the door, it'll project, like the, the, the constraints of the object project your force into the direction that it's gonna move. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I have a question regarding the real world experiment. It seems like uh, when you are like uh, manipulating those real world uh, re objects with revolution joints, sometimes the object itself moves. Is it because of the predicted flow is not accurate enough or some other reason? So the accuracy of the flow is pretty high. I would say it's more on the control that we implemented to do this motion planning in the system. Um, so there's, you know, little errors in, in uh, moving the objects, you know, say you move it 10 centimeters, like uh, it, the, the object itself is actually gonna flow through um, a, a small arc, but 
we're doing this kind of linear, small linear approximation of the arc. Um, if we really crank down the, the fine grain control of the simulation, uh, sorry, the simulation, of the, um, the actions that you apply in the real world, uh, I think it would, it would have result in less motion. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Great paper. Thank you so much for presenting. Uh, how does this model handle ambiguity? Like you can have a half open door that can both open or close. So it's kind of predicting um, uh, almost like a, a basis for the motion of that point. Um, so you could have kind of a separate component which you add on top of this representation which tells you um, whether you want to open in the positive or negative direction. Um, by convention, uh, all of the, the vectors get predicted in the opening direction. It turns out that the data set is very consistent in, in this labeling. So you can just kind of reverse the flow to give a closing sort of direction. Thank you. And last question. Thanks. Uh, great, great presentation. Um, does it uh, uh, do the articulation with a combination of uh, motions, for example, prismatic followed by revolute and so on? Sorry, I couldn't hear the first part of the question. Uh, does it, does it uh, predict the articulation with a combination of motions? Oh, I see. So you're saying uh, like you have a series of kinematic elements. Yes. Um, so in this work, we don't really investigate that. We're kind of doing like a fixed body that has a single degree of freedom afterwards. Got it. Um, but I kind of addressed this a little bit earlier. There's no reason that you can't estimate the uh, instantaneous velocity of a multi-chain link. It's just going to be a substantially harder task to do. Thank you. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, next up we have Dhruv Shah presenting Viking vision-based kilometer scale navigation with geographic hints. Just give me one more second. Okay. Uh, I think my speaker notes are not. Okay, slight change of plans. Uh, if you're willing, uh, we'd like to swap the order of the next two. Okay, so let me introduce the speaker once I get your thing up here.
A slight change of plans. <clears throat> right now, we're going to have uh, Zhenjia Zhu present Dexterity, Deformable Manipulation Can Be a Breeze. OK, thanks for the introduction. OK, hi, hi I'm Zhenjia. I'm from Columbia University. Today, I will introduce Dexterity a new way of robot manipulation using airflow. When we talk about robot manipulation, it's often all about contact, such as how to model or generate right contact in order to interact with this object. However, many common objects in our daily life are either inconvenient or even, or even impossible to ma manipulate with contact. For example, it's inconvenient to pick up leaves one by one, and it's impossible to inflate glass with our hands. But they can be effectively manipulated using air. So in this work, we want to enable robotic dexterity with air. So we call it dexterity with an air inside the name. We study it in the context of deformable object manipulation, such as unfolding a crumpled cloth, or opening a deformable bag. Both of them are very challenging for contact-based manipulation, but they can be nicely solved with dexterity. So why do we want to use air for manipulation? Here are a few advantages. First, air enables the robot to apply a dense force field. For example, we can extinguish all these candles with, with only one blow. In contrast, contact-based manipulation can only apply force through sparse contacts, which is often not efficient for underacted objects like claws. Second, air-based manipulation allows the system to, re to reach objects beyond its kinematic reach range, such as leaf blowing in distance. And finally, since air is much safer to move at high speed, it can operate safely around people. To enable these advantages, here is our system design of dexterity. It consists of three UR5 arms. Two are with parallel jar grippers, and one with an air pump. Since we do not require high speed movement, these robots could also be replaced with other slower and cheaper types. Visual observations are captured from a top-down camera. Here we can see none of these robots could cover the entire workspace or even the surface of a fully unfolded cloth. Therefore, long-range interactions by airflow is a natural fit for this challenging task. We take a learning-based approach to this problem. First, the system infers where to grasp on the cloth. Two, ro two robot arms then lift and uh, stretch it in the middle of the workspace. And then the third arm executes the blowing action. Now let's take a close look at this policy. The network infers a score for each action candidate, indicating the close coverage prediction. The action with the maximum score will be selected for execution. The observation is then input to the policy to infer the next action. With this closed-loop policy, the action could be adjusted in time according to visual feedback. The policy is trained with NVIDIA Flex Simulator, where the airflow is simulated as a stream of invisible particles. Here, we compare with two popular methods for close unfolding. Quality static action, like pick and place, is not efficient and it requires many interactions to achieve the goal. Dynamic actions, like fling, is able to efficiently unfold the cloth when it is relatively small, such as this shirt. Then, how about our dexterity? Here, we, we can see dexterity is able to unfold this shirt with only two interactions. And there is no need for high-speed robot movements. Here's a larger cloth which can no longer be handled by Flingbot. 
even with the maximum filling speed, the cloth can only be unfolded in half. Therefore, better robots with higher speed are required, which is very expensive and dangerous around people. Will dexterity face the same issue? The answer is no. With the help of active airflow, dexterity has no trouble of unfolding this super large cloth. Here are more results in real world. We found our approach shows strong gen generalization ability. While the policy was only trained with rectangular cloths in simulation, it can generalize well to different shaped garments, such as shirts and dresses, from different crumpled states in real world. Dexterity can also be applied to other tasks, such as bag opening. Here, the goal is to open a deformable bag and maintain its open state so that we can put other objects into the bag. Without airflow, the bag opening is often too small, making it really hard to put objects into the bag. But when the bag is opened by air, the Placing task is much simpler. Here we can see we can even use inaccurate tossing actions to put objects into it. Here is our system set up for the bag opening task. We assume the bag has already been grasped by two robot arms. And the third arm with an air pump executes the blowing action. The policy infers a score for each, for each angle, selects the best one for execution, and adjusts continuously according to visual feedback. Since, since Flex is not able to simulate accurate air dynamics, such as Bernoulli effect, which is very important to this task, so our policy is trained on real-world data and the supervision is whether the bag is open or not, which can be automatically labeled from a side view image. We found this task is very challenging for contact-based manipulation. If we only have two contact points, there is not much we can do. Even with dynamic actions, like shaking, we cannot open the bag. However, from this video, we can see using air makes this task much easier. Here, we also compare with a heuristic-based policy to show the close-up adjustment is necessary. Here is another example with a large plastic bag. In this case, dexterity opens the bag with only one trial. In our experiment, we found the policy trained using only one bag is able to generalize, is able to generalize well to different bags and random grasp poses. We also observed that our policy learned some interesting strategies. For example, it aims to, it tends to aim slightly above the bag opening to leverage the Bernoulli effect. To summarize, in this work, we show that air can be used to simplify the many complex manipulation tasks, since it allows the robot to apply a dense force field, expand its reach range, and provide safe, high-speed interactions. With this work, we hope to inspire more innovative ways to incorporate air in robot manipulation. More videos of our system can be found on this webpage. There, you can also find the code for both simulation and the real-world experiment. Finally, we will have a live demo in our lab on this Thursday. Yeah. Please come and check it out. Thank you. All right, questions? Sorry. Uh, Fascinating work. So okay. I just have a
quick question uh, regarding the generalizability uh, of the system to uh, air blower with different nozzles. Uh, for example, uh, for a leaf blower, you can change the nozzle to change the, uh, the size of the airflow. So have you guys tested that uh, aspect of the system? Thank you. Uh, yes, in our simulation, we changed the nozzles. Since the air, air pump we bought in Amazon has two extra nozzles, and uh, we, uh, in our experiment, we use the medium one, but we also try the large one. So as long as the airflow is like is strong enough, it can generalize to different nozzles. Yeah. So it cannot be too small. Hi. So uh, manipulation via airflow seems like a really exciting concept, and I found this talk pretty interesting. And I want to ask a question about this concept. So you talked about how uh, with airflow you can uh, apply a force very broadly over a space. Yeah. Now, a lot of environments have small objects, light objects like cards and stuff like that. And I come from an aerial robotics community where that can be bad for us because they get moved around and sucked into robots. And that happened uh, during like, the subterranean challenge competition recently. So I want to ask, how do you deal with things like that? And have you started thinking about like, challenges of, and limitations of manipulation via airflow? So your question is how to handle the small object, right? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes, uh, that's one of our pot potential limitation. Since, um, air, uh, since the advantage of airflow is to apply a dense force field, but it can also be disadvantage since we cannot have a very precise control of the airflow. But back to the previous question, if we change to a very small nozzle, I think we can still like to, to manipulate some very small objects. But the two tasks I show here, like the cross unfolding and the back opening, so it's not, so, uh, it's not a small object manipulation. Thanks a bunch. Thank All you. right. Unfortunately, we do have to end the questions a bit early because we have to stay on schedule. So let's thank the speaker again. Oh, thank you. All right, so we're back with our last speaker, Dhruv Shah, presenting Viking vision-based kilometer scale navigation with geographic hints. Okay, um, sorry about the goof up earlier. Um, hello everyone, excited to be here in person. I'm Dhruv and I'll be presenting this paper on vision-based kilometer scale navigation with geographic hints. This is joint work with Sergey Levin at UC Berkeley. Let's say you have a small mobile robot tasked with doing last mile deliveries in a neighborhood like the Columbia campus. Given some high level information about the goal, such as this picture of Meunier's sculpture right outside the engineering building and its address, uh, the robot must navigate a challenging environment in search of the goal. Without prior access to the environment, the robot must make informed decisions to maximally explore it with the goal information. Current learning based methods for goal reaching in novel environments fall under one of two camps. The first camp relies largely on training from simulated data, uh, often on the order of a billion frames. Such methods have shown great promise in solving long horizon navigation problems by utilizing multimodal information, such as floor plans, uh, but they often require access to a simulation replica of the deployment environment, which can be prohibitively expensive, if not impossible for complex open world environments. The second camp alleviates some of these challenges by learning directly from data collected in the real world. These systems can learn directly from small amounts of offline data and generalize to visually similar environments. However, these methods have not been shown to use multimodal information to guide the exploration in novel environments, and hence tend to be impractical to deploy in large-scale settings. To extend the capabilities of these systems uh, to more, let's say, city-scale environments, let's take a page from the book of the best embodied navigation agents we know of. Um, when humans navigate new environments, such as when hiking outdoors, we make use of both geographic knowledge obtained from trail maps and learned patterns from their past experience. However, in contrast to geometric approaches of using a map like SLAM, humans don't require the maps to be accurate or metric. 
a person can navigate a hiking trail or a college campus just fine using a roadmap on their phones that roughly indicates the streets and houses. In fact, that's exactly how a lot of you got to the conference today. Uh, the RSS organizers shared directions in the form of a Google Maps view. This is actually yesterday. Um, and safe to say that people are pretty good at using such maps to find their way around new environments. Can you get a robot to do the same? In this work, we study how vision-based navigation systems can utilize geographic site information to guide their exploration in new environments. Our goal is to devise learning-enabled methods that make use of this information as hints, much like you and I would when dropped in a new environment. This information may be outdated or invalid, for instance, with parked cars or trucks that don't show up on overhead maps. And a good system must be able to deal with such situations. Before we begin, let's uh, look at the search problem we're discussing here. Notably, when I say search, I don't refer to a purely computational graph search problem. Each step in our search problem involves a robot driving to a sub-goal and updating the graph. The common set of graph search algorithms often make some limiting assumptions. Uh, first, it's common to visit an arbitrary fringe node from the current node. Um, and second, these algorithms assume a set of pre-specified neighbors in the graph and their corresponding edge weights before you actually visit them. In contrast, uh, as cool as it would be, robots cannot teleport, and visiting a node often incurs a driving cost that needs to be accounted for. Um, and second, the real world doesn't specify feasible neighbors. The robot needs to identify and calculate what neighbors are good for it uh, before it actually visits them. To solve this, we make two key changes to the search problem. Um, first, we use a latent variable model to represent a distribution of subgoals that is reachable from the robot's current location. This allows us to sample feasible neighbors and also predict the estimated cost to reach them. We use this estimated cost, along with a novel goal-directed heuristic, for planning downstream. This encourages the robot to explore both locally as well as globally towards the goal. A local image-based controller, trained on prior data from other environments, uh, uh, reasons about navigation affordances directly from images. It also provides proposals to the planner about which nearby landmarks are likely to be reachable by a sampling process. Meanwhile, an ASTAR-like high-level planner selects candidate waypoints in order to reach a faraway goal. This incorporates the geographic site information as a planning heuristic. This site information is processed using a learned neural network trained with a contrastive objective. And the computer graph is executed physically on a robot in a novel environment. Oops. The leading goal model is an important part of our method. Our context condition model is trained to predict short-range temporal distances to the goal, as well as the best first action towards it using a variational information bottleneck, which takes the form of a compression objective. This objective is robust to task relevant features in the observations and can learn a robust prior over reachable goals. Notably, during deployment, this allows us to sample a latent subgoal from the learned prior and decode it into corresponding feasible subgoals or neighbors that the robot can navigate to from the current location. Now that we've talked about how we generate candidate neighbors, we need a, way, we need a mechanism to bias this, uh, the search problem towards the goal. The simplest thing to do here would be to use GPS to encourage picking the subgoal that is closest to the goal in an L2 sense. Um, in, this game, uh, in this case, the scheme would pick the, one, uh, pick the sub goal that's on the right. But what if we do have some more context about the environment? Given an overhead satellite image as context, it seems that the right dot, despite being closer in an L2 sense, might involve the robot trying to jump fences, um, and the left dot would instead be closer to the, uh, to the goal in a semantic sense. How do we capture the semantic notion of distance as a planning heuristic? To obtain such a heuristic, we train a data-driven estimator for the probability P that a given waypoint W lies on a valid path to the goal G. Using the same training data as the other models, we learn P with a contrastive objective, which can be seen as a binary classification problem uh, between a set of positives and negatives. Intuitively, uh, given a trajectory in cyan, we sample points along the trajectory and label them as positives, uh, and we sample a bunch of other points not on the trajectory as negatives, and train a neural network to learn a desired estimator that contrasts these two sets. We can use a weighted complement of this estimator to serve as a planning heuristic in our algorithm, which gives us a cost Okay, which gives us uh, a cost for the candidate subgoal that captures semantic notions of traversability. Putting it all together, the complete algorithm looks remarkably similar to A star, and I won't step into the details here, uh, with a notable exception of the robot physically driving to the computed waypoint. 
the sampling process, which is used to discover neighboring subgoals, and the contrast probability estimate, which is used as a goal-directed heuristic when computing costs at each time step. Uh, it's important to note that these overhead hints are only used as a planning heuristic, while the local control is still purely vision-based. So even when the hints are off, the robot can continue staying safe and explore the environment using its egocentric observations. All learned models discussed here are trained on an offline data set of trajectories that looks something like this, collected in a diverse variety of environments, including city sidewalks, hiking trails, parks, and so on. Notably, Viking never sees trajectories longer than 80 meters, but can leverage the learned heuristic to reach goals over a kilometer away. When deployed, when deployed in a new environment, like this example, um, we have a goal specified by an image at the top right and on the GPS at the bottom right. Using the satellite image as hints, the robot uses its egocentric observations uh, and navigates through complex environments, including following roads, cutting across grass, often going through trees when the satellite hints are actually not valid anymore under the canopy, um, and eventually reaching the goal. In one instance, the robot drives into a cul-de-sac uh, and uses its craft to backtrack around and then find the goal. This trajectory is about one and a half kilometers with me running behind the robot. Uh, it looks janky because it's about 20 minutes long and I'm sp sped it up for the talk. Um, in this experiment, using a schematic roadmap instead of a satellite image, as you can see on the bottom right, we see similar behavior where the robot is able to use the learned heuristic to drive towards the goal. Um, interestingly, we see that using a schematic, uh, schematic roadmap instead of a satellite image uh, encourages the robot to navigate on marked roads instead of cutting across grassy fields like we saw in the last experiment. In fact, this emergence prefer emergent preference of following roads is consistently observed across multiple environments. Uh, this is another example with the same starting goal location where only the hints differ. Um, and Viking can extract better co correlations from feature-rich satellite images while the roadmap induces um, just following paved roads. I have a lot more videos of our experiments, ablations, and quantitative analysis uh, on the project page that I'd like to show, but in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap my talk here. Um, our key insight is that effectively leveraging a small amount of geographic knowledge in the form of hints can provide strong regularities that enable robots to navigate to distant goals. We find that incorporating these hints as goal-directed heuristics for planning enables emergent preferences such as following roads or staying on trails in parks, which are induced by the nature of these hints. Additionally, Viking only uses them for biasing the high-level search, in contrast to geometric methods that use these hints more religiously. Uh, the algorithm is robust to imperfect hints in the map. And lastly, while we've only demonstrated the system for satellite images and schematic roadmaps, the contrastive objective uh, and the framework we describe is fairly general and can be adapted to support more interesting modalities, such as hand-drawn paper maps or even textual instructions, which would be a lot more user-friendly. Um, in fact, this is something we've been exploring in our recent research on enabling embodied instruction following agents. Um, our system can parse freeform textual instructions into a series of landmarks and ground them in the robot's observations using pre-trained models like GPT and CLIP. Uh, this allows the robot to accept fine-grained instructions from the user and execute them on a physical robot uh, without requiring any online fine-tuning, paired language annotations, or simulation-based training. Uh, thanks for your time. I'll just leave some videos playing in the background while we take questions. Okay, <clears throat> we have time for one short question. Really? Uh, <clears throat> okay, well, I guess I, I can ask my question. So, <clears throat> uh, when you uh, try to compare to a baseline for this kind of work, um, I know you can't directly compare to A star planning, you know, without images. How do you actually formulate a reasonable baseline to compare to? Um, so I think one very nice way to set up some baselines is to try ablating the different components that we discussed. So uh, you can try ablating just the physical search part of it, which is something we do in the paper, and you can have A star, but then the other parts are your learned parts. Uh, something else you can do is remove the hints and look at the rest of the things just to see how important different parts of the system are. Um, and that is something we've, uh, we have extensively in the paper, and I can share more in the poster uh, as well. Okay, great, thank you. Great. Let's thank our speaker again. <clears throat>
and get the AV stuff working. Um, so it's an enormous pleasure for me to have the opportunity to introduce um, Henny Edmoni, who um, is has been selected to give our next talk, which is the first invited early career spotlight for RSS 2022. Um, Henny has a joint BS MA degree from Wesleyan University. She then decided to stay in Connecticut and uh, take her PhD and master's degrees uh, from Yale University, and then she, she became a, a postdoc at CMU. And in the present tense, she's currently the A. Nico Haberman Assistant Professor at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. At CMU, she directs the Human and Robot Partners Lab, and her, her work blends aspects of robotics, computer science, and cognitive psychology to build algorithms that are both mathematically rigorous and grounded in human behavior research. Her results, some of which I'm sure she's going to touch on today, uh, consider ro robot systems that can provide assistance in complex tasks in human environments. They have a focus on modeling and identifying implicit signals um, that are expressed in human behavior form. And one example of this, which you'll talk about, I think, um, is gaze. But by no means is that the limit of her research. She's also looked at instances where they study na natural language instructions. You've perhaps seen her talk about her work at other venues, such as uh, IEEE ICRA or IROS or HRI, a conference that she's been very uh, involved in in terms of the service. The, she's been very devoted to service as part of that community. She's also published as, with the ACM at CHI and ACM SIG Access and a range of, I guess, what, what to me is a slight outsider look like human factors um, venues, I think. Um, we first met at a wine bar after RSS uh, 2017, I guess, which is you know, where the important part of the conference happens afterwards. And the conferences were fading in my mind, but I remember um, everyone else in the room seemed to know Henny, and I was the last to find out. So um, that was a real pleasure. She then went on to be um, a co-chair of uh, RSS, uh, RSS Pioneers the following year. Um, and she gave an inspirational talk as part of the RSS Good Citizens and in Robotics Research panel um, a, a year later, I think, after that. She's quite well known, I think, for her, adv uh, her advocacy for accessibility and disability awareness. And um, she was a co-organizer of a, of a workshop at that at CMU. So when, at, when she was at Yale, she co-authored a very influential survey paper called Robots for Use in Autism Research. And, and that's sort of, I, I guess, a, a highly impactful paper at the beginning of your career. And I'm going to make a guess for a, a, a paper which you published just this year, which I think will turn out to be a highly impactful paper. And it's titled Harmonic, Human and Robot Multimodal Observations of Natural Interactive Collaboration. And this is an example of a data set paper. And um, if you were particularly astute or were paying really close attention, you will have caught the fact that her lab is called the Human and Robot Partners Lab, which has the acronym HARP. So we have HARP and Harmony. So there's a bit of a theme going on there. Um, she's been sponsored by, her, her research has been sponsored by um, ONR, Paralyzed Veterans of America Foundation, Sony Corporation, and the US National Science Foundation. Um, she's specifically the recipient of an NSF Career Award for a project entitled Towards Proactive Assistive Robotics. Um, and her talk today is entitled Five Traps for Human Robots in Human Environments and How to Avoid Them. Please join me in welcoming our next speaker. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I, I wish I had Dylan to introduce me every day. Um, thank you for that lovely and the best dressed introduction I've ever gotten. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'm very excited to talk to you about why we should uh, think about humans and human environments when we develop robots. So I come from the field of human-robot interaction, and we have a pretty good view in this field that's kind of between robotics and um, more human factors areas of what it means to put a robot into a human environment. And we have this dream, I think, communally, that robots will be seamlessly integrated into our environments, they'll be able to live in our homes, they'll be able to serve us uh, food or clean up after us, maybe we don't want them to teach our elderly father how to um, uh, you know, perform bank heists, but uh, in general we want them to be integrated into our environment. But we don't have this yet. Um, instead, what we have is a lot of robots that go out into human environments and really piss people off. So uh, you can see all of these are real headlines about how robots um, run over toddlers or get vandalized or are fired for utter incompetence. Um, and this is not 
obviously what we want out of robotics. So the big question that we have to ask ourselves is why? What is happening here that is causing um, all of our amazing work not to be translatable when we put robots out into the world? So in this talk, I'm gonna go through five big traps or five assumptions that we as roboticists often make about the human environments that we're putting robots into. I'm gonna explain from my own research and my lab's research why those assumptions fail. And then I'll give you a take home message for what you can do to address that assumption. So let's start with trap number one. Um, Assuming humans are oracles for training data. So there's been a lot of robot learning work at this conference. Unsurprising, robot learning is an incredible area with a lot of progress. Um, anybody who does interactive robot learning knows that you can get data from people to speed up your learning process. For those of you who don't know how interactive robot learning works, um, typically you start with some kind of learning objective um, and the constraints. So what, what do you want to learn? You perform some kind of interaction to get data. Um, you might query an expert. You might um, watch demonstrations. Then the robot interprets that data in some way and uh, learns from it, and you get your learning outcome. Now, a lot of robot learning happens with synthetic data um, or uh, data that the robot uh, gets from itself, like self-supervised data, um, which is a great way of starting off the system. But often, we see situations where we kind of assume that we can just drop in a human and uh, into the same place that that synthetic data was, and we'll get similar data from the human as we were using before. Um, and that you know, the human data is just as good as the synthetic data. But the reality is that um, humans are actually incredibly context sensitive and that the performance of the person really changes the kinds of data that the robot has access to. And it changes how the robot should be interpreting that data if it wants to learn. So let me talk to you about um, the kinds of data that people are capable of providing. Um, it, uh, this is not going to be new to anybody who does learning, but I want you to try to identify your own uh, learning algorithms in this, in this chart. Um, so we can think about human feedback as having some kind of input from the robot uh, to the human, and then the human outputs some kind of information or data for the robot to learn from. Um, showing interactions are like uh, learning from demonstration, right? The, the robot actually doesn't do anything. It just watches while an expert provides some sort of example that it can learn from. But people also teach in other ways. So um, we have categorizing interactions. These are situations where the robot demonstrates what it's learned, presents one example to the person, and they can respond with a label. Um, a, a, they can, that label can be as simple as good or bad, um, or it can be more complex. In this case, the robot has to provide the example for the human to report on. Uh, sorting. Uh, feedback is uh, given when, when the robot provides two or more examples to a person, and they have to organize those examples in terms of quality. Um, in this case, you, uh, you just get relative benefit. And evaluating examples or evaluating feedback happens when the robot again provides one example, and the human gives a critique or a correction. So the, the human uh, explains what part of that example isn't working and what should work better. So again, those of you who do interactive learning probably recognize your learning systems in this table. And researchers, in fact, have even combined different kinds of learning methods in order to uh, improve the rate of robot learning. Why do we care about different ways that robots can learn? Why do we, only, why do we not only ask people for the most informative uh, learning feedback type at any particular time? The reality is that it's not just about what data the robot can get from the human. It's about what data the human is capable of providing. So critically, these different learning interactions present a different amount of cognitive load onto the human teacher. Um, so for example, uh, well, actually, I'll show you. We actually measured this. <laughs> we proved this empirically. We don't need to, we don't need to speculate. Um, we gave people a task of uh, training a lunar lander, so you know, giving um, all of those different feedback types, corrections and um, 
demonstrations and so on, um, into a lunar lander system. And then we measured the cognitive load that they were under when they were uh, dealing with each feedback type. So how do you measure cognitive load? One objective way is to give people a secondary task. So this is something else that they need to monitor, and um, the amount of attention they have to give to that task is a rough estimate of how much is left over after they have uh, attended to their primary task, which in this case is the teaching interaction. So the worse they do on the secondary task, the more load we know they have given their primary task. And what we found quantitatively is that um, sorting interactions where people had to give preferences between cases was actually harder for people than categorizing interactions where they could just say good or bad, good or bad, right? Some of you might recognize these kinds of um, interfaces. So objectively, we can see that sorting is harder than categorizing. We can also ask people, we can uh, look for subjective measures of cognitive load, ask people how difficult the task was for them. Um, and in those cases, we also find that sorting is harder than categorizing. And additionally, we find that evaluating is harder than everything. So if you're asking people to provide a critique or a correction, they perceive that as more cognitively taxing than they do sorting, um, and they perceive sorting as more cognitively taxing than they do categorizing. So in summary, the key take home I want you to learn from this first, um, this first section is that when you get data from humans, that data is gonna be variable and contextual. Um, you can use that to your advantage, for example, by getting different kinds of data that teach you, the robot different things, but you also need to understand what kinds of constraints the human is under so that you know how to interpret that data properly. Okay, so we're no longer gonna assume that humans are oracles when we train our robots. Our next trap, uh, is assuming that humans won't change during an interaction. So very often we see situations where robots are trying to adapt to people or they're trying to learn preferences. Um, but these often have a fixed human model that the robot is trying to move closer to, where the reality is that humans and robots are mutually adapting all the time. So some of the work I did in my postdoc looked at um, the human experience of shared control. Um, and in, uh, in this particular case, in the video that's playing, you can see a shared control task where a robot um, is helping a human spear a piece of food and eat it. Um, and uh, we can see obviously that the shared autonomy method that takes the human goals into account and tries to assist is faster and apparently easier to use, actually measurably easier to use, than the teleoperation case. This shared control system works by um, taking in user input from the joystick. So the system inputs uh, continuous observations of joystick control. Um, it performs some kind of goal recognition on those inputs. So it tries to predict, given some known goals, which one the human is trying to control the robot to achieve. And then it picks the right action given those goals. Um, and we actually, this is all modeled as a POMDP because there's uncertainties over which goal the human has, and so uh, the robot can represent that uncertainty with a POMDP. But what we find is that when the robot is using this process, that first input block, the amount of observations that the robot gets goes way down. So when we measure how much time people spend in each of their joystick control modes, so how much they move the joystick in each of the directions that's possible, um, as a function of uh, whether they're in shared control mode or teleoperation, we see that in shared control mode, people almost never leave the um, XY mode. So they almost never give the robot any information in terms of orientation, uh, in terms of rotation or um, Z position. Whereas in the teleoperation mode, they have to spend their time much more equally. Um, and in fact, I don't have the charts to show it, but they actually give us less information overall, even, uh, like even beyond this disproportionality. Um, what this means is that as the robot is helping the human, the human is giving the robot less information upon which the robot should use to help the human. Um, and this is something that we need to be aware of because it's going to affect the ability of the system to continue to interact in the future with the person. Now we have a question, though. 
um, this was a, a brief example of how people adapt to, to a robot's assistance. Can the robot do that intentionally? We asked in our lab, can we make a robot actually um, alter a user's decision through its own behavior? And we did this by setting up a collaborative uh, picking task where a robot handed, so a human had to pick a particular bin out of three bins and the robot handed that bin to the human. Um, and as a reward, the human got a piece of candy. So highly motivating task. Um, we put an eye tracker in front of people and so we could track where they were looking while they were surveying their different candy options to select which bin they wanted. And you can see here there's a heat map of uh, uh, eye gaze over different bins, and one of the bins is clearly being attended to the most. We say that that's the preferred uh, user target. And then we had the robot either collaborate with our humans, so assist them by beginning to move closer to that bin before the human pressed a button to make their selection. That's the collaborative robot. Or we had an adversarial robot that started to move away from the bin before the human pressed the button. And we wanted to see if the adversarial robot could cause people to change the bin that they were going to select because the, it, it influenced their decision. And it's very hard to quantify this, but we did find through the uh, free responses, the sort of um, open-ended responses at the end of the study, that there was an effect of uh, collaborative versus adversarial robots. So people who saw the collaborative robot in this task said things like, as soon as I made the decision in my head, I noticed the robot moved directly in front of the candy I wanted. Or the robot seemed to guess my choice well in the last trial. The more I have, have interfaced with the robot, the more it understood me. Like people think the robot understands them. In the adversarial case, on the other hand, people said things like, I felt like the robot wanted me to choose the middle bin after moving there. I picked a different bin than the one I originally wanted due to this, right? So the ro people are telling us that the robot is changing their behavior. Um, some people didn't really care what the robot wanted. Uh, the robot moved to be close to one box. I guess if I wanted the robot to work less, I would have chosen that box, but the wrapper color was not appealing to me. Right. In other words, people adapt to the kinds of assistance and behavior that robots are providing. And so as robots are selecting that assistance, they need to be able to model the fact that that human is changing, that, that the, the model upon which the robot is basing its assistance is also changing. Um, the third trap is that when we try to understand, uh, when we try to model human understanding of a robot, so we try to model how well a human can interpret a robot's behavior, we often try to use the things, the tools at hand, which are our algorithms. Um, when in fact, that is not the way that people process information. So there's a whole um, field, there's a whole area in learning, in human guided learning, that um, thinks about how robots can demonstrate back to humans what the robot is capable of in order to make the uh, robot uh, policy or the underlying robot framework more transparent to people. Um, so our idea, and this is actually a trap that we fell into, so I'll tell you that what we fell into and how we got out of it. Um, our idea is that we could show robot, show robot demonstrations, so show demonstrations to people that allow the person to uh, most optimally understand what the robot policy was. And we were going to do that by modeling the person as an inverse reinforcement learner, and then um, optimizing for uh, demonstrations that would maximize the inverse reinforcement learning capability. So to do this, I'll introduce briefly this grid world domain. Um, we have an agent, which green, uh, blue triangle. It's trying to deliver a package to a destination, um, and it uh, wants to avoid yellow boxes, which represent tolls, and it may or may not go to collect the battery, which represents a small boost in its score. So this kind of environment can be described as a uh, linear reward, a uh, linear combination of reward features with weights, um, and in this particular problem, the uh, teaching task is to get the human to understand the weights that the robot is putting on each of these different features. So the robot might provide a demonstration that looks something like this dotted line on, appearing on the screen. And from that, the human can start to infer the relative magnitude of the different weights 
um, to each other. So before the human sees any information, um, they have no idea how the weights relate to each other, and so we can model the weights as lying on this unit sphere um, that's in the space of possible reward weights. Every demonstration that the human gets cuts this sphere down into smaller and smaller areas because of the information that's being um, uh, provided by the robot. Um, and this isn't our work, this is based on prior work by Brown and Nikum. So for example, if you had a demonstration uh, like what's shown on the screen, this would yield two different constraints in the reward weight, so it would cut down the reward space. The first constraint, um, because the robot detours around this yellow box, you, the human, now know that the yellow box is not something that you want to go through. And not only that, but you know that it's twice as expensive as the white boxes because the robot took uh, two extra steps to get around it instead of taking one step through the box. Um, we also know that the robot tried to take the mostly shortest possible path to the goal. It didn't run around in the map, which means that step cost uh, is negative, or step reward is negative, I guess. There's a cost to taking steps. And what's left after you cut out these different areas of the reward space um, is an area where all of the different reward weights could, could have led to this demonstration. So we call that a behavioral equivalence class. Now, prior work has shown us how to optimize our behavioral equivalence class demonstrations. So how to pick the fewest possible demonstrations that provide the most specifics, the smallest behavioral equivalence class. And so our idea was, great, humans are sort of inverse reinforcement learners, so maybe we can model human learning this way, and we'll just pick the demonstrations according to this method that lead to uh, the smallest BEC area. And what we found uh, is that it's really hard. So these are the two demonstrations you would get in this particular um, weighting of these rewards. I want you to take a minute to look at it and see if you can figure out what the relative weights are of the um, yellow square, the green um, hexagon, and the uh, drop off, or the step cost. It's not easy. We stared at it for a while. Um, and what we realized, finally, um, is that people are not inverse reinforcement learners. They're not imitation learners. They're not any kind of particular algorithmic process that we often try to use to model them. So our initial idea of modeling people as IRL learners um, was no good. We threw it out, and we updated it with the fact that when people are seeing demonstrations, um, we can make those demonstrations understandable by taking advantage of the fact that we already know how people learn in educational sciences. Um, so we turned to psychology and education science and we looked at what are the techniques that teachers use to convey information to people um, in other kinds of educational settings. And we found three factors that we were able to implement into our system. Visual similarity, sorry, visual simplicity, similarity, and scaffolding. Visual simplicity means that each demonstration should be as uncluttered and simple as possible. So we don't want any extra information that isn't involved in providing the demonstration. We want the option on top that has no extra yellow um, distractor tolls. Visual similarity means that successive demonstrations should be similar. So uh, every demonstration that you give should build on the one before because people are not Markovian um, and should try to change as little as possible while um, moving towards a more informative state. And finally, um, we know that people scaffold information. So they start from the simplest information and they work their way up to more complex information. We ran a study uh, to see if these, uh, the system actually worked and we found that BEC area could actually be a good uh, uh, measure of how difficult a particular task was, a particular test was for people to complete. So after we showed people these examples, we gave them a new environment in which they showed us their optimal, uh, the optimal trajectory of the robot. And as the BEC area of that environment got smaller, people performed less and less well. It was harder and harder to do. We also showed that visual simplicity and visual similarity did improve performance when people were asked to uh, demonstrate in difficult environments. So um, we showed that these concepts from education actually did apply to the uh, inverse reinforcement learning system. 
Unfortunately, we didn't find an effect of scaffolding in this work. We actually have follow-up work uh, that's in submission, so I'm not talking about it here, that um, does uh, start to show how scaffolding can be used for um, improving the model of the learner. But the take-home message from this, uh, this kind of uh, slide or this, this experiment is that if we know how people process information, we can provide better information to them. And the robot can communicate more efficiently if it knows how people process information. Two more. Um, as Dylan very kindly said, I did a lot of my work on nonverbal communication. My whole PhD thesis was on it. So I'm obviously a fan of nonverbal communication. But our, fifth, our fourth trap is that it is possible to rely too much on nonverbal communication, or not enough. Um, so I'm going to actually, in the interest of time, briefly skip ahead. Um, so back to that shared control example. When we watch someone do this shared control task with a robot where they need to spear a morsel, we see a lot of nonverbal behavior that we can take advantage of. And in particular, we looked at eye gaze, where people were looking, as a measure of which goal they were trying to target with the robot, because we know that people look at their target object. So we put eye trackers on people while they did this task. This is what it looks like from the egocentric eye tracker view. The pink dot represents the human's eye gaze. And what we thought we would find is that eye gaze spent a lot of time on the target so that we could easily pick out which, which is the target morsel that people wanted. Um, and what we actually find, as you can see, is that eye gaze spends a lot of time on the robot end effector, which is what the human is controlling. Um, and they have no proprioception for it, so of course they're looking at it a lot. In other words, the eye gaze to the goal that we thought we would find is pretty sparse. Um, in fact, only 16% of the fixations that people made were actually to their target morsel. And 10% of the time, we saw no gaze to the target morsel at all. So gaze turns out to be quite um, an unreliable signal. We address this by um, building a sequential model that can take into account a series of gaze fixations um, using hidden Markov models in order to try to better model how gaze moves around um, for each goal. So briefly, we trained a hidden Markov model for each particular goal in the system. Um, we scored, um, uh, given a se sequence of fixations, we scored that sequence uh, for each goal. And the probability of the goal given that sequence was proportional to its score with that particular hidden Markov model. What we found is that we can actually use eye gaze to improve the shared autonomy method that I showed you before. So gaze can outperform joystick in uh, certain situations. But when gaze is wrong, it's very confidently wrong. So it's really, the system is really sure of the wrong answer. And here's an example of that. Um, here the human is trying to uh, pick up the right hand object. And you can see they briefly glance at the left hand object. And after that, our system is convinced that what they want is to go to the left. And they are completely incapable through the joystick of convincing the system otherwise. Um, and so it hyper fixates on this left hand object. People are looking at the left hand object just because they're trying to get away from it and because that's where the robot is. Um, and it doesn't help. And so they have to fight the robot for a while. In other words, um, you can use, nonverbals are very powerful. You can get a lot out of nonverbal signals, but they're also noisy and sparse, which means you have to use them carefully. And um, my student Ruben, in the next session, will talk more about that particular study. The last trap is thinking that robots, robots have to look or act like human beings. So in order to uh, talk about this work, um, this is some work we did with augmented communicators who use AAC devices to speak. Um, one of the most famous AAC device users, Stephen Hawking, um, and lots of people use these kinds of devices that might have keyboards or pictures where they select either words or um, letters in order to communicate. So here's an example of an augmented communicator um, using her AAC device to select words on the screen. And she uses her joystick to pick the words and then the button to, uh, to hit enter, essentially, to say uh, what, what, she wants, what she's typed. So I'm going to show you a video of um, what it looks like to uh, use this kind of device. Um, here, the experimenter has asked our augmented communicator a question. And her father, who's sitting next to her, starts to talk while she's typing.
Uh, no, we don't get any sound. Okay, that's fine. Dad is talking. Just imagine that he's, he's speaking. Um, and in a minute, the video will speed up. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Thank you. Um, because it takes a long time. So you can kind of see the words start to appear on the device on the left, but it takes a while for people to have, uh, you know, be able to produce these words. And in that time, the conversation has often moved on. And so what we wanted to know is, can we use a robot in place of the dad, right, in place of this support system to help somebody maintain their role, their place in the conversation? Now, a conversation um, is a three-way interaction. You have the augmented communicator, you have somebody who's playing this support role, and you have a third party who the augmented communicator is talking to. In order to figure out if robots could be helpful here, we held a participatory design workshop with a couple of augmented communicators and their close conversational partners. And we also invited puppeteers who are experts in communicating through movement. And we had a whole day workshop where they designed different robots and explained um, what what do they imagine a robot could possibly do to help them maintain their conversational agency? Here are some ideas that they came up with. Um, and we, from these ideas like filling a silence gap or letting the augmented communicator take a turn, we developed a, a series of different robot actions. Very, very simple actions, really just a flag waving around that were communicative um, of the different concepts. We prototyped this on uh, an augmented communicator's wheelchair. He used it for about two months, and we um, sort of qualitatively evaluated how well that system worked to help him maintain his conversational agency. Now, I want to point out that this robot is really simple. Um, this, is, this is really not a complex robot. It does not look like a human um, in really any meaningful way, but we did see that it could actually support his role in the conversation. So he could use that robot in the way that he might use um, eye gaze or body language in a conversational setting to hold the conversational floor or to indicate that he wants a turn. In other words, robots can take advantage of these kinds of social signals that humans use all the time even if they have minimal human-like features. OK, this is a very short talk. I went through the five traps very quickly. I want to leave you with the final thought. Um, when we are thinking about putting robots in human environments, we know that people are complex. But the reality is that people will often adapt to robots. They will work with your robots in order to become successful on the task. So don't be afraid of that. I want to acknowledge the incredible uh, team at Harp Lab that has done this work, and, and as well as our collaborators. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the amazing talk. Uh, so I just have a, a more general question. So I feel like a lot of the talk today, you uh, went over how to improve robots' understanding of human uh, in the uh, context of human-robot interaction. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, have you looked into how to improve uh, humans' understanding of robots? Because uh, I imagine in some of the examples you gave in the second slide, uh, some of the issues are actually caused by people may be feeling the robots a bit uh, oppressive in some sense. So I'm wondering your thoughts on, on that front. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So the question is about, um, do we think about human understanding of robots? Um, and I think that's critical for a couple of situations. Um, so some of the work that I showed is about people understanding robots, like um, human, the third one, so human understanding um, and how robots can model human understanding in order to be more um, transparent to people. But it's critical for trust, as you say. It's critical, critical for collaboration. If people don't know how a robot works, they're not going to be able to use it optimally or they might not use it at all. Um, and when we think about the um, pressures that, as roboticists, we're under to um, not put out scary robots. We want to make our robots as understandable as possible to try to avoid situations like what you just talked about. Thank you. Hi, uh, Sabrina Newman, I'm a postdoc at Harvard. Um, I was wondering what you think about other avenues for uh, humans to perceive things that the robots are going through, like haptics, 
uh, things like that. Do you think there's, there's feedback paths that would help people intuit what the robot's experience is? Is that useful? Yes. Um, haptics, it's actually this, in the slide that I skipped, so I'll play it now. Um, we, so haptics is another great signal for having people understand um, robots. So actually, you know what, I'm not going to play this. Come find me after if you want to see this video. Um, because your question was about, can we use haptics to um, uh, help people understand what the robot is perceiving? Um, absolutely. Uh, the challenge with a lot of the teleoperation work, for example, is that people don't have a haptic sense of what the robot is manipulating. And that makes it very hard to do manipulations because we as people are very, very sensitive to what's in our hands. Um, so robot haptics is very, very important. We often don't see robots communicating, like touching people. Um, and so that's a challenge for the community to, to do more physical human robot interaction. Um, I think we avoid it because it's challenging and potentially unsafe. Um, but I think that that's a huge avenue for human robot interaction that is um, pretty underexplored. Very cool, thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna have to ask the uh, other questioner to hold that and maybe catch up with you afterwards because be we're here. a little bit behind. So let's thank anyone. Thank you all. And I guess I'll hand over to Ani, who's the next chair. Thank you. All right, welcome everyone to this uh, last session um, of the, the day. Um, so my name is Ani Majumdar from Princeton University, and I'm going to be chairing this session. Uh, so we're going to have a group of five talks and a Q&A session, and then another group of uh, four talks followed by another uh, Q&A session. Uh, so the first talk in the session is called uh, Mirror. Uh, differentiable uh, deep social projection for assistive human robot uh, communication. Hi, <laughs> I'm Harold. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm going to present Mirror. Uh, this is joint work with my students, Kai Chi and Jeffrey. Uh, unfortunately, Kai Chi couldn't be here today to present his work. Uh, so the problem we're trying to tackle is assistive human robot communication. What is that? Essentially, uh, let me explain with a simple example. So here we have a room with two agents, a robot and a human being. And the human, let's call him Jake, wants to get to the exit. All right. The wrinkle is that we've switched off the lights, so Jake can't see a box in the middle of the room. The robot can see the box because it has LiDAR, and we would like to enable the robot to figure out that it needs to tell Jake the box is there in order to, um, for Jake to safely make his way to the exit. Now, this is really challenging for robots because unlike human beings, they don't have a theory of mind. So we're going to adopt a planning-based method. Uh, the robot's going to forward, simulate, or imagine uh, possible futures. And more often than not, it realizes that you know, if it does nothing, Jake is going to crash into the box. All right. So uh, by tweaking its communication, you know, it figures out eventually that it needs to tell Jake about the box so that Jake can safely make his way to the exit. All right, so that's at the conceptual level. Um, let's delve down into the technical details. So the way we are sampling these trajectories is uh, by coupling a robot model and a human model. So the robot model captures the robot's beliefs about the world as well as its dynamics. So we are using a latent state-based model that we train using a combination of variational inference and reinforcement learning. So from the robot's uh, beliefs of the world, let's say ZT, we sample a particular observation, XT. We feed that to the human model, uh, which captures Jake's behavior. That's going to spit out an action in a second. Uh, and then we're going to feed that to the forward dynamics, which will then give us the next state. And we can roll out this trajectory into the future. All right. So uh, by changing these observations, XT here, we can provide communication in order to change the simulated human's behavior. Now, the next natural question is, what do you use for your human model? So you could you know, build one from scratch, handcraft one, uh, you know, using a cognitive model like SOAR or ACTAR, but this can be a bit labor intensive. Alternatively, you could do what the cool kids are doing nowadays and learn a model, you know, deep learning. Uh, but that also, you may run into issues because uh, you might have our distribution problems because you're changing this axis here right, uh, in order to change the behavior for planning. So we are going to adopt a lazy kids approach, and we're going to copy over the robot model onto the human model. We're going to mirror that. Okay? Uh, this is inspired by social projection, where social projection theory, which is that human beings do this. Okay? They uh, use themselves, or the internal models of themselves, when, when reasoning about other people. 
Okay. Um, so this kind of approach uh, can work, uh, but if you do it a little bit naively, it's, it's not going to fly. And the reason for this is what Henny was talking about earlier, that robots and human beings are actually different, right? Uh, this, in this case, it's worse because the robot actually thinks that Jake has LiDAR, which is just clearly insane. So we're going to have to counteract this via a little bit of learning, okay? We're going to leverage the structure in these state space models in order to put little learnable functions that we call implants. So we have perceptual implants. They are going to capture uh, the differences in how Jake perceives the world uh, relative to the robot. All right? uh, we're also going to have policy implants, which capture how differently Jake behaves based on his beliefs, again, relative to the robot. And we think that modeling these differences is much more sample efficient compared to you know, black box learning uh, because you are leveraging the structure that's inherent in the robot model, for example, causal rules. Now, um, let me see. One last trick. Okay. We, instead of modeling just single observation modalities, all right, you can model M different observation modalities, which will pop up in a second. Now, why might you want to do this? Because if you, you can think about these M different modalities as different communication channels. So now you can, the robot can not only reason about what to communicate, but how best to communicate that information. So back to our example, uh, the robot maybe doesn't need to tell Jake about the box. Uh, it can instead show Jake that the box is there. All right. So that's, um, I hope I managed to convey what Mirror is. Uh, my five minutes is almost up, so I'm just going to say Mirror works. Okay, we have a bunch of experiments showing that Mirror works uh, on various domains with simulated agents as well as with real world, uh, sort of real life human participants driving in order to avoid collisions uh, and with the agent providing useful information. All right. We are paper number 20, but poster number 16, all right? Uh, you can, uh, if you don't manage to catch me at the poster, you can email me or email Kai Chi. Um, I'll be there to answer any questions you might have about the method, experiments, as well as, you know, all the things that didn't work. Um, thank you very much, and I hope to see you at the poster. So our next talk is called uh, Robotic Telekinesis, and it's going to be presented by uh, Arvind Sivakumar. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Arvind, and I'll be presenting our work on robotic telekinesis. This is joint work with Kenny Shaw and Professor Deepak Patak. So robotic telekinesis is a low-cost vision-based system that allows any person to teleoperate a robot arm and hand just by moving their own arm and hand. So a single color camera captures a stream of video of the operator, and their motion is retargeted onto the robot in real time. So first, let's discuss some key aspects and requirements of our system. So firstly, we use only a single RGB camera with no depth sensors or calibration, and this means that in theory, our system could be used with any cell phone or tablet camera. Our system must work out of the box without any fine tuning on every operator, regardless of their appearance or hand shape. It should work for any type of dexterous manipulation task, and it should work regardless of where the operator is located or what background they're standing against. So here we see an example of telekinesis being used for remote teleoperation via a video conferencing tool. But how do we train a system that can achieve these requirements? Like, where would we get the data that allows this level of generalization? So gathering paired human-robot poses for thousands of people, places, and tasks is totally intractable. But we do have access to an endless supply of diverse human hand manipulation videos thanks to websites like YouTube. And as we'll see, we train our system using only these human videos without any training or data collection on a robot. So first, let's look at our method. Our pipeline starts with a single color camera that captures images of the operator. We first estimate the pose of the operator's hand and body using powerful pose estimators that are themselves pre-trained on millions of images. We then retarget the human hand pose to a corresponding robot hand pose and we retarget the human body pose to a corresponding robot arm pose. So first, let's talk about hand retargeting. So the key challenge here is that human and robot hands differ in size, shape, and joint structure, and we don't have paired human-robot ground truth correspondences. What we do have are millions of diverse human hand images that we can extract from YouTube, and we can estimate the hand poses using pose estimators. But still, we don't have the corresponding ground truth robot pose label so how do we train a retargeter with only that data? 
So our solution is to take an energy minimization approach. And this energy function measures the dissimilarity between any human hand pose and any robot hand pose. So intuitively, if the human hand pose has the thumb and index finger close together like this, we'd want the robot to do the same. And the energy function formalizes this intuition, and importantly, it's differentiable. So we implement our hand pose retargeter as a neural network that will map a human hand pose to a robot hand pose. And this red curve represents this energy, or this loss, or this cost, being minimized over millions of everyday hand poses extracted from YouTube clips. And so in this way, we can train this retargeter using only human data and no robot data. And the resulting model is quite robust to variations in hand pose, shape, and size. So now let's talk about body retargeting. So this step is done analytically. And the key idea is that we care about how the operator's wrist is oriented relative to some anchor point like their torso. And so once we compute this relative offset, we can then use inverse kinematics to find a pose for the robot wrist with the same relative offset with respect to the robot's torso. Finally, we apply smoothing interpolation and clips to make sure everything is smooth and safe in real time. And putting it all together, our pipeline starts with a stream of video of the operator and produces a robot hand arm trajectory that's executed in real time on the fly. So here we see it in action. Here we see four untrained operators that have never used the system before, completing a variety of manipulation tasks. And now let's discuss some of our experiments and results. So our first experiment tries to gauge how usable the system is for the novice operators like the ones you just saw. And the feedback from the subjects praised the usability and generalizability of our system, but also did highlight a few failure modes in retargeting that we hope to address in future work. Our second set of experiments aims to study the trade-off between using this neural network for retargeting versus using online gradient descent at runtime. And we find that the speed and robustness of our network to be very beneficial. But we do note that because our network learns such a strong prior over everyday hand poses, like the one seen in YouTube clips, it can suffer on complex, rare, out-of-distribution hand poses. We have several other experiments and ablations that I won't go into detail here, but we invite you all to check out our paper, poster, and website. Thank you for listening. So our next talk is uh, Underwater Robot-to-Human uh, Communication via Motion. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Michael Fulton. I'm pleased to present this work along with my colleagues from the Interactive Robotics and Vision Lab at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. If the video comes up. And this is actually a great uh, connection with Henny's talk because this is nonverbal with uh, nonverbal communication with not very much human similarity. So we're working in the context of underwater human robot interaction here. Underwater HRI is a field which has developed pretty quickly over the last 15 years or so with the emergence of human portable, human scale, autonomous underwater vehicles. The core focus is enabling collaborative work between humans and AUVs using communication between the two. Now, when we look at communication in the underwater environment, when the AUV is communicating to the human, it's mostly through text displayed on integrated digital displays. Now, this is great because you get high density information displayed very succinctly. However, digital displays are extremely hard to read underwater. You can see in the video here, the diver pulling the robot close to his face so that he can read it. If it's far away or rotated at all, it's almost impossible to read. So we were interested in exploring more natural human-like communication systems that could be used at a variety of different distances and orientations. And that's where robot communication via motion comes in. So we proposed this back in 2019. We proposed RCVM, which is this method of using full body robotic motion as a stand-in for human gestures. We call these kinemes, motion with semantic meaning. And we discovered in 2019 that in our simulation-based RCVM, it outperformed a light-based communication baseline system. Now, that's all well and good. However, what happens when we bring things to the real world? Real world motion control in the underwater space is much more difficult. So how is RCV going to perform when we implement it, as we've done in this paper, bring it to the real world, and compare it to alternative types of communication? Uh, you can see here the follow me kinium being demonstrated on the Aqua AUV, telling the, the diver to follow the robot. Now, when I say baseline types of communication, other alternatives, I'm talking about light-based communication with an array of LEDs, integrated digital displays, as I mentioned, which are the primary method used, and then also 
audio-based uh, text-to-speech communication. We used the Google text-to-speech API to generate phrases and play them over a waterproof speaker. See how that worked out. So this paper, we present uh, two studies on this. Uh, the first study was an in-person pilot study where we integrated RCVM into the context of a full interaction loop. So we trained people on what the kinemes of RCVM mean, then we had them ask the robot a question with a gesture, receive an answer via kineme, and then take an action. Based on the actions that participants take, we can then infer which kineme they recognized, and we see while there is a perceptible drop in accuracy from our simulated version, we still get a pretty good overall kineme recognition. Now, this is excellent, but how is it going to compare to these other baseline communication methods that I talked about? And in particular, what happens when we look at RCVM at different distances and at different orientations? And that's where our multidimensional study comes in. This is an online study due to the scope of the problem. So we recruited people on Amazon Mechanical Turk, trained them in the use of one of these four communication systems at an ideal communication viewpoint. And then we asked them to identify phrases from that system at a different viewpoint. So three meters distance, eight meters distance, 45 degrees, 90 degrees rotation from the camera. And this is a much more challenging issue, um, much more difficult. Now, the main thing that we see here is that while RCVM does not outperform any of these systems at the ideal viewpoint, it is much, much more resistant to viewpoint change. Uh, the LCD and text-to-speech communication systems drop off almost immediately, as soon as you take them away from their ideal viewpoint, whereas RCVM, and to a lesser extent, the LED communication system are much more resistant to change. And we can see that in the graph here, both in terms of the raw accuracy, did people recognize the phrase correctly, and in terms of what we call operational accuracy. How correct were people when they were confident that they were right? So we see RCVM does not perform the best at the ideal viewpoints. However, when you look at these challenging viewpoints where these nor typical methods of communication just fail, RCVM can help us fill in the gap there and make this much, much more robust. Uh, so in this paper, we've presented our implementation of RCVM for real robots and two studies establishing where RCVM fits in the general scope of underwater robot to human communication. Generally, we see that RCVM is recognized decently well and is much more resistant to viewpoint change than other types of communication. I'd like to say thank you to all my collaborators, funding partners, and everything else. Come see us at the poster session. We're poster 18. Thanks. So the next talk is called uh, Gaze Complements Control Input uh, for Goal, predictive, goal Prediction During Assisted uh, Teleoperation, and it's going to be presented by Ruben uh, Aronson. All right. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Ruben, and we're jumping right into it. All right. So teleoperation is a uh, really important control modality for a lot of um, important tasks. However, it's hard for people to control robots, especially for manipulation actions um, in high degree of freedom situations. Uh, one strategy to resolve that problem is shared control, in which the system predicts the user's goal from some of their uh, perceived behavior and then autonomously plans a robot action to achieve that goal. Um, we're going to be looking at that goal prediction step. And in particular, we consider two t sources of goal information. Uh, first, the user's control input, uh, which we will actually show is probabilistically optimal when the system is simple, but doesn't give sufficient information in more general cases. And next, we'll be looking at the user's natural gaze behavior, so where they look during the task, and we'll show that it provides complementary information about the user's goal, but it gives less reliable information, and together they can give you a better picture um, than either alone. So why control input? Uh, control input is a common uh, startup modality, uh, mostly because it's already available to the system, right? So the user is providing a joystick input, uh, and you already uh, can use it. We can actually, uh, so to understand it better, um, we can work through an example. So here's a sort of example scenario in 2D. So you can imagine you have a robot at A, moving towards one of the two goals uh, indicated as green stars. And we'll look at the optimal robot action and the user's likely control input at a couple different points of the task. 
And so at the beginning, we see that the, both actions are towards the right, which is independent of their goal information. And so the system doesn't need any goal information to make that action. In contrast, at point C, the, um, the action requires goal information to proceed, but the user gives that goal information because it's the optimal way to make progress. And we actually show that when the user is noisily optimizing the same MDP as the robot, uh, that uh, accounts for most of the situations. And so we can actually have uh, guarantees on the user's behavior. However, this doesn't necessarily extend to more general problems. In particular, when the user's input is restricted, such as during modal control, um, the users, we don't have these guarantees anymore. And so to look at an example of that, uh, we can consider a separate point. So here, imagine that the user can only provide uh, input along the axes, uh, whereas the robot can move in any direction in 2D. We could see at point B over there that the robot would be able to benefit from goal directed motion, uh, from goal information to give optimal motion, but the user information doesn't give uh, enough information. In contrast, uh, so, to, so the point we look at user's natural gaze and to compare the relative usefulness of each of the input signals, uh, we ran a user study. Um, in this study, participants teleoperated a robot um, using uh, shared control based assistance and we used to predict their goals, either their control input, their eye gaze behavior, or both of them combined. To design the task, uh, we designed a task that sort of mirrored our 2D example in which the goal optimal location differed in both X and Y and users were restricted by the joystick, uh, by the control of the robot to um, only provide motion in, in two axes at a time. And we find that when the system gets early information from gaze, it improves on the, the task metrics because it allows for assistance in the directions of motion that require goal information to proceed because the control input has not yet given it. However, um, when we combine everything together, we, show, we see that gaze does not actually improve over control input pro, uh, alone in aggregate, largely because gaze itself is not a particularly reliable signal and that we both don't see particularly many um, glances towards the goal. And when people looked at the goal as, um, Hany and Modi said earlier, um, it can perform a, a pathological behavior because of a, mix, uh, a failure to recognize the states. Um, so yeah, so um, here we can look at two different signals for goal prediction and by understanding their relative roles in the task, we can build a system that works better together. Thank you. So our last talk in this block is called uh, A Negative Result for Learning from Demonstration, uh, Challenges for End Users Teaching Robots with Task and Motion Planning Abstractions. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Nakul Gopal, and here to present our work on Negative Result for Learning from Demonstrations, Challenges in End Users Teaching Robots with Task and Motion Planning Abstractions. So the domain that we, so, so our foremost motivation is we want people to be helped by robots. So Georgia Tech has an AI for Caring Institute where we see how elderly people can be helped with robots. Um, but, but there's a problem whenever we need to teach novel tasks to robots. Um, for example, cooking. So here's Julia Child's recipe for scrambled eggs. It comes with like six variations. How do we teach these tasks to a robot with like a few demonstrations? So what's nice about these tasks is that they're long horizon. They are multimodal. They involve contact with different objects like eggs and spatulas, and you can easily specify multitask specifications on them. In robotics specifically, there is the formalism of task and motion planning that allows us to specify and solve these problems. So what we want to do is we want to see if people can teach robots with task and motion planning abstractions. Um, in related work in robotics, people have already looked at teaching robots using keyframe specifications or hierarchical task networks. In reinforcement learning, there's the options framework, and in CogSci, we have already studied how, how people learn and teach using abstractions. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to see if robots specifically can be taught by people using task and motion planning abstractions. 
and what kind of inducements can we give them so that they teach with task and motion planning abstractions. So our first research question is, do people naturally teach with abstractions? And our second research question is, what type of inducements or external factors can be given so people start using abstractions when teaching robots? And finally, we see what kind of explicit instructions will help people use task and motion planning abstractions when teaching tasks to robots. So our domain is a soil mixture domain where we have got, we've got sand, lime, and manure, and we, uh, the, the users teach the robot to create multiple ratios of these objects. So the users give kinesthetic demonstrations for subtasks that then they can chain to solve larger problems uh, in, in this interface. And they don't need to use abstractions at all. They can directly just give an end-to-end -end demonstration. So the type of demonstrations that users can give are end-to-end -end demonstrations where they do not use any abstractions at all, or they could use some sort of object-based abstractions when teaching the robot, uh, which don't have any preconditions or contact specifications. And finally, what we care about are tap-based abstractions that have the highest amount of generalizability. So we created an abstraction score that actually grades these levels of abstractions that users provide to robots. To study this problem, we conducted two user studies and in the first experiment, we provided users with a baseline condition which just had a single, uh, which just had a single task setup, which was followed by a multitask setup and uh, a phase with a lot of internal repetitions to see if people use abstractions when teaching robots in those two conditions. And finally, we just gave them written instructions to teach TAMP subtasks to, uh, TAMP based subtasks to the robot. We noticed that people did not do well in teaching tap-based abstractions over there, so we conducted a second experiment where after the baseline condition, we had uh, an analog video of, a, of an analog task, uh, like block stacking, and we showed them a debug demonstration of the task that they were teaching the robot, followed by an expert video task. So to our results, uh, people do not use abstractions uh, when teaching robots, so the majority of the participants just didn't. And uh, external factors like repetition or multitask setups perform equally well as the baseline condition when teaching the robot. And finally, uh, only the expert video helps uh, consistently in, uh, in, in helping people teach the robot tasks with TAMP and motion planning abstractions. But the problem here is that experts are not always available. So we took uh, the demonstrations that users gave us and we, c we actually taught the robot tasks using the demonstrations that they gave. And if the task has already been demonstrated to the robot previously, the robot can solve the tasks irrespective of the quality of abstraction. Um, moderate quality abstractions, which are object focused, can solve novel configurations that were unseen. But uh, only tap-based abstractions can generalize from novel locations on the table because tap-based abstractions take into account contact specifications and preconditions when solving the task. Um, so our key takeaways are that participants do not naturally use abstractions when teaching tasks to robots. And the instruction medium that helps the most is of an expert video teaching the tasks to robots, but experts are not always available to teach tasks to robots. So it creates this problem. Um, thanks a lot. So we now have a Q&A session uh, for um, these papers. So I'd like to invite the uh, authors to come up. Are there questions in the room? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I have a question for the underwater uh, communication paper. Uh, great talk. So I, I'm just wondering uh, how are the, um, how do you, how do you say, can be designed? Oh, uh, how are the kinemes designed? Yes. Yeah. So um, it's an iterative process where we start by looking at our list of things that we want to communicate. Then we check and see if there are direct human analogs, like for instance, yes and no, nodding and shaking the head. If there are direct human analogs that we can mimic, we go with those. If not, uh, we look at the uh, concepts involved in the phrase that we want to communicate and try to structure something off of that. This is something that we have a lot of open work in because it's a very difficult task, and right now it's very handcrafted, but we're hoping to provide a little more analysis on that in the future. Thank you. 
My question is actually also for the underwater talk. Um, I'm very curious about what you see with the bandwidth difference between the LED signals, the kinemes, and the LCD screen, which is obviously going to be able to communicate more information. Do you feel like you're limited in what you can communicate and what's needed for the tasks you can do by that bandwidth? So the bandwidth, the bandwidth difference. Yeah, so um, when, it, when the information is very specific, it's hard to communicate it, sorry, very specific and not directional. I would say it's hard to communicate it with motion and with LEDs, at least the LED systems we've had so far. We have new LED systems under work that are more highly uh, dimensional and can communicate more information. It's definitely LCD system, text-to-speech system when it works, uh, LED and RCVM on about the same level in terms of uh, dimension or in bandwidth, but Personally, I think motion works better than lights, and we've seen that so far in our, in our work in general. Thank you, really interesting work. Thanks. Dave, uh, go ahead. Hi, I had a question about robot telekinesis. You mentioned that uh, the neural network performs less well on out of distribution poses, um, but it's faster than energy-based optimization. Have you tried using the neural network to initialize the energy-based optimization to try to get the best of both worlds? Yeah, I think that's a great idea, and I think there are a lot of in-betweens between these two extremes of neural network and energy-based optimizations. So the one you suggested would, I think, be very promising because um, a lot of the issues with using online gradient descent are issues of seeding and initialization. For example, if the solver fails at one iteration, the next iteration would be seeded from the failed solution of the previous iteration. Um, so I think something like that would be very powerful to get the speed of a neural network with uh, the guarantees, if you will, of gradient descent. Cool, thanks. Uh, I have a question for the mirror paper. So I'm just wondering what is the model reconciliation process you're using? I'm assuming like from like how the language has been generated once you recognize the human is about to make some mistake or something like that. Uh, so I think the question is about how we generate language uh, in, the, in the setup. So we actually use a simil similar to autoencoder-like model uh, with a pre-trained GPT-2 model uh, within. So that's how the, the text is being generated to the, to the person. And then we use a text-to-speech um, sort of module to just output that into the module. Cool. Yep. Thank you. So I have a question also for the robotic uh, telekinesis. Kinesis work. Um, so you mentioned that you do some uh, kind of pre-training based on YouTube videos, uh, and I'm wondering if you see a bias in that data set towards right-handedness, um, and if you do some kind of like data set balancing to also generalize to, to potentially like left-handed users. Uh, yeah, so we do see bias. The way we handle this particular bias is we don't train on left-handed um, clips. So right now, like one limitation of our system is that it only works for right human hands and right robot hands. Um, so this is definitely something that we hope to address in the future. I would say other types of bias that we see when you use um, training on, on everyday tasks like those you see on YouTube are somewhat of a bias towards what you might call like common hand poses that are used in everyday interactions. Um, whereas if faced with like some very obscure hand pose like this, our network may struggle just because it's out of the distribution of training data. Thank you. Maybe we have uh, time for one last uh, question. Go ahead. Okay. I have a question for Ruben. Uh, you mentioned that you're using both the gaze and uh, the joysticker. Do you consider these two different control or human signals have different delay? Sorry, can you repeat the last part of the question? Uh, did, you, did you consider the joystick joy, joy input and the eye gaze has, have different delays? Like they probably do not match each other on like they probably not happen at the same time. Yeah, so I'd say loosely the, the big advantage of gaze is that it could occur or it tended to give you earlier information than the control input did. And that was sort of because of the process of the task where there was sort of this, this uh, I didn't get into it in the talk, but um, the task sort of has two phases where there's a general motion that was sort of common for both goals, and then there was individual motion for the specific goal that they were doing, and people tended to do the common motion for both goals first, and then do the individual motion. And so their user input didn't give goal informative information until after they'd switched to the goal-specific mode. 
um, but the gaze could give it earlier. Uh, one of the interesting things we did find, though, is that as people sort of learned to use the system, they kind of understood and they started deliberately giving goal informative information earlier with the control limit. It could control it, but just as sort of, um, so the dynamics are very much more sort of how people happen to control it rather than something that uh, we would expect to be sort of reliable or guaranteed. Thank you. Great talk. All right. I think we're going to move on to the, the last block of, uh, of talk. So let's thank our uh, speakers again. So the, the next talk uh, is going to be um, human motion control of quadrupedal robots using uh, deep reinforcement learning. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Sanu Kim. Autonomous robots can enter dangerous environments, such as disaster recovery scenes, instead of human workers. However, they often fail in unforeseen scenarios since they are overfitted for the training process. This limitation motivates us to develop a flexible motion control interface agnostic to testing time missions. Here's the illustration of the proposed human motion control interface. First, the user aims to hit the ball. Notice that the ball is high, located higher than the standing height, so the user tilts his body while manipulating his arm. The hanging bone is even higher than the ball, so the user controls the robot to sit to reach the target. Moreover, the user can uh, re perform reactive control, such as touching a flying ball. In our system, the main challenge comes from the morphological difference between the human and the robot. Uh, we should find the robot motion that reflects the user's intention and is also physically plausible. Our system consists of three main components. First, the retargeting module maps the uh, capture human motion into the robot's kinematic space. Then, the control policy learns to track the retargeting motion in the physics space simulation. Finally, we apply domain randomization for better real world deployment. First, I'll explain the uh, retargeting module. Previously, we often tackle motion retargeting using feature based approaches that optimize poses depending on predefined rules. However, they require complicated calculation, which is not suitable for the real-time application. On the other hand, the data-driven approaches are less costly at execution and is also providing additional flexibility. We take the idea of supervised learning to build our uh, data-driven retargeting module. Our neural network acts as the retargeting function, providing agility and the flexibility. The loss function is designed to minimize the difference between orientation, joint angles, and the end effectors. However, the learned function often generates the physically invalid motions, leading to control failure. Uh, to handle this issue, we correct the consistency as post-processing. We first correct the contact consistency by predicting contact flag uh, and fixing unnecessary fuscating. We also suppress the temporal consistency to prevent abrupt joint movements. As we can see here, both corrections are essential to maintain physical validity. We further construct motion hierarchy to allow users to uh, execute various motor tasks seamlessly. The motion selector chooses the motion state depending on the proximity of current human to the training data. Then the next task is to track the uh, ref, uh, retargeting motion in the physics space simulation. We train the motion imitation policy using deep reinforcement learning. The reward is designed to minimize the difference between reference motion and the simulated motion. Uh, we introduce curriculum learning to obtain better performance. We introduce, um, well, we, we introduce our curriculums on both task difficulties and types, from a narrow range to the wider workspaces for the difficulties curriculum, and from a single task to a combined task for a types curriculum. Without both curriculums, the policy generates, generates the conservative behaviors. Finally, we apply domain randomization for sim to real transfer. 
we randomized the simulator parameters such as mass, PD gains, or friction coefficients during the training. Uh, without, without domain randomization, the hardware fails uh, without domain randomization. We can perform various uh, tasks using our system. As we can see in this video, the user can push the tennis ball and the dominoes. In this mission, we aim to push the box to the target location. Initially, the box is too far from the robot and not reachable. So the user controls the robot to walk and push the box repeatedly to locate it on the target position. Thank you for listening, and please visit our website and the uh, poster session. So our next talk is uh, rapid locomotion via uh, reinforcement learning. Um, hi, so I'm, I'm Gabe Margolis, and I'll be presenting our work on rapid locomotion via reinforcement learning, a robust and scalable approach to legged robotic sprinting. So recent work has yielded dramatic improvements in robotic walking in the wild. This line of work predominantly uses reinforcement learning coupled with domain randomization to yield policies that are highly robust to disturbances. Other work has demonstrated running at high speeds. High speed running controllers developed in the past few years have mostly been handcrafted rather than learning based. However, neither have matched what we've seen in nature, that is, animals that are capable of achieving high speed on natural terrains. We ask what solutions can scale to solve this combined problem. Locomotion in the wild is hard due to dynamic variations that are not present in a laboratory. The robot's feet may sink or slip into the ground. Geometric variation in the terrain also impacts the robot's motion. Fast locomotion imposes a complementary set of dynamic considerations that are not present at low speeds. These include operation at actuator limits, the regulation of high contact forces, and body control during flight phases. These factors compound the system complexity. So, how does existing work address locomotion in dynamically complex settings? One approach is to implement targeted improvements to hand-designed models used in analytical controllers. Existing approaches can compensate for terrain compliance, flight phases at high speed, or terrain geometry. However, integrating these systems while adhering to a computational budget is a challenging engineering task. A promising alternative is to use reinforcement learning. Rather than relying on a human to design a computationally efficient model for a complex phenomenon, we can attempt to directly optimize a policy through interaction with the simulator. In this work, we take lessons learned from in-the-wild locomotion and apply them to high-speed running. The inputs to our neural network policy are raw sensor readings, past actions, and the desired linear and angular velocity of the body, or the command. The policy operates in an action space of joint angles. This keeps our system simple to deploy and avoids any unnecessary constraints on its motion. So, what's hard about using reinforcement learning to run and spin at high speed? Let's consider this plane where the x-axis corresponds to sprinting speed and the y-axis corresponds to spinning speed. A slow walking controller performs well when trained on the narrow range of commands shown here. To achieve high speed, one must train on a larger range of commands. However, if you try this, the agent no longer learns to walk at all. Why does the agent fail? From the start of training, it is being assigned high speed tasks, which are very hard. This yields little reward and hinders learning. One way to address this is to gradually increase the difficulty of tasks, an idea well known as curriculum learning. Instead of manually designing the curriculum, we develop a strategy that automatically increases the command complexity. This scalable approach enables the acquisition of walking and running behaviors. While this works, there remains a problem. Linear and angular velocity are coupled. One can either run fast or spin fast, but centrifugal force prevents their combination. This causes many high-speed commands to be physically infeasible. If we do not admit conditional dependence between linear and angular velocity, the agent is exposed to an increasing rate of infeasible commands as its speed climbs, which leads to many poor performing episodes and hinders learning. To address this, we applied a curriculum strategy that automatically accounts for the dependent coupling between variables. This enables stronger performance for high-speed running and spinning motions. 
What is feasible is also dependent on robot properties, such as mass, and terrain properties, such as friction. Identifying these properties online using a learned module further improves agility, and more so when running at high speeds. I'll conclude with some videos. This video shows a max speed test of our end-to-end -end learned controller. It sustained a top speed of 3.9 meters per second, slightly faster than the previous record held by a handcrafted controller for this robot. The same controller can also spin at speeds comparable to the fastest handcrafted controller. The benefit of reinforcement learning really shows when the robot is taken outside of the lab. Here it spins on an icy patch as its feet constantly slip. It averages 3.4 meters per second for a 10 meter dash across uneven grassy terrain. A baseline MPC controller fails in this challenging gravelly hill that is both sloped and granular. Our controller moves in an unintuitive way, but makes it up the hill. It does a little spin at the top. So uh, we'll be showing a live demo of our controller at the contact workshop on Friday. Uh, thanks, thanks for listening. So our next talk uh, is called Human to Robot Imitation in the Wild. Hey everyone, my name is Shikhar and I'll be talking about Human to Robot Imitation in the Wild. This is joint work with Abhinav Gupta and Deepak Pathak at CMU. Consider these cooking videos. Can we teach robots the same skills from watching humans? We aim to answer this question in our paper. Our work consists of directly learning from human videos in the real world without training and simulation. The key idea is to extract priors from these videos and then ex improve and explore around these in the real world. Our work scales up to many different tasks in the wild. In fact, we perform 20 different day-to-day -day tasks that we found all around campus, as you can see here. Now let me walk you through how this approach actually works. Firstly, the robot watches videos of humans performing different tasks, like opening a fridge. From these, we can extract information about hand-object interactions, as well as hand motion. We call these our human behavior priors. Using simple 3D computer vision techniques, we define a mapping function to the robot's end effectors, and then we execute this in the real world. Now, you see that the robot gets close to opening the fridge, but it does fail. So it needs some practice in the real world. This is the repeat stage of our method. But given all of this repetition, how does a robot actually improve? In order to improve, the robot needs the human video to guide this. But consider these drawer opening videos. We can't really compare them well in feature or pixel space because there's a large embodiment gap. However, if we mask and in-paint the agents out of the video, we can actually do so. Thus, we build an agent agnostic cost function using human and robot in-painting videos. We use this agent agnostic cost function to improve the policy in the real world in an efficient manner. In fact, our policy consists of two different sub-modules. Firstly, a task policy aims to minimize the agent agnostic distance between human and robot videos. But in order to not be too close to the prior, we encourage the robot to try new things using an exploration policy. The goal of this exploration policy is to maximize the agent agnostic change. More concretely, this is the visual change in the agent agnostic embedding space. We call our approach WORL, or in the wild, human imitating robot learning. To summarize, we first compute 3D human priors. We project these to the robot's action space and execute them in the real world. We use a change-based objective to perform exploration, and then we improve our policy using our agent agnostic cost function as well as our exploration metric. Now, let me show you an example of world in action. On, on the right, we have a human video as input. And on the left, we show a time lapse of the training procedure for our method. Using our sampling-based optimization strategy, within about 60 episodes, or one to two hours of training, Whirl learned to solve the task pretty well. In fact, even within a couple of iterations, we see dras a drastic improvement in performance. 
we use the same sampling-based optimization strategy to optimize both the task and the exploration policies. Now let's look at some results of world applied to many different settings. As I mentioned earlier, we performed 20 different manipulation tasks in the wild. Videos of all of these are available on our website, and here I've shown you a subset of these. For each of these, the robot only gets a single video of the human performing the task, and then we run world for about two hours. Note that the camera angle between the human and the robot video don't have to be the same, as well as the starting position of the robot doesn't have to be the same as that of the human. We perform thorough comparisons between Whirl and many different state-of-the-art baselines, and we find that all of the components of our method, like the iterative improvement, the agent agnostic cost function, as well as the exploration policy are very important. On the plots on the left, we see that success definitely improves with more interactions in the real world. Thanks for watching this presentation. For more information, we encourage you to visit our website and our poster. I think it's number 23. Thanks, everyone. So our last talk for the session is called uh, Variation Inference MPC Using Normalizing Flows and Auto Distribution Projection. OK, thanks. Uh, Hi, I'm Thomas. I'll be discussing our work in which we propose learning sampling distributions for MPC using normalizing flows. The learned sampling distribution generates goal-directed and environment-aware um, controls, and we additionally propose a method for adapting the learned sampling distribution to novel environments. So first, let's give a little bit of an overview for sample-based MPC. So consider the following navigation problem. Um, we frame this as finding a control sequence that minimizes the expected cost. Uh, so popular sample-based MPC methods iteratively update a control sequence using Gaussian perturbations. And this process is really as good as the samples. So if we add in obstacles, and now all these samples are high cost, when iteratively resampling, we can become stuck in a local minima. In contrast, samples from our proposed sampling distribution are shown on the right here. Um, and they show qualitatively different trajectories that reach the goal uh, while avoiding obstacles. So how should we train this sampling distribution? Well, intuitively, we want a sampling distribution where the likelihood is related to the cost while maintaining diversity. Uh, we formalize this as Bayes in MPC, first introducing a binary optimality variable. The goal is then to find posterior over low-cost control sequences. We use variational inference to approximate this posterior, uh, minimizing the KL divergence between our approximation and the true distribution. The, this results in the following objective where we're essentially minimizing cost of the samples while also maximizing the entropy. So now I'll go through uh, the whole proposed sampling uh, approach. So the inputs are at start, goal, and the environment. We use a VAE to encode the environment to a latent representation H. We use a normalizing flow as the latent space prior, which is learned during training. We encode H, the start and goal, into a context vector. And then the control sequence normalizing flow takes the context vector and transforms normally distributed samples into low-cost controls. Our total objective combines the expected cost of controls, the sampling distribution entropy, and the VAE loss. The space of environments is very high dimensional, and we couldn't cover it with training data, so we would like to adapt to novel environments. And to do this, we use the VAE. Uh, so looking at the VAE loss, we see that there's this prior likelihood term, and we can use this as an out-of-distribution score. Uh, and we found that using the, the normalizing flow prior made this score very effective. Um, however, we don't want to project arbitrarily towards the training distribution. We'd like to encode relevant features of the environment. So we uh, encode the environment to H. We then evaluate the OD score for H. We then use H to generate trajectories. And unsurprisingly, a lot of them are in collision. Um, to do the projection, we combine the OOD score with the cost on the resulting control distribution, and this results in a new environment representation that we can use for sampling. Iteratively running this projection online, it effectively hallucinates an environment close to the training distribution, which also results in low-cost trajectories. We incorporate, we incorporate our flow into MPPI, a widely used sample-based MPC method. MPPI iteratively updates the control sequence using um, 
cost-weighted sum of Gaussian perturbations. We can instead generate uh, samples using our flow model. Uh, we actually use a combination of both, generating half using the flow model and half using uh, Gaussian perturbations. We demonstrate our approach on a plane on navigation task with double integrator dynamics and a quadrotor task, um, 12 degree of freedom underactuated. And we evaluate on complex novel environments in both cases. We additionally evaluate on real world environments for the quadrotor task generated from real world data. Our approach shows improved cost and performance over baselines across different environments, um, novel environments for both the planar navigation and the quadrotor, as well as improved performance on real world environments uh, for the quadrotor. The OOD projection effectively hallucinates obstacles uh, in order to steer the trajectory away from potential collisions while ignoring features of the environment that are not relevant for the current navigation task. We've since extended our approach, incorporating it with another sample-based MPC method, improved CEM, uh, and performed an additional experiment using a seven degree of freedom arm, uh, including uh, in a real with a real robot in the lab. Overall, we present a method for learning a sampling distribution for MPC, uh, which generates goal-directed and environment-aware controls. Uh, we additionally propose a method for adapting it to novel environments, and we've shown that we can perform this adaption to kind of complex, real-world environments, even when we're training on like very simple, artificially generated environments. So thank you, and I invite you to uh, come and talk to me at the poster. All right, I think we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Go ahead. Um, yeah, hi, I have a question for the last talk. Um, I would think that there might be a trade-off between generating smart flow-based samples, um, which might be a little bit slower, versus generating many dumb samples from like a Gaussian prior. Um, how, do you, how do you think about that? Um, that is true in general, but like what we found was that um, yes, if, uh, using the flow takes longer than sampling from a naive Gaussian, but you have to evaluate them. You have to compute their cost, and it turns out that like rolling out your dynamics and evaluating the cost of trajectories uh, actually is an order of magnitude more expensive. So the difference is kind of negligible. We found really the, the main cost is in evaluating the, the controls. Very interesting. Let's take a question from the other side. Uh, I have a question for the rapid locomotion talk for Gabe. Uh, I'm curious, how do you label a control input as feasible versus un infeasible? Do you require like a prior label of which pairs are feasible and of that like boundary of feasible inputs, or is that boundary learned? Uh, yeah, great question. So um, right at the start of training, we don't know what the boundary is, um, and we don't uh, manually derive that from the physical constraints. Um, we're just sort of growing the distribution of goals uh, by adding goals as nearby goals achieve high reward um, during training. Um, and it naturally sort of converges to agree with this, this physical feasibility boundary. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Cool, I have a question for Alder of Whirl. Uh, I wonder uh, how is a reset of the environment handled during a uh, robot-like exploration phase? And also, uh, how can we change the system to make it, for example, robust against viewpoint changes? Oh, great question. So for reset, for now, uh, a human has to do it, but this is part of uh, future work that we're working on, how to uh, autonomously select goals so that we can go out and the robot can practice um, so that it doesn't need to reset. So for example, you can imagine watching somebody for multiple hours in their kitchen and then you try to go um, and you know you you can sample like many many videos, so you don't have to try to sample the same video of the same drawer being opened. And then for handling multiple viewpoints, I think there are uh, I, you can either try to train a model that can handle multiple viewpoints. So your policy could try to be trained on you know multiple robot viewpoints, uh, or we can try to use more robust uh, off-the-shelf computer vision models as well. Thank you. I think we can take one final question. Uh, yeah, I have a question for the real paper to you. So, I, uh, similar to the generalizing to different viewpoints, but 
Beyond view points, does your method like kind of generate to different like novel objects, like opening a different template or different drawer, by, like beyond the training demonstrations? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So if I, sum, summarizing your question is, uh, how would we handle generalization to new objects, uh, et cetera? Yeah, or new uh, instances. So we actually have, a, have an experiment that generalizes to, for example, a similar looking but different dishwasher or different drawer or door. Um, it still looks approximately similar. Uh, so that's why it's easier to match like the visual features. Uh, I think again, training uh, maybe with more examples instead of training on like um, you know a single kitchen, maybe on you know hundreds of kitchens. That that might help solve it. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right, I think that concludes this session. Let's uh, thank our speakers again. <laughs> and I'll uh, hand it over to Matteo for some uh, final announcements. Hi folks, uh, just a couple of quick announcements. So first of all about the banquet, we've increased the size of the boat cruise so there's no more wait list. It doesn't matter when you registered, if you registered for the full conference, you should have a spot at the banquet. So stop by the registration table to get your QR code if you don't have it already. Okay, so if, so anybody who's full conference, so not workshop only, has a spot on the banquet. Uh, the lab tours are sold out, unfortunately, and we can't really get any more people. Uh, we have the coffee break and the poster session. The posters will be on two ramps above each other, so make sure you get all the posters in. So again, two ramps above each other. If you look beyond the glass wall, you're going to see Columbia's campus. It's beautiful, lots of green space. Go out and explore and, you know, lounge on the grass. You can exit the building anyway but you can only come back in through the Broadway entrance, the same one that you used this morning, okay? So after you've done, you know, coffee and pastries and checked out the posters, just feel free to go explore our campus, and then I will have to ask everybody to leave the room right now because the wonderful crew here has to reconfigure this for the reception. The reception is right here, starting around 6, 6.30, as soon as they can finish getting the room turned around. All right, thank you. And there's an open bar, which is a little dangerous.